And at the number 10 spot, we have the Marks of Honor PvP mounts. All in all, you'll be able to buy 7 unique mounts with 15 Marks of Honor each. 6 from your faction's capital, and 1 from Wintergrasp, the Black War Mammoth. PvP Marks of Honor can be obtained randomly from boxes you get from winning Battlegrounds. You get 5 when you complete the weekly Battleground event, 5 for completing the bi-weekly PvP Brawl quest, and a few other scattered ways to obtain them, including one rare Legion Order Hall mission that sometimes pops up that will give you one as a bonus reward. Or if you farmed up a whole bunch of them in Legion when World Quest still gave them and have a whole bunch lying around like I do, you can just go to the vendor and buy all the mounts instantly. Now what makes these mounts easy to get is the fact that there's no random chance for them. You just need to save up a currency and buy them whenever you want. And there's no real rush either. These mounts have been around forever and always cost whatever PvP currency is currently available. As I bought all of mine back in Wrath of the Lich King when honor points were still the form of currency instead of an experience for your honor thing. And at number 9, we have the Disc of the Red Flying Cloud. In order to obtain this mount, you need to be exalted with the Lore Walkers. Luckily, getting exalted with this faction is really easy, and can be done in under an hour from neutral. To get exalted with the Lore Walkers, all you do is go around Pandaria and click on little scrolls out in the open world. Now, there's a ton of these scrolls, and you have to click on basically all of them in order to hit exalted. But once you complete a series of them, you'll be meld an item which will give you a quest to turn in, which then gives you a ton of rep. And once you've collected all of them, it is exactly the amount you need in order to hit exalted. Now I have an add-on that basically just pointed me to exactly where I needed to go for all of the scrolls to be clicked on, but this option isn't really available for the normal player, but thankfully there is many guides on the internet that will show you exactly where you need to go. And I'll have a wowhead guide linked in the video description below. Once you fly around Pandaria and click on all the scrolls and listen to all of Lorewalker Cho's storytelling, you'll be able to buy them out basically immediately, and it's really simple to do. And at number 8, we have the Dark Moon Dark Water Skate. This mount is only obtainable during the Dark Moon Fair, but unlike the other mounts in the Dark Moon Fair, it doesn't actually cost Dark Moon Fair tokens. Instead, it costs 500 Dark Moon Dagger Maw Fish. And the way to obtain Dark Moon Dagger Maw Fish is to simply fish anywhere in the Dark Moon Fair. Any level of fishing works, and every cast will get you one fish. And you don't need to fish from pools. Fishing from pools, though, will sometimes give you an item which will contain multiple Dark Moon Dagger Maw fish, but it's really not worth your time running around looking for pools. The best way to fish this up is just to sit down somewhere and fish in one location until you have 500 fish. You can also buy the fish on the auction house if you want to save yourself some time. For this video though, I decided to fish them all up myself to see how long it would take. And while having an anime on my second monitor and fishing on my main monitor, I was able to do it in 4 hours. I was honestly expecting it to take a lot longer than that, but it really wasn't that bad. And then once you have the 500 fish, you just go to the vendor and buy it. Just a note, this is an underwater only mount, which can be either a detriment or a plus, depending on who you ask. because. There isn't really that many underwater mounts in the game, so it's nice to have an alternative. And at number 7, we have the Bone White Primal Raptor. In order to obtain this mount, you need 9,999 bones from the Isle of Giants. And the best way to farm bones is to just go around the island and kill literally everything you see. As all the NPCs on the island, except the faction-specific NPCs, drop the dinosaur bones. You can also buy the bones on the auction house, but 10,000 bones is quite a lot, and there wasn't really that many on the auction house when I tried to lessen my load when farming the bones myself for this video. All in all, I casually farm bones for about 15 minutes a day over the course of a week, with some days doing much longer than 15 minutes, and it only took me so long because I faced so much competition. There are so many people on the Isle of Giants for some reason, but I think it's because they're there to farm the world boss but I also had tons of competition just killing the normal dinosaurs as well. I have a friend who also farmed the mount at around the same time I was trying it, and she was able to do it all in one day by server hopping to an RP server, which didn't have sharding in lower level zones. So that might be an option for you if you want to farm all the bones yourself. One of the great things about farming this mount is while killing the mobs for the bones, they will sometimes drop an egg, which will hatch into another mount. While doing all of my farming, I got two eggs, and both had a mount in it. This egg has a chance to give you one of three mounts, but unlucky for me, I got the same mount twice. 
So while farming the guaranteed white primal raptor, you also have a chance at getting the black, red, and green primal raptors as well. As well as a whole bunch of pets, because these dinosaurs also drop a ton of raptor pets like candy, which is actually a really good pet in pet battles. And once you have the 10,000 bones, you simply go to the Kuma the Bone Collector NPC, who's located in like the only cave on the island, and turn in the option for the quest, A Mountain of Giant Dinosaur Bones, and he'll give you the mount. Number 6, the Riding Camels. These are two camel mounts that can be obtained for 100 gold each when hitting Exalted Reputation with the Ramka Hen. And what makes these mounts especially easy to obtain is the fact that you can simply buy a tabard from the Quartermaster once you hit Friendly with the Reputation, and then go run and spam Cataclysm Dungeons. With a tabard, all kills of mobs and bosses in Cataclysm Dungeons will grant a rep to the Ramka Hen. So if you wanted to, you could do a rotation of all the heroic dungeons once per day. Or, you can just head over to the lost city of Tolvir and run it on normal mode and then just reset it, and then run it again. Since you can reset a normal dungeon 10 times an hour, you should be able to farm this particular dungeon infinitely until you have the amount of rep needed. The reason I chose Lost City of Tolvir is because it's a pretty short dungeon. It all takes place in a small area, and running back to the entrance after killing the final boss is really fast. Whereas a lot of the other Cataclysm dungeons require much longer runbacks to the entrance. Now I'm not saying this is the best dungeon to farm rep from, but it is a good one. Then, once you hit Exalted with the rep after a few hours of farming, you can just fly back to the Quartermaster, which is in the same zone as the Lost City of Tolver, and buy your two camel mounts. Now, unfortunately, there are no other reputation mounts from Cataclysm that are as easy to get as the Riding Camels. There are other reputation mounts, but they do not have a tabard that allows you to run dungeons to get rep for them like you can with the Riding Camels. Number 5. The Secret Finder Mounts Secret Finder Mounts are referring to the mounts which require incredibly cryptic clues and puzzles to solve. To have you go around the world and click on a whole bunch of really random things in order to get that mount. Luckily, the only really hard part about getting these mounts is when the Secret Finding Discord first tries discovering how to get them. Once they do figure it out, many different websites and YouTubers basically fight each other for putting out a guide first on how to get it as well. So there is tons of information on the internet on how to get all of these mounts. And if you just follow other people's instructions, you get a guaranteed unique mount at the end of a couple hour long cross-continental journey of finding random things adventure. Now, you do have to do some work to get them, and some of them require solving a puzzle on your own. But at the end of your efforts, you're rewarded with a guaranteed mount, which makes these mounts very fitting for this list. Getting some of these mounts by just following a guide is honestly sometimes easier than collecting 10,000 dinosaur bones on the Isle of Giants, for example. And there are so many steps involved in pretty much all of them that going over them would be longer than this video itself. So instead, I'll just have a link to a Wowhead guy that has all of them listed, so you can just look them up yourself. Number 4, the Winter Spring Frost Saber and the Venom Hide Ravisaur. Both of these mounts are obtained by doing 20 days of dailies. The Frost Saber is the Alliance version, and the Ravisaur is the Horde version. If you do one or the other, you will be rewarded with the other one. For example, if you obtain the Winter Spring Frost Saber, all of your Horde characters will automatically obtain the Venom Hide Ravisaur and vice versa. That's why I have them both clumped up together. Now, as to which one is easier to do? That's without a doubt the Winter Spring Frost Saber. The Venom Hide Ravisaur has an introduction quest, which is actually really hard to do on a max level character, as it takes place in Ungroa Crater and requires you to get poisoned 20 times by a low level mob, who will only poison you when you hit it. Sometimes. So you have to hit the mob multiple times in order to maybe get poisoned. And on a max level character, you'll be one-shotting the mob every time. And even on a level appropriate character, it still took me 30 minutes to complete the quest. And I can't imagine how long it would take on a max level character, even if they took off all of their gear and punched it. And I doubt many people have 50 alts on their account at random different levels to just go to Ungro Crater with a level appropriate character alt like I could. But with the Alliance version and the Winter Spring Frost Saber, you basically just start on your dailies right away and the dailies are really easy to do on a max level character. They usually just have you go around and kill things, collect things, or have your little guy jump on snow puddles or something. Same thing with a raptor. You go around and kill things and feed things to your raptor, and after 20 days of doing the dailies for your little guy and having a few materials, 
You just turn in the quest and you'll get your mount. Number three, the Tanan Diplomat. In the process of getting this achievement, you can potentially unlock five mounts. Tanan Diplomat is the achievement required for Draenor Pathfinding, the meta achievement that allows you to fly in Draenor. So it's a pretty useful thing to get. And the reason I chose Tanan Diplomat is because you can get this to Exalted if you just buy 21 medallions of the Legion. So it's a really quick rep grind if you have tons of money, as each medallion usually goes for around 10k on the auction house. Otherwise, you can just farm it like normal by doing all the quests in the Tanan jungle and then doing dailies. Now, for the mounts you can obtain, getting the meta achievement will unlock the Soaring Sky Terror mount, which is one, getting exalted with the Vulgen Headhunters for Horde or Hand of the Prophet for Alliance will unlock the Death Tusk Felbor at their quartermaster that you can buy for 2500 gold. Getting friendly with the Order of the Awakened unlocks the Corrupted Dreadwing mount, who does require 150,000 Apex Crystals to buy, though. Apex Crystals do drop like candy in the Tannin jungle, but the best way to farm them would be to do your daily Apex quest from your garrison. You can also buy those missions from the Quartermaster in front of the main hub in your garrison. Your shipyard should routinely have missions that give two to 5,000 Apex Crystals each. A lot of rares drop Apex Crystals. Killing Kazakhs gives a thousand. Basically, you gotta farm crystals, and there's tons of ways to do it. And for the Saber Stalkers, there are two boar mounts available. But these ones require their own special currency that's not as abundant to farm as Apexus crystals. You need to farm Blackfang Claws, which only drop from mobs associated with the Saber Stalkers rep. So to get it, you're just gonna have to kill a whole bunch of mobs to get the 6,000 needed to buy both mounts. Number two. A combination of three Burning Crusader rep mounts. The Kurinai, the Maghar, Cenarian Expedition, and the Shatari Skyguard. Getting three of four of these to Exalted will net you 14 mounts. The Kurinai and the Maghar both have eight Talbuk mounts available at Exalted. And the only difference between them is their faction tags. Getting Exalted with the Kurinai is needed for the Alliance, and getting Exalted with the Maghar is needed for the Horde. And getting both of them to Exalted is done in basically the same way. You just need to do every quest available to them, and then once you run out of quests, you just farm beads from ogres in the grand. Depending on your competition, you can farm enough beads from ogres in as little as 4 hours, but realistically it's going to take a little bit longer than that. In my experience of farming old world stuff for mounts for this video, there is always people out there farming for mounts, no matter how old the content is. Once you get Exalted, you can just buy the 8 Talbucks from the Quartermaster for 100 gold each. The Cenarian Expedition only has one mount available for its Exalted reputation, and that's the Cenarian War Hippogriff. At one mount, it's a lot easier to farm than the 8 Talbucks, because all you have to do is like 5 quests to unlock the ability to gain reputation with the Cenarian Expedition, and then you can just head over to the Heroic Underbog and kill Trash and reset the dungeon until you've hit Exalted. Just make sure not to kill the bosses, otherwise the trash won't respawn when you reset the dungeon. The Shatari Skyguard rep at Exalted will have 5 Nether Ray mounts available. In order to get this faction to Exalted, the quickest way to do it is to do enough quests so that you unlock the quest World of Shadows and the Dailies. Then you go out and kill Skedis Arakoa until you have 6 Shadow Dust, which you can turn in for an item that will allow you to enter a Shadow World, full of mobs that give you the rep needed. And grinding the rep involves basically getting this buff, killing as much things and collecting as many items as possible for the duration of that buff, and then getting enough shadow dust to get this buff again. This is actually a lot of mob grinding, but I thought I should mention it with the other two that are a little bit easier to get, just because it's also located in Outlands, and technically can be done in a day. A very long day though. Although, speaking of Outlands, there's also the Netherwing faction, a much more difficult reputation to grind than the previous three that rewards you with six Netherwing drakes at the end of it. I wouldn't exactly call it an easy mount to obtain though, but I felt I should at least mention it here since it's only a little bit harder to gain than the other ones. And at number one, I thought I would go with one of the more recently added easy to get mounts, and those are the three Marsh Hoppers. These mounts can be obtained by simply finding the vendor in Nazmir who's located at this spot on the map. Once you find him, he has three frog mounts available. But here's the catch. They're kind of expensive. Each mount costs 333,333 gold. 
So in order to obtain all three of them, you need to spend around 1 million gold total. Which isn't exactly an easy thing to do. For the amount of gold you spend on buying one of these frogs, you can buy enough tokens to purchase a mount from the cash shop. But also, these frogs aren't ridiculously expensive like the auction house mount, or even the mad merchant mounts, which all cost over 1 million gold each. So I thought these kind of fit this list. They're kind of expensive, but not unreasonably so. I personally only bought one, because they're all the same mount, just different colors. So you don't really need more than one, unless you're really rich or want to fill out your collection. And at number 10, we have the Grand Ice Mammoths. These are two mammoths you can buy from a Quartermaster in Storm Peaks for 800 and 8,000 gold, respectively, taking into account the reputation bonuses. During Wrath of the Lich King, when these were available, that was kind of a high price for the mounts. But nowadays, that's almost trivial. You can easily make enough gold to buy both of these in a week of normal playing, unless you're just absolutely terrible at making gold. And the Reigns of the Grand Ice Mammoth is one of the few mounts in the game that allows other players to ride on top of it alongside you. So, it's kind of worth getting. Now, all you have to do is just grind out the Sons of Hodir rep to Exalted, which used to be kind of a pain in the butt. It wasn't the hardest thing to do in the world, but it did kind of take a while, even if you took the shortcuts of farming out a special item that you could turn in for more rep. When they introduced the time walking system, they did make grinding it out a lot faster as well, since you could just convert the time walking currency into badges that increase your rep. However, recently they made a change to time walking weeks, where now, during time walking weeks, for the associated expansion, you get a 50% rep buff that applies to all quests and monster kills with the reputations of that expansion, which definitely includes the Sons of Hodir. So, during time walking week, you can both turn in time walking currency to buy the reputation tokens, and grind out the rep normally with a 50% buff, which makes it almost trivial to do as long as you wait for that specific time walking week now. However, you do still need to unlock the reputation and the quartermaster, which requires you to start the quest chain in K3 and takes you through half the zone with a whole bunch of quests centered around Thorum and his relationship with the Frost Giants. Although, if you get some of the rep early through turn and badges, it will be applied to the reputation as soon as you unlock the rep, so that you don't have to worry about wasting it in case you forgot to unlock the reputation first before turning in badges. And at number 9, we have one of the easiest mounts to get in the game, which was added towards the end of Battle for Azeroth. And that, of course, is the Mail Muncher. This is a mount which is obtainable from Horrific Visions by clicking on a special mailbox located in all five of the zones. The mailboxes always are in obvious locations, and it's always the same mailbox in each zone. So you can just memorize the five mailboxes you have to click on in both versions and just try every time you go there for your normal runs. Or specifically, just click on the mailboxes if you don't care about completing the visions normally. I'll have locations of all the mailboxes on screen, but there's also add-ons you can install which will point them out to you like handy notes. The mail muncher has a pretty generous drop chance, but it's not guaranteed, so you could get it after a couple of attempts, or it could take you about a hundred. The act of obtaining this mount as being easy is kind of a meme in the WoW community, but even if it is a meme, it's still not that difficult to obtain. You just have to defeat a mini boss after clicking on the mailbox and you get the mount as a drop. You don't need to finish the vision normally after you get the drop, and once you actually click on the mailbox which contains the mail muncher, you just defeat a version of the mail muncher that drops the item for you, which will be available for you immediately. One of the few items you can pick up in the vision, during the vision, without having to wait for the boxes at the end of the vision. And at number 8, we have the Smoldering Ember Worm. This mount can be obtained with a 20% chance as long as you complete the mythic version of Legion Karazhan in a special way. You see, there's a couple of crystals that spawn in the dungeon, and after you click on the first one after the opera battle, you'll have about a 10 minute buff which will allow you to click on the second one, which is located in a room right before the boss made in a virtue. Then, you just need to run over to Morose and click on the one that's very obviously right behind him. Afterwards, you'll have to head downstairs to the spider room and click on the one at the end of a corridor that's not actually near a boss. So you have to deliberately try to click on all these crystals so you can't get them out doing the place normally. Although, after clicking on this crystal, they'll give you a little teleport which will save you some time and let you go back upstairs. Every time you click on a crystal, it resets the duration and even increases the amount of time you have in order to complete getting the last crystal which simply requires you to kill the curator boss. After you kill the curator, it'll drop the crystal on his body, which could be hard to miss since it kind of spawns inside his body, or can depending on how he falls, and it could take you a while to get back to the crystal, 
if you accidentally run into the portal after killing him. Then you click on the fifth crystal and you'll gain a buff which allows you to see a ghost version of Medivh in the Master's Terrace, which will then spawn a mini event that allows you to fight the boss Nightbane. Simply killing Nightbane will drop them out 20% of the time as long as you don't already have it. And this drop chance is increased for the amount of people in your group who are eligible to loot the boss during that week. So if you have 5 people in your group who haven't killed Nightbane yet, then you'll have a 100% chance to drop one mount. Although even if you do this solo, which is pretty easy, as long as your item level is higher than 450, then a 20% drop chance is still very good, as far as collecting mounts goes. And you can try this once per week on each character. And at number 7, we have the Shadow Barb Drone. This is a mount which was added to the game in patch 8.3, and can be obtained by simply doing 30 days of dailies. All you need to do is make sure you have the Assault Zones unlocked, which require doing the quest chain that grants the Legendary Cloak. In order to start the quest chain for this mount, all you have to do is go to Oldham during any invasion at the spot located on screen. Then all you need to do is interact with it to start the quest, which will send you to a Drenai Explorer NPC who will then convince you to try to raise it. Over the course of the next 30 days, you'll slowly grow it by feeding it stuff and taking it out in the world in order to do some pet battles and normal battles. At the end of the quest chain, you'll eventually be able to earn the mount, as well as getting a toy and a battle pet along the way. Now, if you're not very well versed in pet battling, then you might run into some problems when you get to the pet battle sections. Although all of the pet battles you have to complete are done in invasion zones, which have pets that scale down to whatever max level pet you have in your party. So if you want to have an easier time, just never level up your Shadow Bar pet and keep it at level 1. And then just use two other level 1 pets with it so that the battles you're doing are scaled down to level 1, which makes it almost trivial. If you do level up your Shadow Barb drone, you can kind of cheese most legendary pet fights with a haunt pet like the Unborn Valk and a Black Claw Stampede user like the Zandalari Raptors or Inky. Also, be careful on the portion of the quest which requires you to take a drone out in battle when you're doing the invasions, because if you're in war mode during that quest, it is possible for the enemy faction to kill your drone, and that will just end the daily for that day. And then after 30 days, you'll get your guaranteed mount. And at number 6, we have the Snapdragon Kelp Stalker. This is a mount which can be obtained by getting one of your Nagitar followers to level 20. For Horde, it's specifically Nary Sharpfin, and for Alliance, it's Hunter Akana. As soon as you get that particular follower to rank 20, they'll offer you a very short quest which basically just gives you the mount. Now, in order to get them to level 20, you first need to unlock them by doing the short quest chain which introduces you to the Zone of Nagitar. You unlock the ability to choose one of those three followers every day very early on in the Zone quest chain, and you simply pick the one associated to this mount for each day. They will have a series of three daily quests you can accomplish for them, and after completing all three of them, you'll advance one rank automatically. So if you do all of their dailies for 20 days in a row, then you'll get them to rank 20 no problem. There are ways to speed this up a little bit if you find special items for them, but for the most part you don't really need to worry about that. But it is technically possible to speed it up a tiny bit. Although I don't think you can get them to rank 20 in one day even then. Because you see, there's a series of items that can drop around Nagitar which give a various amount of extra rep to your bodyguards. Some of them only give rep specifically to one of them, like the Fathom Ray Wing which gives extra rep to Neri and Akana, but there's also a couple that work on all your bodyguards, like the Unusually Wise Hermit Crab, or ones that give reputation to all three of them at once, like the Ancient Reefwalker Bark. So if you go out and farm those ones, you can get them to rank 20 in less than 20 days. Although even without it, you do still get it a little bit faster than the previous spot on this list. And at number 5, we have the Ruby Shell Crawlisk. This mount can simply be bought from a vendor near the Warfront table for 200 Horde Surface Medals. There is also an Alliance version called the Azura Cell Crawlisk, which is obtained basically the same way, just from the Alliance version of the vendor. Now, getting 200 Service Medals can sound like a daunting task, since you only get 5 of them for completing an invasion, and you only get 1 for completing a world quest or a daily associated to a Warfront zone. However, actually completing a Warfront will give you 15 the first time you do them on Normal, and then the Battle for Darkshore on Heroic gives you 50. That's the one you want to aim for, once a week, assuming your faction has access to Darkshore. You can easily find a group that's running it for the weekly in order to get a quick 50 service medals, which will contribute to 25% of the amount you need in order to get them out. If you just do the one Warfront on Heroic each time it's available, you'll be able to get it after four times. 
You can also get the 15 in addition to the 50, so it's actually 65 each time. But it will still take four times before you get the amount needed for the 200, assuming you did nothing else. You can also do the invasions every time they come up for an additional five. That can sometimes also allow you to get reputation paragon boxes for your faction, which will give you an additional 20, as well as around 4,000 gold. And since right before Shadowlands is a 100% rep buff, as of making this video, now would be a really good time to grind this out. If you're watching this in the future, it might be a little bit harder to find groups for the Horde service medals, but you still can do the invasions every day and slowly get the amount of service medals you need. There are also other mounts you can obtain with the service medals, but they cost a lot more so they don't actually make this video, as 200 is not that hard to get, and easily allows that mount to make a spot on this list of easiest mounts to get. And at number 4, we have the three Cloud Serpents from the Order of the Cloud Serpent Rep in Mist of Pandaria. Grinding this rep to Exalted will allow you to purchase three mounts that are all under a thousand gold each. And just like with the Sons of Hodir rep, this grind has recently been made a lot easier with the changes to time walking. Now, Mr. Pandaria rep has a little bit of a leg up on some of the Wrath of the Lich King reps, since as soon as you hit Revere with the faction, you're able to buy an item called the Grand Commendation of the Order of the Cloud Servant, which gives you 100% bonus to all of your rep with the Order of the Cloud Serpent, which extends to all characters on your account. This was supposed to be a way to have a catch-up mechanic for all of your alts in Mr. Pandaria, since you needed to unlock the rep vendors in order to spend your badge currency. Although you're able to unlock this 100% rep bonus before you hit Exalted, which kind of makes getting to Exalted a lot easier as it allows you to get a lot more rep during one of the longest grinds of the reputation. So all you do is the intro quest in order to unlock the faction, which is a lot less than the ones needed to unlock the Sons of Hodir. Then there'll just be a whole bunch of daily quests you can do that will give you rep. You can completely ignore the daily quests if you just use the time walking currency to buy the item that gives you rep for the Order of the Cloud Serpent. You can also go around and farm Quivering Firestorm eggs in order to turn those in for rep, or you can just do the dailies every day and unlock it the old fashioned way, which only takes a couple of weeks. Much shorter if you start doing the dailies during Mista Pandaria Time Walking Week, which will increase reputation gains by an additional 50%. In fact, it's entirely possible to start the rep grind and then complete it all within the Mist of Pandaria time walking week, due to the additional rep and the tokens you can buy with time walking currency, which increase your rep further. And at number 3, we have Garn Night Howl. This is a mount which has a 100% drop chance from a rare in Warlords of Draenor named Nak Karash, who's at this location on the map in Frostfire Ridge and has about a 20 to 40 minute respawn timer. Now, what makes this mount particularly easy to obtain? is 1. It has a 100% drop chance, 2. It has a short respawn timer for a rare that drops a mount, and 3. The mount is not bind on pickup. So you can actually just buy it off the auction house for pretty cheap, since it's so easy to get. As of making this video, the prices for this mount go around 1000 gold give or take, where some of them going up to 5000 gold on one of the servers I play on, which is still pretty cheap. Although your mileage on trying to get this mount the old fashioned way may vary, on one of my servers, I went to the spawn location and was being camped by a couple of other people. Then I hopped onto another one of my servers and there was no one there, and the NPC was available as soon as I just got to the location. And I was able to get the kill and grab the mount even though I already had it, since I can just sell on the auction house. Out of all of the rare mobs in Draenor that drop mounts, Gar Nighthowl is the easiest one to obtain, especially since it can be bought and sold on the auction house for so cheap. And at number 2, we have the Alabaster Hyena as well as five other mounts you can obtain for getting Exalted Reputations with your three main BFA Reputation Hubs. In both Zandalar and Kul'Turas, there is a reputation associated to all three of the zones, and if you simply get those reputations to Exalted, there are two mounts available from the zone's Quartermasters, for 10,000 gold and 72,000 gold respectively after faction discounts. So the 72,000 gold mounts are kind of pricey, Although each of these vendors also has a much cheaper 10,000 gold mount, which is a lot more affordable to people who aren't just completely terrible at making gold. Remember, you can get 4,000 gold from a Paragon box, which is obtained after getting Exalted Rep with the reputations in BFA zones. And if you have the ability to gain those Paragon boxes, that means you already have the rep needed in order to buy these mounts in the first place. It is super easy to get these mounts unlocked by simply doing world quests or emissaries when they're available in the zone. As of making this video, there is a 100% rep buff going on that makes this almost trivial. All of my max level alts are exalted with all of the base factions, and it really did not take very much to do so. 
And at number one, we have the Meccano Cat X995. This is a mount that holds a distinction where you can actually dye it to eight different colors, and it's obtainable rather easily in Mechagon. All you have to do is unlock the ability to create Mechagon tinkering. Then you just have to go to an NPC known as Pascal K1N6 to buy a schematic for 500 gold. That will teach your robot how to create the Meccano Cat laser pointer, which ultimately allows you to learn how to use this mount. The hardest part of all this would just be grinding out the materials needed to create the mount, which are honestly not that bad. When I was researching this video, I had completely missed the schematic required in order to make this mount. And as soon as I bought the schematic, I already had the materials in my bank to make it without having to farm anything else out. Despite the fact that I hadn't done anything on Mechagon in months. So if I had the materials just lying around in my bank, then you might probably have it too if you missed it like I did. However, assuming you're watching this in the future and you're starting from zero, or you just completely didn't do Mechagon for one reason or another, the materials can be gathered by just killing rares on the island, doing daily quests, including the daily world quest, and farming up 2,000 spare parts, so that you can combine them into the 8 spare crates you need. Farming the spare parts might be the most difficult thing to do from scratch, in which case you can just go to this zone here on the map and just kill all the NPCs in this little area, since it's one of the best spots to farm spare parts. This is definitely a mount you can probably grind out in a day, or if you might have already had the materials for it and you just played BFA normally, you can probably go grab it in 5 minutes like I did as soon as I found out about it. There are 6 crafting professions in World of Warcraft, and each profession has the ability to craft specific and unique mounts. Currently, there are 21 mounts which players can craft, and today we'll go over the profession mounts that are the most intensive to craft in terms of the work required, the gold cost for all the materials, and the time it takes to actually craft and farm the parts for the mount itself. Although, the gold cost fluctuates often, so take them more as guidelines. And at number 10, we have the Turbocharged Flying Machine. This engineer crafted mount was added to the Burning Crusade, specifically patch 2.3, and it is currently going for about 43,000 gold on average on the auction house as of writing this video. The schematic for this mount can be learned by any engineering trainer in the Burning Crusade, since the required ingredients for crafting this mount were changed at the beginning of Wrath, we'll first be looking at how the mount was crafted in the Burning Crusade. In TBC, the turbocharged flying machine was actually an epic mount, and you have to craft the flying machine control, which is the basic flying version, to be using the recipe to craft the epic mount. Meaning you'd usually end up crafting this mount twice, once to use yourself, and then a second time to be using the crafting the epic variant. Without going into all the lengthy details, a player would need 100 fell iron ore, 85 boats of fire, 10 moats of earth, 16 corium ore, 4 eternium ore, 8 star wood, and 1 hula girl doll. All of the materials can be obtained from mining except the hula girl doll, which is sold by Griftath, and costs between 80 to 100 gold depending on reputation with a lower city. At the beginning of Wrath, the flying machine control was replaced by 4 adamantite frames, which cost in total 16 adamantite ore and 40 emotes of earth. And while the adamantite frames could be instead purchased from some vendors, they still cost a pretty penny, and also were limited and heavily sought after. Meaning, you usually just crafted slash bought the items from another player. Some of these ingredients can be bought from various vendors, but they're usually limited in quantity or on random spawn timers. Overall, there are only two professions which are required to make the turbocharged flying machine, engineering and mining. The only actual required gold cost for this mount is having to buy the Starwood and the Hula Girl doll, but that in total only usually costs around 100 gold or so. And at number 9, we have the Steelbound Devourer. This is a mount that can only be made by Blacksmith and was added in Legion. The recipe for this foul green doggy has a 2% drop rate from Tychondrus and the Nighthold in any difficulty except LFR. As of the making of this video, it's running around 45,000 gold at the auction house. The recipe for this mount isn't too bad to make. The main obstacle of crafting the Steelbound Devourer after obtaining the recipe is that it just takes some time and traveling around the Broken Isles. First, the player needs 100 Demon Steel Bars, so they must go to the Firmament Stone and High Mountain in the Ironhorn Enclave and make 100 Demon Steel Bars there. One Demon Steel Bar is 2 Felslate Ore and 1 Laystone Ore, so the player will need 200 Felslate Ore and then 100 Laystone Ore in total. The Firmament Stone is the only place that players can make the Demon Steel Bars, which means it is required to go there to craft them. Next, the player must acquire 50 Blood of Sargeras's which can be obtained by doing a wide variety of activities across all Legion content. After that, the player must do the Blacksmith-only Infernal Brimstone world quest multiple times to obtain 10 Infernal Brimstone from the big demon boy that spawns when the world quest is active. Finally, the player must either have the skinny profession or buy 10 Fellhide from the auction house. This means if you want to gather all the materials and make this mount all by yourself, you would need mining, blacksmithing, and skinning. Additionally, the quest chain to unlock making demon steel bars is kind of long, annoying, and boring on its own, leading to a rather tiresome mount to get. And at number 8, we have the Sky Golem from Mista Pandaria. This engineering crafted mount is very sought after for its ability to pick herbs while being mounted. The journal for this mount drops from most mobs in the Veil of Eternal Blossoms in Siege of Orgmar, but it has a very low drop rate. 
usually less than half a percent for most mobs. The schematic also teaches the player how to craft the pet Pierre, which is a little robot butler, a rascal bot, a little red robot companion, and an advanced refrigeration unit, a 36 slot cooking bag. All of them using another item the recipe teaches you how to craft, the jar's peculiar energy source, and 30 of these are needed to craft the mount. The mount was added in 5.4, the titular Siege of Orgamar. The mount takes at least 30 days to craft because two of the main ingredients can only be made once per day, and there are 30 needed of each of them. The first of these two ingredients is the previously mentioned Jarrett's Peculiar Energy Source, which is from the engineering profession and has a one day cooldown. And to make matters worse, Jarrett's Peculiar Energy Source is bind on pickup, so it cannot be traded or sold to other players. Since one is made from 10 ghost iron bars and one ghost iron bar requires two ghost iron ore, the player will need a minimum of 600 ghost iron ore to craft the components themselves. The second ingredient is 30 living steel, which is made from the alchemy profession using 6 trillion bars and can be made in two different ways. One of which requires 30 days because of the daily cooldown, while the other way removes the daily cooldown using Spirits of Harmony. 3 Spirits of Harmony and 3 trillion bars per living steel allows you to technically do it in one day. However, having to wait 30 days for the jards means you might as well wait. And of course, living steel is not bind on pickup, so for engineering players, you do not need to worry about picking up alchemy and can instead buy these from the auction house. Overall, crafting this mount requires the engineering, mining, and alchemy professions. The one-day cooldowns and crafting mats ensures a sky golem can never be made too fast, so there's always a constant demand for the mount, since they can't be made fast enough to meet supply. As of writing this video, the sky golem mount was going for an average of roughly 47,500 gold on the auction house. And at number 7, we have Zillywag ATV. This is the mount that was added in Battle for Azeroth and requires both engineering and blacksmithing professions to craft. If you want to make this mount, you're going to become terribly familiar with the dungeon The Motherlode, since all of its component crafting recipes drop from the dungeon. The mount crafting recipe calls for two main parts, the supercharged engine, which can only be crafted from engineering, and the monolite reinforced chassis, which can only be crafted from blacksmithing. These two parts each have a different recipe, and since their drop rates are both under 1% from the boss Cujo in The Motherlode, you'll probably be farming for quite a while just to get both recipes to drop. To make matters worse, the recipes are bind on pickup, so you can't give them to other players. Luckily, this is the hardest part of making this mount, since most of the mats need to craft the Zillimike ATV are obtained by simply mining ores. The player will need 175 monolite ore and 115 storm silver ore. In addition to all the mining ores needed, there are several blacksmithing and engineering mats that are required. Luckily, these are sold by vendors and they're relatively cheap and end up costing less than 20 gold overall. Finally, the player will need to scrap several items in order to get 8 Explosum from the Scrapomatic 1000 or the Shredmaster MK1 located in Boralus and Tazar Lord, respectively. Overall, this mount isn't too bad to make, but since it has such a long and tedious grind just to get the two recipe parts, that it can certainly become quite the headache to craft. As such, its rarity makes itself for much more in the auction house than many would expect, since its demand far outweighs its current supply. If a player wanted to make this mount all by themselves and farm their own mats, they would need engineering, blacksmithing, and mining. However, for people who don't have unlimited amounts of time and alts, they can simply craft one part, then buy the other part off the auction house with the other profession, and sell their own parts to make some money back from people of the opposite profession doing the same. This mount also has three color variations, which can be unlocked by talking to the goblin Cram Kalada on Mechagon Isle. The Willy Lag is Gallywick spelled backwards, in case you hadn't noticed. According to Wildhand's aggregate data, this mount goes for roughly 25,000 gold, totaling to 50k in the auction house as of making this video. And at number 6, we have a tie between two engineering mounts from Wrath of the Lich King. These two mounts, the Mechanohog and the Mechgineer's Chopper, were both selling for around 50,000 gold when this video was being made. The reason these two mounts can be tied is because they require the exact same materials to craft. It's just that the Mechanohog is Horde exclusive, and the Mechgineer's Chopper is Alliance exclusive. The schematic for the Mechanohog can be bought when the player is exalted with the Horde Expedition from the two Quartermasters in the Born Tundra and the Howling Jord, named Gara Skullcrusher and Sebastian Crane, respectively. The Mechgineer's Chopper schematic can be bought from the Alliance Vanguard Quartermaster when the Alliance player sits exalted with that faction. The two Quartermasters for this faction are also in the same two zones previously mentioned, and they are named the Logistics Officer Silverstone of the Born Tundra and the Logistics Officer Brighton in the Howling Jord. Both schematics cost 400 gold. The first ingredient to make these mounts is 12 Titan Steel Bars, which themselves can be quite a pain to make. Three Titanium Bars are required to make one Titan Steel Bar, and two Titanium Ore make one Titanium Bar, meaning the player needs 72 titanium ore entirely. In addition to the titanium bars, one titan still bar also requires one eternal fire, one eternal earth, and one eternal shadow. Ten crystallized elements makes one eternal element, which means the player ultimately needs 120 crystallized fire, 120 crystallized earth, and 120 crystallized shadow. There are several other ways to make these materials through alchemy via transmuting, but to list them all would take too long since there are so many. Next, 40 cobalt ore makes 40 cobalt bars, which in turn makes 40 handful of cobalt bolts via engineering. 
The next ingredient that is needed is simply two arctic furs, but to obtain them the player requires a skinning profession or will have to buy them from another player. The final ingredients are all fairly expensive items that must be bought from a goblin named Roxy Ramrocket in the Storm Peaks. These ingredients are 1 salvaged iron golem parts at 3000 gold for just one, 8 goblin machine pistons which are 1000 gold each, and 1 elementium plated exhaust pipe which costs 1500 gold. In all, the total minimum gold requirement to build the mount, including the schematic itself, comes out to just under 13,000 gold. Overall, these two mounts require the engineering, mining, blacksmithing, and the skinning professions to complete in their entirety, with the alchemy profession being optional and supplementary. There are a few more notes before we move on to the number 5 spot. The Mechanohog and Mechjuniors chopper mounts have been extremely rare drop chances from the Blingatron 4000 gift package, as well as the 5000, 6000, and 7000 gift packages, and assuming all future gift packages. Additionally, some fun facts about these things. If you look closely at the license plates of both of these vehicles, they have PWN, which can be pronounced as Pwn. Finally, obtaining this mount awards the achievement to get to the Choppa, which must be said in the Arnold Schwarzenegger accent. And in number 5, we have Vial of the Sands from Cataclysm. This is the only alchemy mount in the game and allows the user to transform into a sandstone drake. While in this form, another player can ride on the dragon's back. Currently, the Vial of the Sands is going for just over 72,000 gold on the auction house. This mount is rare and expensive in three ways. First, the recipe is extremely hard to obtain. Secondly, some of the ingredients that are required must be bought from vendors and they cost a heavy amount of gold themselves. Finally, there are an enormous amount of mats to farm to actually make the vial of the sands. To obtain the recipe, the player must have learned the secondary profession archaeology skill and be excavating a Tolvir dig site, which can only be found in Old Doom. To make matters worse, all the Kalimdor shares a handful of random archaeology dig sites, meaning that a player will have to do other dig sites all over the continent in hope of completing one and having a new Tolvir dig site spawn in Old Doom. Additionally, the recipe has a very low drop chance of only 2% to drop from one specific artifact, which is the Canopic Jar. The Canopic Jar itself requires 45 Tolvir artifact fragments to create. All this means the grind for the recipe itself is a lot of work, since it's locked behind three layers of RNG. The first layer being the Tolvir dig sites being up at all in Oldham, the second being you get the Canopic Jar, and the third being the drop rate of the recipe when you open the Canopic Jar. The recipe for the Vile of Sands calls for two expensive ingredients. The first required ingredient is one Perium Lace Crystalline Vial, which costs 5,000 gold and can only be bought from Yasmin, who was the innkeeper of the Oasis of Virsar. The second ingredient is called Sands of Time, which is also sold by Yasmin. One Sands of Time costs 3,000 gold, and the recipe calls for eight of them. In total, that means crafting this mount will set you back at least 29,000 gold for the crafting materials. The remaining ingredients are 12 True Gold, 8 Flasks of the Winds, 8 Flasks of Titanic Strength, and 8 Deep Stone Oil. The Deep Stone Oil is by far the easiest to come across since all it requires is the fishing skill and collecting 8 Albino Cavefish by fishing at Deep Hole. One Albino Cavefish gives 1 Deep Stone Oil and the recipe only needs 8. True Gold can only be created through alchemy and to make 1 True Gold requires 3 Perium Bars, 10 Volatile Fire, 10 Volatile Air, and 10 Volatile Water. All of these materials can be acquired by mining and in the same cases by looting mobs and bosses. Since the recipe for the mount calls for 12 true gold, that's 36 pyrite ore to make 36 pyrum bars, and 120 of each type for the three aforementioned volatile elements. To make matters even worse, in Cataclysm, the ability to transmute true gold had a one day cooldown, so you can only make one true gold a day. Lastly, there are 16 flasks in total needed as the last ingredients. In total, the collective ingredients for all the flasks are 128 volatile life, 128 Whiptail, 64 Azjar's Veils, 64 Cinder Blooms, and 16 Crystal Vials. All the materials for the flask can be obtained from gathering herbs, with the exception of the Crystal Vial, which is just sold by alchemist vendors at a small cost. In terms of the total number of materials required, that's a little over 800 individual items needed to make the Vial of the Sands. Also, this mount technically requires five different professions to obtain all of its ingredients. Alchemy, Archaeology, Fishing, Herbalism, and Mining. Upon finally learning the mount, you will receive an achievement, which is unsurprisingly called the Vial of Sands. And at number 4, we have the Geosynchronous World Spinner, which is a gnome-themed engineering mount only available to Alliance players that was added in Mist of Pandaria. As of writing this video, the mount was going for roughly 112,000 gold on the auction house. This mount can be learned from any Mist of Pandaria engineering trainer. The first ingredient in the recipe for the Geosynchronous World Spinner calls for 12 Living Steel, which can only be made via alchemy. First, as with all alchemy transmutations, don't forget to have the Philosopher's Stone equipped. Transmute Living Steel turns 6 trillion bars into 1 Living Steel, but this has a cooldown of 1 day and produces only 1 Living Steel at a time. Luckily, there is another way to create a Living Steel with alchemy, which is named the Riddle of Steel. Like we mentioned earlier in this video, this method only requires 3 trillion bars, but it comes at the cost of also needing 3 Spirits of Harmony. In addition to the trillion bars needed to make the 12 Living Steel, the player needs another 12 trillion bars for the recipe itself. 
A Trillium Bar can be made in one of two ways. The first way is through alchemy. This requires the player to transmute 10 Ghost Iron Ore into one Trillium Bar. The second way to make a Trillium Bar is through mining. To make a Trillium Bar this way, the player needs to smelt two Black Trillium Ore and two White Trillium Ore to make one Trillium Bar. The next ingredient on this list for the mount is 12 Spirits of Harmony, which as mentioned earlier can be a pain to farm since they cannot be bought outside of the possible obscene prices on the auction house and must be looted from mobs or quests across Pandaria. The second to last ingredient is an engineered ingredient. The recipe calls for 20 Ghost Iron Bolts, which are made from Ghost Iron Bars. Two Ghost Iron Ore are required to make one Ghost Iron Bar, and three Ghost Iron Bars are required to make one Ghost Iron Bolt. Thus, to make all of the Ghost Iron Bolts needed for the mount, you need a total of 120 Ghost Iron Ore. The final ingredient is the most expensive one, and they cannot be gathered. Orbs of Mystery are required to finish the mount. One Orb of Mystery costs 20,000 gold, and they are only sold by one vendor in BC. His vendor's name is Big Keech, and he can be found in the Golden Pagoda in the Vale of Eternal Blossoms. If you spending 20,000 gold on one ingredient doesn't sound too bad to you, get ready to triple that price because the recipe calls for three orbs of mystery. That means the player has to drop 60,000 gold just to get the right amount for this one ingredient for the mount. In grand total, that means the player has to get 720 to 840 ghost iron ore, 12 to 48 spirits of harmony, and or 168 white trillium ore and 168 black trillium ore, depending on how much they choose to crowd with those materials. And of course, there's the 60,000 gold cost for the three orbs of mystery, as well as the 30 days for the cooldown if the player decides to save their spirits of harmony and use the riddle of steel. Overall, the mount requires three professions to craft, engineering, mining, and alchemy. Finally, if you want to avoid all that work and not buy it from the auction house, this mount also has an extremely rare chance to drop from the Blingatron's package as well. And at number three, we have the depleted Kyperium rocket. This engineering craft amount was added Mr. Pandaria and currently is selling for 113,000 gold on the auction house as of the time of writing this video. This is a goblin theme mount and is the horde counterpart to the alliance's previously mentioned geosynchronous world spinner. This mount can also be learned from any Mr. Pandaria engineering trainer. The ingredients are pretty much the same as the geosynchronous world spinner and there's no need to list them out again. The only two exceptions are that this mount requires 12 high explosive gunpowder, which is an engineered ingredient that can be made with 12 ghost iron orb, and that this goblin rocket needs 200 Kipurite to be constructed. Kipurite is another ore that can be mined, but usually only on the western side of the continent of Pandaria. As with the geosynchronous world spinner, the mount technically requires the three professions of engineering, mining, and alchemy to obtain all the materials to craft it. The depleted Kyperian rocket can also drop from certain Blingatron packages as well. This mount is listed at number 3 instead of being tied at number 4 with the geosynchronous world spinner for two reasons. First, farming the 200 cupyrite adds a fair bit of work and time to harvesting all these ores. Secondly, the rocket sells for slightly higher on the auction house, and the auction house is usually a good way to measure player sentiment, especially since the appearance of the gyro spinner looks like that of the giant nose rocket, while the cupyrium rocket itself looks like nothing but a giant explosive warhead. And at number 2, we have yet another engineering crafted mount this time from Battle for Azeroth, and it's called the Mecha Mogul MK2. This mount is a goblin version of the Mimron's head, which has a chance to drop from yogg saron and Ulduar with no keepers up. As of writing this video, the Mecha Mogul MK2 was going for around 123,000 gold. The main reason this mount is so high up on this list is because many of the materials needed to craft this mount are rare drops, and to build it, the player needs several of each of these drops. First off, the schematic for the mount only has a 1% chance to drop from Mogul Razdunk in the Mythic and Mythic Plus version of Motherload. Three of the required materials are relatively easy to acquire. 50 Platinum Ore and 100 Storm Silver Ore can be gathered from mining nodes, and obtaining 20 Explosive from scrapping items isn't too bad either. The final ingredients are much harder to get and will require some serious farming. However, each of these ingredients have a higher chance to drop, the higher Battle for Azeroth Engineer it is, usually obtained not only by maxing out your skill, but also through the use of the engineering goggles increasing your engineering with azurite levels. The mount schematic calls for 20 azurite forge protection platings. These items are retained rather commonly from salvaging the mechs within the motherload dungeon. The best bet is to salvage the coin-operated crowd pummeler, which is the first boss in the motherload, since it has a 25% chance to give the one azurite forge protection plating. Don't forget that players need 20 of these items to craft the mount, so that's a lot of salvaging to do. Although this is the most common of the crafting materials to get, it will be the one you end up with lots of extra by the end. The next ingredient required is 20 blast-fired electric servo motors. These items act just like the Azerite Forge protection plating, although at a much lower drop rate. Them too being salvaged from mechs. Next is the Crush Resistant Stabilizer. It is obtained similarly to the two aforementioned ingredients and has a drop rate that is lower than the Azerite Forge protection plating, but not as low as the blast-fired electric servo motors. However, all three of these items can drop in the dungeon's final boss on every kill, even in normal mode, leading to potential strategies like rushing through the entire dungeon to get to the end, 
clear aggro one way or another, even if a soul stone is needed, then solo the final boss to get a fair few of each crafted material, especially since the higher engineering, with the use of maxo engineering skills, goggles, and the potion will bring it up soon, allowing for this to be one of the best ways to farm the items without friends helping you. Although, with the levels we've gained since, it has become far easier to solo the dungeon. The penultimate ingredient is one barely stable Azerite reactor. This can be bought from the Hobart Grapple Hammer in the Motherload instance for 30,000 gold. The final ingredient is the Mecha Moggle MK1 remote activation device, which drops from Mogul Razdunk. Players need to drink the Azerite Inspire Engineering Elixir to gain a buff which allows them to be able to loot this item. Unfortunately, it only has a 33 chance to drop from the Venture Coat Mastermind mobs. However, the buff from this elixir also allows the player a higher chance to salvage the salvaged items, including best of all, the blast-fired electric server motors from the mechanical mobs of the instance, the plating drops around 175 engineering, the stabilizer at around 200, and the server motors at 225. Players must also have their Heart of Azeroth equipped to loot this item, as necklace is what's increasing the power of your goggles in order to give you the engineering required to loot the items. Overall, this mount only requires the engineering and mining professions to obtain. The reason is that number 2 on this list is because it required a lot of farming in the same dungeon, in addition to spending 30,000 gold for the barely stable Azerite reactor. So, if you want to farm this mount to sell or keep, make sure you bring your goggles, max out your engineering, get at least Azerite level 41, and some spare time to kill and salvage a ton of mechs and goblins. And finally, at number 1, we have the Jeweled Onyx Panther from Mista Pandaria. This mount is quite the doozy to cast. It's currently selling, on average, for roughly 124,000 gold on the auction house, and there's a good reason why. To craft this mount, a player must first craft four other mounts that are then used in this recipe to make the Jeweled Onyx Panther. These four mounts are all expensive on their own, and also mean you will need to end up crafting two sets of these mounts yourself if you want all five. These four mounts are the Sunstone Panther, the Jade Panther, the Ruby Panther, and the Sapphire Panther. The recipes for all these mounts can be bought from San Redscale, who's located in the Arbor Tome in the Jade Forest, and serves as the Quartermaster for the Order of the Cloud Serpent. Each mount recipe costs 200 gold, so in total, the player has to give 1,000 gold to get all five recipes. The Jade and Sunstone Panther designs can be learned at Honored, the Ruby and Sapphire Panther designs at Revered, and the Jeweled Onyx Panther design at Exalted with the Order of the Cloud Serpent. Three of the four ingredients needed for each of the four initial panthers are the same, which is both a curse and a blessing. In total, the player will need four Orbs of Mystery, 16 Living Steel, and eight Serpent's Eyes. The final fourth ingredient is different based on which panther mount you're making. Two of these ingredients, the Orb of Mystery and Living Steel, were discussed earlier in this video. Suffice to say, the player will have to spend 80,000 gold from a vendor to get all four Orbs of Mystery. Living Steel can be made via alchemy, and only one can be made each day since it's a one-day cooldown. The player can get around this by using another recipe, but making one Living Steel this way requires a costly three Spirits of Harmony. To make one Serpent's Eye, the player must combine ten Sparkling Shards. Sparkling Shards can be obtained when a player prospects any ore from Pandaria. Since 8 Serpent's Eyes are needed in total, this means 80 Sparkling Shards are needed. For the Sunstone Panther, the unique ingredient is 20 Sun's Radiances. One Sun's Radiance is made by transmuting one Sunstone, which comes from prospecting ores in Pandaria, and one Golden Lotus, which is a rare herb in Pandaria. The other three initial Panther mounts follow the same recipe with different ingredients. The Jade Panther requires 20 Wild Jade. One Wild Jade consists of one Alexandrite, which is another prospecting item, and one Golden Lotus. The Red Panther requires 20 Primordial Rubies, which are made from Pandaren Garnets and Golden Lotuses. Finally, the Sapphire Panther needs 20 Rivers Hearts, which consist of 20 Lapis Lazulis and another 20 Golden Lotus. After you have crafted all four of these mounts, you can finally combine them to make the Jeweled Onyx Panther. Remember to not use any of the component mounts, because if you accidentally click on it and you don't already know the mount, the mount will be taught to you and consume it on use. Overall, this mount requires the Alchemy, Herbalism, Jewel Crafting, and Mining Professions. This mount takes a lot of time and effort to grind out all the materials needed to make it. There is even some RNG involved since you can never tell what ores might be prospected into what gems either. All told, this mount and all of its base required materials can easily be over 1,000 individual items in number, making it number one on this list. Even after all of that, remember this process does not grant you any of the four mounts you craft in the process of making the Jeweled Onyx Panther. If you want to craft all five Panther mounts, You'll need 160,000 gold for the orbs, 16 Serpent's Eye Gems, 32 Living Steel, which is 192 trillion bars and 32 days worth of alchemy transmutes, if you do it without using Spirits of Harmony or Blacksmithing, and 40 each of the Primordial Rubies, Sun Radiances, River Hearts, and Wild Jades, which itself means at the very least mining 800 ores. So, what mounts did we miss? It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that most of these mounts on this list are engineering mounts. We know there's only a handful of crafting mounts we did not list to choose from, but Blizzard might change that soon, especially with the profession revamp coming in Dragonflight. Warning, this video is very annoying. 
That is, if you want to farm some of the mounts I'm about to talk about. As in this video, we'll go over 10 of the most annoying mounts to possibly farm in WoW. And at number 10, we have the Ultimate Karaji Battle Tank. This is a mount obtained from archaeology, Tolvir archaeology fragments specifically. You see, you get this mount randomly when you complete Tolvir archaeology fragments. So, all you have to do is just farm a whole bunch of archaeology for Tolvir archaeology fragments, and you'll get this mount eventually. But here's a little catch. You don't get to specifically farm Tolvir fragments. Those dig sites just pop up randomly on the map sometimes when you're doing archaeology in Kalimdor. So, most of the time there won't even be dig sites in Uldum, which is the only zone that will drop your Tolvir artifacts. So, what you can do is just complete all of the dig sites so that they'll eventually reroll to a new zone, and then eventually they'll show up in Uldum. And then once you do get your artifacts, you just randomly complete whatever is your current research project, which is assigned to you randomly each time you complete a research project. Until eventually, you'll roll on the one that allows you to create the ultimate Karaji battle tank. Which can take quite a while. There are ways to speed this up, however. If you don't want to randomly farm for Tolvir fragments, which I wouldn't recommend because it takes forever, you can just simply do archaeology in Mista Pandaria or above zones in order to get things called restored artifacts. But you can turn into a vendor which will allow you to buy a box full of a couple of Tolvir fragments so that you can complete your Tolvir research projects without having to go out and randomly find dig sites in Uldum. Now, how you get restored artifacts is by completing research projects in new zones, so Miss, Warlords of Draenor, Legion, and BFA, in which case sometimes you'll randomly get an item that you can convert into a restored artifact. So overall, it's actually faster to just farm out restored artifacts than it is trying to farm Tolvir fragments directly. But both of these are very time consuming and makes it so you have to do a lot of archaeology. And there are some reports from people who actually managed to obtain this mount that it takes about 125 completions before the mount project shows up. Although it could show up in one of your first 10 completions too. It's random, so it could take you forever, or it could be a very simple and fast process. But it is one of the most annoying mounts to farm because it requires you to do a lot of archaeology, which is why only 8% of the player base actually owns this mount. As a comparison, 10% of players own the Brine Deep Bottom Feeder mount which requires you to do a crap ton of fishing in one specific pool in the Broken Isles Dalaran. People are more willing to fish than they are to do archaeology, which should tell you something about how annoying archaeology is, especially since people have been able to obtain the ultimate Karaji battle tank for a lot longer than they could the bottom feeder mount. And at number 9, we have the Ashhide Mushan Beast. This mount is obtained in the Timeless Isle from a vendor for 500 bloody coins. And it's obtaining these coins that makes this mount so hard to farm out, as there's two ways to gain bloody coins. One of them is to use the item Sensor of the Eternal Agony, which lowers your health by 90% when you use it, and then it allows you to kill Horde and Alliance players no matter your faction, just as long as it's on the Timeless Isle, and each kill of an enemy player will award you one coin. So ideally, you just use this item and then kill 500 players in the Timeless Isle and you have your mount, which was probably possible back in Mist of Pandaria, when Timeless Isle was current content, but it's much more difficult in every expansion afterwards, where there's rarely people on the Timeless Isle. Well, outside of Mista Pandaria Time Walking Week, since the Time Walking Vendor is located on the Timeless Isle. Although even then, you have to be in war mode in order to kill enemy players, even if you have the availability of killing both factions. And the other way to obtain bloody coins, which is the much easier way, is with the item The Fire Watcher's Oath. This item will allow you to obtain bloody coins in PvP activities outside of the Timeless Isle, although it used to be at a much lower drop rate, of only having a 10% chance per kill to get one coin, as you do have to get the killing blow in order to obtain a bloody coin. So having to farm battlegrounds and get killing blows, where only 1 in 10 would actually give you a bloody coin, took a very long time, or at least around 5,000 killing blows. You'll probably passively obtain it as long as you just remember to keep the item up over the course of a couple of months. Or at least that was the case until Legion, when Blizzard hotfixed the item to give it a 100% chance to give you bloody coins on kills. But you still need to land the killing blow. And the item itself has a 10 minute cooldown, so if you die early before it comes up, you won't actually have it 100% of the time while you're in Battlegrounds. I have heard reports of people just getting two groups together of opposite factions on the Timeless Isle, and just taking turns killing each other in order to get bloody coins faster. 
I don't know if this actually works or not, but it sounds like something that would probably work. Either way, only about 7% of players actually own this mount, and it's slightly more annoying to obtain than doing archaeology. I actually had to learn how to do archaeology in order to write that segment on the number 10 spot, because I wasn't sure how the restored artifact system even worked, despite the fact that I've been playing the game for over 10 years. I will also mention, there is a little bit of a more sketchy way to obtain bloody coins faster, which involves repeatedly killing a friend's trial character over and over while they respawn instantly at a spirit healer, but I'm not sure if that's something Blizzard really wants you to do, and I'd rather not advise you to do things that would get your account banned. I'm also not sure if that method even still works, so on to the next spot on this list. And at number 8, we have the Phosphorescent Stone Drake. This is a mount that drops from a rare mob in Deep Home named Aonax, which has a 100% drop rate and will drop for everyone in your party. So what some people will do is post on their Discord server that they found this rare mob in order to invite four other people so that everyone can obtain the Stone Drake. And even with this gracious way of obtaining the mount, only about 4% of players have it. Because you see, finding this rare mob is the hard part. The mob has a 2-8 to eight hour respawn timer in Deep Home spawns in multiple locations, and shares a respawn timer with a random rare bat. Now, a respawn timer of about 5 hours on average means you have to spend a day camping this thing out if you want a chance to obtain it, which is an incredibly long time to fly around the zone looking for one rare mob. But if that's all it took, then they would have a much higher collection rate, since the WoW players on a whole are perfectly fine with camping something out for long periods of time in order to get something cool, like a mount. What makes this mount difficult to obtain is the fact that it shares that respawn timer with a bat. Because if the bat respawns, then you have to wait another two hours after killing it before the stone drake has a chance to spawn again, as it has that minimum two hour respawn timer. So what some people will do in farming this mount is just take two hours break after they kill the bat, because there's no way the drake can spawn any earlier than that. It's really this shared respawn timer with another mob, and the fact that it has a long spawn timer makes it so you could camp out this mount all day and never actually find it. Or someone else will randomly come across it and take it without you knowing, and then you won't know how long you have to wait for another respawn timer. This mount is awarded to people who have lots of free time on their hands, or can afford to fly around the game for 8 hours at a time looking for one dragon to kill for a mount, which is why it's an annoying mount to farm. And at number 7, we have the Void Talon of the Dark Star. This mount is obtained simply by clicking on an Edge of Reality portal which will port you into your own little instance that will allow you to click on an egg, which gives you a mount 100% of the time. And this one is hard to obtain in the same way that the Phosphorescent Stone Drake is. As long as you can find the portal, you'll get the mount. But finding the portal is the hard part. You see, these portals spawn once every 13 to 48 hours, which is a much longer spawn timer than the 2 to 8 hours from the previous spot on this list. And the portals can spawn at almost random locations across Draenor from the Warlord of the Draenor world map. And I say almost random locations because there technically is set locations for all the portals. It's just there's a lot of them and they're spread all throughout Draenor. And when a portal spawns, it only lasts for 5 minutes. And if no one clicks the portal in 5 minutes, it will despawn and then respawn somewhere else at random in about another hour. And it will keep doing this until someone clicks on it. In which case, it will enter its 13 to 48 hour cooldown. The thing is though, there's no real way to track if someone else has already clicked on one of these portals. So someone could have clicked on the portal yesterday, and you could be looking all around Draenor for it to not be able to respond until the next day, as people can just randomly find these portals while questing through the zones. And since finding one of these portals is so difficult, the Void Talon has only been collected by 3.4% of the player base, which is an incredibly low number, and only slightly lower than the previous spot on this list. And at number 6, we have the Reigns of the Grey Riding Camel. In order to get this mount, all you have to do is kill an NPC called Dormus the Camel Hoarder, who has a 100% chance to drop it. And just like the previous two spots, finding this NPC is the difficult part. You see, the only way to find this NPC is to be teleported to his location by finding a camel figurine. And the camel figurine is at one of 50 spawn locations around Uldum and the figurine will spawn in one of those 50 locations once every 4 hours or so. So it has a 2-8 to eight hour respawn timer. And once you find the camel figurine, there is only a 5% chance that it will actually be the correct one. The other 95% of the time, the figurine will just turn into a trash item, and then you start the 2-8 to eight hour respawn timer again. 
And just like with the Edge of Reality Portals, you won't actually know someone else has clicked on the camel figurine in the past 2 to 8 hours. So you could spend all day looking for one, only for someone else to have clicked on it randomly earlier on. And this is the nerfed version of this farm. It used to have a 4 to 12 hour respawn timer. So here's some tips to farming this mount thanks to some of the people are in the wowhead comments. You can only obtain the camel figurines in the Cataclysm version of the zone, so make sure you swap that over if you have the BFA version unlocked on your character. Then just fly around to all of its 50 spawn locations, and then swap over to war mode, as that counts as a separate server, and then check again. And then you can use trial characters on different servers to do the same method, until you basically get bored of looking. Because even doing this, and potentially looking on 50 different servers per day, there is no guarantee that you'll actually get it after checking 100 times, because of that darn little 95% chance that it will turn into trash. Which is why this little mount only has a 3.4% collection rate, which is the same as the Void Talon, despite the fact that the Void Talon mount came out two expansions later. And at number 5, we have the Chewed On Reigns of the Terrified Pack Mule. This mount is randomly obtained from world mobs that have Hex Thralled in their name, from the zone of Drustfar in BFA. Now, BFA added a couple of other world drop mounts, and they all have much higher collection rates than the Terrified Pack Mule, who was obtained in basically the exact same way as all the others, just killing a whole bunch of specific mobs in a zone. Now, according to the people who've undergone the mob grind in order to obtain this mount, the reason this one is so much harder to obtain than all the other BFA world mounts is because the mobs you have to farm are more spread out. So there's no super farm spot like all the others have, and the mobs take longer to spawn. You see, for the BFA world mount Captured Dune Scavenger, for example, there is a hyper spawn location at this one little location on the map, which is also sometimes a world quest. You can basically just put a group of four people together and constantly kill mobs all day until you get the drop, since the mobs will spawn so quickly. And all the other mounts have a similar place, even if it's not as great as this one particular mount. Except for the Terrified Pack Mule. That one requires hunting down the mobs associated to it, and all of these mounts take about 5,000 kills on average before you get a drop. Luckily though, you can just buy this mount off the auction house if someone else is selling it, which is not the case for almost all the other mounts on this list. But even with the availability of buying this mount off the auction house, it still is by far the least collected of all of the BFA world drop mounts, clocking in at only a 1.8% of people owning it. The mount is either rarely on the auction house, costs too much for the people when it is there, or is just too much of an annoying grind to actually obtain. Although since this is one of the newest mounts on this list, that also contributes to why it has such a low collection rate. Now, if you do plan on farming the BFA world mounts, make sure you do it in groups of four, because if you fill up your party with a group of five, then other people in the area won't be able to tag the same mobs. And at number four, we have the Mighty Caravan Brutosaur. This mount can be bought simply from a vendor with gold, and is probably the easiest mount to obtain on this list. However, this mount makes this list at such a high spot because of how much gold it costs. Since the vendor doesn't allow any reputation bonuses, this mount will cost you 5 million gold to purchase. Or in terms of WoW tokens, based on US server prices when I made this video, it can be thought to be worth over $500. Now, farming out 5 million gold is basically impossible for the average casual WoW player, and definitely requires you to intentionally go out and farm gold, as there's no way to passively make 5 million gold in expansion. Especially since the mount will be going away once the next expansion, Shadowlands, comes out, and it will be moved to the Black Market Auction House, where I can guarantee you that it will go for gold cap every time it shows up. As there's lots of players who have tons of gold saved up because they like to play the Auction House for an expansion or two for fun who might just quit the game for BFA and then decide to come back for Shadowlands and then think, hey, this mount has an auction house on it and is super useful. How about I use all of my money to buy it once I see it? And so for the average WoW player, farming out 5 million gold is quite the feat. Now, there's many different ways to make 5 million gold, but if you were to do a pure gold farm, it would take you longer or just as long as trying to obtain pretty much all the other previous spots on this list. Or not, this list isn't about mounts that take the longest to obtain, and are about ones that are the most annoying to obtain, as I think getting the pack mule might take longer than getting this one. Let's take running normal Skyreach as an example. This is one of the quickest dungeons you can run that gives a respectable amount of gold, as you can vendor everything and expect to earn about 400 gold to run. 
And since it's short and fast and has a teleport back to the entrance after killing the final boss, you can run the entire place in about 5 minutes. And there's an instance lockout of 10 runs per hour. So, if you run normal Skyreach 10 times an hour, because Heroic locks you to 1 per day, that could net you about 4,000 gold an hour. Which would mean you'd have to run Skyreach for 1,250 hours in order to get enough gold to buy the Brutusaur mount. Or in terms of runs, you would have to do normal Skyreach 12,500 times. And this is a really good gold farm, if you're trying to farm for just pure gold that is. I.e. not having to deal with the auction house or sell things to other players. And if one of the best pure repeatable gold farms takes you 12,500 runs in order to obtain one long boy, that should give you a good scope of just how annoying this mount is to farm. Kinda. It can be fun if you find a whole bunch of creative methods to make gold, as there's lots of them out there. I wouldn't recommend running Skyreach 12,500 times, but maybe a handful of times on characters who've already exhausted their other gold making methods for the day, it could be a way to push your way towards the goal. So, even though this mount can be bought from a vendor, with no other special prerequisites other than having a crap ton of gold, it's only owned by 1.4% of the player base. That number probably won't go much higher once it's removed from the vendor in Shadowlands. And at number 3, we have the Heavenly Onyx Cloud Serpent, who has a whopping 0.6% collection rate, which is the lowest collection rate of all of the mounts on this list. But again, this video isn't about the rarest mounts or the ones that take the longest to obtain, just the ones that are the most annoying. As the way to get this mount is by simply killing the Shaw of Anger world boss in Mists of Pandaria. And the Shaw of Anger spawns on a pretty reasonable respawn timer and isn't that hard to find and kill on each of your characters, as you can only kill and collect loot from him once per week per character. So if you have 50 characters that are all able to kill the Shaw of Anger, that's 50 attempts per week. But here's the thing with the Heavenly Onyx Clown Serpent. It has such a low chance to drop that people didn't even know it was obtainable at the launch of Mist of Pandaria. They just thought it was another mount Blizzard added to the game files and were just never going to be made available to the players, as there were a lot of Cloud Serpent models that weren't available at the start. But people have absolutely been farming this mount ever since Mist of Pandaria came out, and even then it still has a less than 1% collection rate. According to some Wowhead comments, some players were able to get the mount after only 5,000 measly kills, with a couple of people reporting upwards of 8,000 or more kills. And since you can only kill it one time per week per character, I can assume it took them years to get those kinds of numbers. And at number 2, we have the Time Loss Proto Drake. I'm sure most people thought of this mount when they first clicked on the video, as this mount is kind of famous for being an annoying mount to farm, as it's very aptly named. You will waste a lot of time trying to farm this mount's spawn locations. Now, this mount is obtained in pretty much the exact same way as the Phosphorescent Stone Drake, where you have to kill a rare mob that has a 100% chance to drop it. It has a 2 to 8 hour respawn timer, and shares a spawn timer with another dragon called Ragosa, who spawns much more often. Now, the Time Loss Proto Drake is so famous for being difficult to obtain, that you can usually talk about how difficult a new mount added to the game is, in comparison to getting the Time Loss Proto Drake. It does have about a 4% collection rate, which is a lot higher than some of the other mounts on this list. Although I should probably mention, that's still an incredibly low number for a mount that's been obtainable for over 10 years. And I totally would have put this in the number 1 on this list, it's basically what this list was all about. It's just the number 1 spot is definitely the most annoying mount to farm, and I'm sure most people won't disagree with me on it. And at number 1, we have the Big Love Rocket, which is a mount that can be obtained from killing the Holiday Boss during the Love is in the Air Holiday event, which is the World of Warcraft equivalent to Valentine's Day. Now, this mount has about a 1% chance to drop from the Holiday Boss, which is not half bad when compared to the drop chances of things like the Heavenly Onyx Cloud Serpent. But here's the thing with the Big Love Rocket. You can only attempt the boss for two weeks a year. Once those two weeks are over, you don't have a way to try farming it again, and you just have to wait a year. When the big love rocket was first added to the game, players in mass thought it was bugged. So Blizzard had to create a blue post to confirm that no, it wasn't bugged, it just had a very low drop chance. Although, I do have a friend who was able to get the big love rocket for the very first time she ever tried farming for it. Probably not that annoying to some people who are super lucky, but for like everyone else, this is the pinnacle of annoying mount farms, 
One that you can't even try for, for 99% of the year. Because at least with the Heavenly Onyx Cloud Serpent, you can try to obtain it all year round. So the Big Love Rocket is just more a frustrating grind because you can only grind it for such a short amount of time each year, in addition to the fact that it has an incredibly low drop chance. So with all 50 characters on your realm, you can only attempt to farm this mount 700 times per year, which sounds like a lot of attempts, and it is, but I'm sure most people don't even know there is a 50 character cap on your account, let alone have enough max level characters to attempt that grind or high level characters, so you're probably looking at something around 2 to 5 high level characters for the average active player, which equates to about 28 to 70 tries per year, which isn't really that much when it comes to farming a 1% drop chance mount. There were three additional flying carpet mounts in the Wrath of Lich King beta that never made it to live for some reason. The first two, Swift Ebonweed Carpet and Swift Spellfire Carpet, seems to suggest that they were going to be different flying mounts to make for tailoring based on the different kinds of cloth you can make. It should be noted that these two mounts are different colors from any other flying carpets in the game. They're not completely unique models, just recolors of existing mounts. I can guess as to why they were scrapped since no official word was ever made. If they got these mounts in addition to the ones that did make it into the game, that would basically force mount collectors at the time to roll tailoring if they wanted more mounts than everyone else. Or maybe they just didn't want one profession to have so many different kinds of mounts to make while others got one or none. There's many different reasons Blizzard could have scrapped them. As for why they scrapped the third one, well, I have no real idea. It's just called Deprecated Swift Flying Carpet and doesn't have a model or picture for it. I can assume it just had another different color and used the same model. It is interesting to note that this mount doesn't actually have a riding skill required to use, only a tailoring and level requirement. I'm pretty sure it's just because the mount was scrapped, but you never know. It could have been planned to be an unskilled mount like the current Erlen motorcycle is. Whatever the case, tailoring already had four flying mounts all with the same model, just with different colors. I doubt tailors are too mad they didn't get three additional different colors of the same mount. Next up, we've got the Brewfest Kodo. This Kodo was most likely supposed to be the Horde version of the Brewfest Ram, a mount you could only get during Brewfest as Alliance. But then they decided to revamp Brewfest and add epic versions of the Ram and Kodo to the Brewfest boss, and both Alliance and Horde can use either. One of the few ways for Alliance to ride Kodos and Hordes to ride Rams. Funny enough, even though the regular Brewfest Kodo was never put into the game, its flavor text was updated in Warlord to Draenor, to say, you can't remember exactly how you got this mount, then again, you can't remember much of anything that happens at Brewfest. Not sure why Blizzard decided to add flavor text to a mount that was never implemented. Maybe it'll come out in the future, or maybe an intern just had fun with it, who knows. In Warlord to Draenor, a new mammoth mount model was added to the game files, but never implemented. The mounts also don't have any animations, they just stay there static, indicating that they were probably scrapped early on in development but they still show up in game files for whatever reason. It's theorized they were probably Warlord to Draenor repair mammoth mounts, like how Mr. Pandaria had the Reforge Yak, since we never actually got a new repair mount after Mists, and not even in Legion. It would be nice if a mount with like a banker on it was added, or maybe even an auction house, like they ended up doing in BFA a few years after this video originally went live. In Mists of Pandaria beta, there were four other colors of the Water Strider mounts the Jade, Orange, Crimson, and Golden Water Striders, and were most likely going to be rep rewards from the Anglers. But instead, they just went with one Water Strider and left the other four out of the game. Until Warlords of Draenor, that is, when they put the Crimson Water Strider back into the game as a purchasable item from Nat Pagel. So the other three colors of Water Striders could be implemented in the future as well, which would have been great because the Water Strider used to be one of the most convenient mounts in the game, and in fact it was so convenient that they took its water walking ability and added it to all mounts basically, and now the Water Strider mounts are not as valuable as they once were when I first made this video. And again, more mounts that appeared in Beta Miss but never went live. This time we've got Riding Cranes. There are three different color variations that didn't make it, while all the others did. Noticing a pattern here? Blizzard just loves putting a whole bunch of different color mounts in the game, and only allowing you to get a handful of them. Of the three riding cranes never actually added, the White Albino Crane did make a brief appearance in the Warlords of Draenor Alpha, meaning that Blizzard was thinking of adding some of their already in the game files mounts available, like they did with the Crimson Water Strider, but then changed their minds. Honestly, I don't really think it's a big deal that these crane mounts weren't put in. They aren't super useful like the Water Striders were, and are just different colors of mounts already in the game, so it's not like we're losing a super unique model with them not being included at the moment. After all, they can always just tack one of these mounts to the end of some random achievement in the future, like they did with the unreleased Heavenly Cloud Serpent mounts. 
There were three unused models for Cloud Serpent mounts in the Mist beta that weren't added at launch. The Golden Cloud Serpent was later added towards the end of Mist as a vendor item from the Timeless Isle. The Azure Cloud Serpent was added in World of Draenor past 6.2 as an achievement for collecting 300 mounts. And the Jade Cloud Serpent, the one that looks exactly like Yulon, the August Celestial, and is probably the coolest of all the Cloud Serpents, is still not in the game yet, despite being in the game files since the beta of Mist and having its own flavor text and everything. The other two mounts were added eventually, so maybe the Jade Serpent will be added sometime in the future as well. But, and this is just speculation on my part, the Jade Serpent might not be added for lore reasons precisely because it looks so much like Yulon. I mean, if they give us Yulon, then they'd have to give us the other Wild Gods as mounts. So it'd be cool to ride around on mounts of Malorn and Sonaris as well. Now onto some non-recolored Mist mounts. The Stormcrow mount was added to the game files sometime in Mist, but no one has seen it yet. It's actually still a pretty big mystery in what happened with this mount. It's in the game, but no one knows how to actually get it, or it might not be in the game and it's just in the game files like the other mounts in this video. It's a mystery mount, that's for sure. There is a battle pet in game with the same model of this mount called Stormwing that is only obtained by collecting 600 unique pets, which is a decently tough achievement to grind out. So maybe the mount can be tied to some hard to get hidden achievement, or maybe it's a reward from some kind of hidden pet battle feat. Who knows, I'm just guessing wildly, honestly. Blizzard has said there are still hidden things in the game that players haven't found yet, so it's possible this mount could just be one of them. Update, as of Dragonflight, this unique model mount still has not been added to the game yet. Next up on this list, we have Foro's Fabled Steed. This mount was added to the game files in patch 1.6 with the release of Blackwing Lair. It used to be an item that would summon a bronze drake to ride and even had the flavor text of You Wish, but was later chained to an unusable legendary item and its flavor text was removed. It was also the first mount in game to say it was a flying mount in Vanilla WoW before flying mounts were actually added later on in the Burning Crusade. There are some theories about this mount, one being that it was just a tease to data miners with a you wish flavor text meaning you wish we'd add this item to the game, or something similar. Another theory is that it's actually just the mount that Warchief Ren Blackhand uses when he flies into the fight. Although I don't know why Blackhand would need an item to use a mount, and the mount he uses is a different color than the mount this item is supposed to summon, but I mean, you never know. Blizzard did use all kinds of weird tricks of vanilla WoW to make exciting things work. For example, did you know that for some quests that didn't require killing mobs or interacting with objects, like listening to a short story or just going through dialogue options, the game would kill an invisible rabbit to signify that you completed the quest, since quests were hardwired to only be completed by two methods that I mentioned previously, or how Anixia was programmed to fight invisible rabbits and not actual players to give the illusion of actually fighting players. So Rend could have used an item like this in the background to give the illusion of fighting a real mount or something, but I doubt it honestly. Next up we've got Peep's Whistle, another legendary mount. This mount is literally just Ashes of Alar and the Phoenix mount that drops in Tempest Keep. Someone did ask a GM about the item and got this response. I understand why you're confused. Basically, you've fallen prey to one of the worst pitfalls of WoW fan sites like WoWhead, PTR data mining. You see, during the development cycle of an expansion or patch, items come and go and developers change their minds more than once. Frostmourne was once going to be a regular item. You can see the unfinished playable version of it in Wildhead. And so was Ashbringer. Eventually, developers decided against both ideas. Peep's Whistle is one of those ideas that was discarded before it got into the game. It was transformed into Ashes of Alar that we all know and love. It's not a Phoenix's Phoenix, nor a GM mount, nor any other rumors you may have heard. So, it's a pretty straightforward reason why this mount was never added, as we actually got confirmation for this one. In Alpha WoW, there were quite a few large cat mounts that were never added to live. Most of these mounts were just bigger versions of cat models in game with harnesses put on them. And there were quite a few of these mounts too, but none of them made it to the game. But there were rumors and myths surrounding a few of them in early WoW. And some players were even given some of these cat mounts by mistake in TBC from GMs, before having them taken away after bragging about having them on the forums. But there was one really big rumor about the Bengal Tiger mount that was pretty popular at the time. The Bengal Tiger mount rumor basically stated that you could get the mount in game by doing some wall hopping into Stranglethorn Vale to get to a hidden cave, where a female vendor would sell you the mount. Many people did the wall jumping required to get this cave, but the cave was always just empty. There were rumors that the vendor was on a one month respawn timer, or that only one person per realm could buy from it. But no one ever saw her because she never existed. The rumor was most likely just a troll support with screenshots of the mount from Alpha WoW or a private server. But just like the Ashbringer rumors, it never went anywhere. But also just like the Ashbringer rumors, Blizzard put a nod to the rumors in-game eventually. 
With the revamp of the old zones, Blizzard added a quest to the game that eventually sends you to this cave and you get a cat pet as a reward. Not exactly a mount, but close enough. Another thing of note about the Bengal Tiger Mount, if you look at which races can use it, it includes all the vanilla races except Torrents. This really shows just how early on the alpha this mount was scrapped since back then, Torrents were going to be given an ability to run as fast as mounts rather than give them an actual mount to ride. But Blizzard eventually decided to scrap the idea and gave Torrents the ability to ride mounts. But not before they scrapped the count mounts though apparently. Update. In vanilla, Torrents just couldn't really ride anything except for Kodos. And to round off this video, we've got slightly different color Meccano Striders. There are three different colors that aren't in the game, but one of them was in the game for a while and was the rarest mount in the game for quite some time. Out of the three mounts, the fluorescent green Meccano Strider was given to a player by mistake, but the player was allowed to keep the mount. When the GMs give you an unattainable item by mistake, they usually just take them away like the March and Fury shirt or the cat mounts I talked about earlier in the previous post. But it seems pretty recently the mount was finally taken away from the player. No one really knows why it was taken, but it no longer shows up on the player armory like it used to in the past. There are rumors as to why it was taken away, like that he tried to sell his account with the tagline that he had a one-of-a-kind mount on his account and therefore can get a lot of money for it. But anyone can post a fake posting of someone else's account, and there isn't any real evidence that this actually happened, so I wouldn't take this rumor too seriously, even if it is a pretty popular rumor. In this video, we're going over the history of some of the rare mounts in Vanilla WoW. Mounts that people knew about, but were very difficult to obtain for one reason or another. First up, we have the Winter Spring Frost Saber. This was a mount only available to Alliance players and simply required you to grind out the reputation known as the Winter Saber Trainers. There were only two NPCs in the game associated to this rep, and only one of them would actually talk to you or did anything. So in Winter Spring, you could talk to an NPC known as River and Frostwind, who would give you a quest to go kill some bears and Chimera in the nearby area. And after you completed it, you would get around 50 rep. And then the quest would turn to be repeatable, so you could do it over and over again to get more reputation. After a bit of rep, you unlocked another quest which would ask you to kill some Furbolg, that would then also become repeatable after you completed it, giving another avenue for 50 more rep per completion. And then once you had honored, you'd unlock the last repeatable quest, the Rampaging Giants, which had you go out and kill around 8 elite giants in the area, for a total of 75 rep, which generally wasn't worth it compared to the other two quests. And because the only way to get rep was through these three repeatable quests, they would take the average non-human 840 quest completions before you got exalted. Or 746 if you included the giant quests as well. And we're talking about vanilla WoW quests with low drop chances and spawn rates, and of course actually hard elite mobs, so doing 840 of these was kind of insane. And at the end of it, you would simply unlock the vendor which would allow you to purchase the Frost Saber for 100 gold. But at least it was an epic mount that could be used with basic training. So it could save you some gold on a mount if you didn't want to unlock epic training. The only reason this mount was rare was because it was hard to obtain and because it was alliance only. In the Burning Crusade, when Blood Elves were added to the game, they weren't initially hostile to this NPC and could talk to it in order to get neutral reputation although they still couldn't accept or do any of the quests for them, so that never went anywhere beyond that. And eventually this little bug was fixed and they had the reputation removed. They also greatly increased the amount of reputation you gained from this in the Burning Crusade by a magnitude of five times, so you only had to complete a measly 168 quests in order to get exalted, which is still a lot. In Cataclysm, they removed the old method for how to obtain this mount and instead added a much more simple daily quest system, where you do a series of 20 dailies in order to get it instead. And then they finally added a horde equivalent in Wrath of the Lich King, which was an Ungoro Crater and awarded a Raptor instead. And if you complete either of these quests in Retail WoW, you'll be given the other one on the opposite faction, so you don't need to unlock both of them. Next up we have the Unarmored Class Epic Mounts. Before patch 1.4, every race except the Undead who had the option to buy the 100% speed epic mounts only had the option to buy different colored versions of their normal 60% speed mounts. And since patch 1.4 was only 5 months into the launch of the game, there were not a lot of people who were able to actually obtain the epic mounts yet. Because you see, in early vanilla, mounts didn't really have training, and instead were just items that had level requirements on them. So if you had a mount, you could just use it. And in order to purchase the epic mounts, they cost 1000 gold which is equivalent to around half a million gold in retail's currency. So being able to farm that out within the first five months was not something a lot of people did. 
In fact, most people didn't even make it to max level within that time, let alone also farm out the equivalent to half a million gold. So, the amount of people who actually owned one of the unarmored versions was very small. Made even smaller by the fact that when they did introduce the armored versions of the mount to the game, they added the option to trade in the old ones for the new ones. So a lot of people traded in their very rare color variations for the new, better looking armored ones, without knowing they were trading away future rare mounts. The only races it didn't really apply to were the undead, because they were already given armored versions of their epic mounts from the beginning for some reason. And that's probably why they decided to slap armor on the rest of the mounts as well, to kind of copy the undead. And now we'll go into the raid drop mounts. First up, we have the ZG mounts, the Swift Rizashi Raptor and the Swift Zulian Tiger. Both of these mounts had about a 1% drop chance from ZG, which was a 20-man raid. The only thing rare about these mounts was the drop chance. Generally, in the modern game, mounts that drop from bosses and raids usually have about a 100% drop chance until it becomes old content. But back in Vanilla Wild, this wasn't really the case. In fact, this doesn't change until around after Cataclysm, really, and mounts were very rare and few and far in between. There was actually a huge benefit to get a mount, so having them on a low drop chance from a raid made them extra special rewards. So there was already a 1 in 100 chance of getting them from a kill on a boss associated to the two mounts, but you also had to win a roll against 20 other people who probably never seen them drop either. Assuming the raid leader didn't just ninja loot the mount, or you weren't in a raid where the officers had the mounts in reserve for themselves. So you just had to be really lucky in order to obtain these mounts, and they were made even rarer once they removed them from the game in Cataclysm, when they revamped that raid zone as a dungeon. And for the other drop chance mounts, we have the Death Charges Reigns from Shatrath, which had an even lower drop chance than the ZG mounts, with most people speculating it had around a 0.2% drop chance, which was later buffed in Wrath of the Lich King to a 1% drop chance. In order to get the mount, all you did was go into the dungeon Shatrath, and just kill the boss, Lord Arius Rivendare, and get very lucky by winning a roll against 5 to 10 other people, since dungeons weren't capped at 5 people back then. Probably a big reason for this mount's much lower drop chance was because it dropped from a dungeon rather than a raid, and it's much easier to farm a dungeon over and over than it is a raid for the simple facts that dungeons require less people to complete, and could be completed multiple times a day instead of once a week. So it kind of made sense in that regard. The mount itself was just a different color of the Forsaken Epic Racial Mount, so it was one of the few ways for Alliance players to ride around on the skeletal horse. And for a time, this mount was even one of the rarest items in the game, period. Next, we'll talk about the legendary mount, the Black Karaji Battle Tank. This mount was only obtainable for about 10 hours after the launch of the AQ-40 event, which required a person to complete one of the longest quest chains in the game's history that was also one of the hardest quest chains to complete in the game's history and then ring the gong after the whole server came together and donated enough materials to start the event. Since the quest chain was so difficult to complete and basically required an entire guild funneling all their resources into one player, the amount of people who were able to actually complete the quest before the very limited 10 hour duration was very small. Which is why even to this day, the Black Karaji Battle Tank is still one of the rarest mounts in the game's history. There are other colors of this mount that will drop that are much easier to get inside of the AQ-40 raid. So it is actually pretty easy to get a Karaji mount. The only advantage the black battle tank had over the others was being usable outside of the instance, which actually kind of made the ability a little bit buggy. No pun intended. You see, the mount allowed you to start casting it while you were still in combat, but wouldn't actually mount you up if you were still in combat by the time it finished casting, which didn't really give you much of an advantage, but was a distinction that wasn't shared by any other mounts until that was fixed. There was also a really minor bug in patch 2.2, where if a character logged out while they were on the mount when that patch went live, they would log in to find their character transformed into a flying wasp. This was only a one-time occurrence though, as the buff wasn't available by any other means and simply went away if you clicked it off or mounted up again. This might have been an intentional internal thing, as on the PTR for Wrath of the Lich King's launch, the Black Karaji battle tank had a tooltip change which roughly said that the mount would change depending on your writing skill and location. And if tested in locations that allowed you to fly, the mount would turn into a wasp and allow you to fly in that way. Although this functionality was removed before the patch released. And currently, the mount is still a ground mount which can't actually fly. And also, it was possible for people to obtain the mount in Wrath of the Lich King. When Blizzard opened up a couple of new servers, these fresh servers never had their gates opened in AQ40. 
so players would rush to complete the quest as quickly as possible in order to obtain this incredibly rare mount. And now, we'll talk about possibly one of the rarest mounts in the game's history, but, you know, actually. Which is probably not in the game anymore, and that's the fluorescent green Mechano Strider. This was an alt color of the Mechano Strider mount that gnomes received, which wasn't available to players in the game, but was a model in the game's files. One day, a player had a problem with his mount and messaged the GM about it, who sent him a replacement and accidentally sent him this alt color version, which wasn't supposed to be available to players. The player was allowed to keep the mount though, and was the only person in the game who had it, and you can't really beat a rare mount that only one person total has. Way later on down the road, the mount was removed from the character's collection sheet, like more than 10 years after, but we don't actually know the exact reason why. There's lots of speculations and rumors online though, that the person who owned the account tried to sell it during Warlords of Draenor on a WoW cheating site. And the tagline that he had was having the rarest mount in the game on his account. So Blizzard removed it from his collection. Now, I have no confirmation for this. I have looked into it pretty extensively. And it seems to be exclusively a rumor with no evidence other than other people and websites talking about the same rumors. But it's a very popular one. Whatever the case, it seems like the player who owned the mount no longer plays the game. So you'll probably never see it in-game unless they add the mount to the game later on in some other fashion. Next up, we have the Riding Turtle. This was a TCG loot card added to the game during Vanilla WoW, even though most of the other more famous TCG loot mounts were added during the Burning Crusade. And what the Riding Turtle did was simply allow you to mount up on a mount that didn't actually increase your running speed. In fact, it was slower on most occasions, since it used mount speed modifiers to move. So if you had any way to increase your speed while running, it wouldn't work on the mount. Although if you had a way to increase your mount speed, they would work on it. Since it was one of the earliest, if not the first, TCG loot card mount added to the game, when you typed in the code for the loot card to get the mount, you would only get on that one character on one server. So you wouldn't get on all of your characters until they added account-wide mounts in Vista Pandaria. The turtle didn't actually increase your swim speed until Wrath of the Lich King, when they added the aquatic mount system to the game with the sea turtle being an obtainable mount. Although they didn't really increase your swim speed as much as they do today, as they didn't get a buff to the swim speed until Legion. But at least it was slightly more useful than just a mount that didn't actually increase your movement or swim speed at all, and was purely a vanity item that you could ride around in town for looks. Especially with how rare it was because it sold out so quickly, and you could only have it on a single character. The mount was also a white item when it was first introduced to the game, so if you accidentally deleted the item, it wouldn't give you a confirmation if you wanted to delete it or not, since the protection only applied to blue or higher items until the Burning Crusade when the item was properly changed to an epic quality item. Now, let's talk about the Reigns of the Bengal Tiger. This was a very popular mount rumor that was never actually added to the game, but did appear in the alpha and was already coded and good to go in the game files. The Bengal Tiger mount rumor basically stated that you could get the mount in the actual game by doing some wall hopping in Stranglethorn Vale to get to the hidden cave, where a female vendor would sell you the mount. Many people did the wall jumping required to get to this cave, but it was always empty. There was speculation that the vendor was on a one month respawn timer, or that only one person per realm could buy from it, but no one ever saw her because she never existed. What made the rumors more credible was there was actual in-game screenshots of the mount. According to some comment threads online, the mount was given to all players in one of the early alpha or beta builds so they could get around quicker, which is where most of the screenshots of the mountain game came from, and then later on, they all came from private servers. But just like the famous Ashbringer rumors, the in-game rumors never went anywhere. But exactly like the Ashbringer rumors, Blizzard did put a nod to the rumors in-game eventually. With a revamp of the old zones, Blizzard added a quest to the game that actually sends you to this cave, and then you get a cat pet as a reward. Not exactly a mount, but close enough. Another thing to note about the Bengal Tiger mount if you look at which races can use it, it includes all of the vanilla races except the Torrens. This really shows you how early on in the alpha the mount was scrapped, since back then, Torrens were going to be given an ability to run as fast as mounts rather than given any actual mounts to ride. But Blizzard eventually decided to scrap that idea and gave Torrens the ability to ride mounts. But not before they scrapped the Bengal Tiger mount, apparently. Blizzard had planned for wall climbing mounts to play a part of Wrath of the Lich King, which was probably scrapped somewhere in mid-development. but. There are some hints to this in the game. There exist in the game files some untextured Nerubian models, which were probably going to be those mounds that could climb on walls. 
And if you ever go out of bounds in the Ankahet dungeon, you'll notice that it's gigantic. As big as any zone in Wrath of the Lich King, and could easily have been a zone since the dungeon takes place in a small part of it. And that was kind of the intention with it. Blizzard had much more plans for the Nerubians than delegating them to minor villains that get dealt with in dungeons, and then randomly at the end of a tournament. In an interview with Ghostcrawler, one of the devs who worked on the game at the time, someone asked him which piece of scrap content he liked the most. And Ghostcrawler said that he was the most sad that they had to scrap the Nerubian leveling zones. So, why was the Nerubian leveling zone and wall climbing mount scrapped from the game? Considering they obviously had a much more expansive plot planned for an underground zone beneath Northrend? Well, the answer to that was actually pretty simple, as most of these mysteries ended up being. According to an interview with another WoW developer, the zone and the wall climbing stuff was just simply too ambitious, and was out of the scope for the team at the time with their hardware during Wrath of the Lich King. So, they had to scrap it in order to actually get the game finished. So, as a compromise, they kind of just took what they had and turned it into a dungeon. Quite literally, as pretty much the entire zone is just inside that dungeon. Even if you can't actually access it legitimately. On screen, you should be seeing my exploration footage going around the dungeon, and it's so big that I can't possibly show all of it in this short little video, but you could easily fit an entire leveling zone in here. And this was just the scrapped version. There were earlier versions with actual architecture and doodads placed in it, which they removed most of that stuff when they converted it into a dungeon. And as for the wall climbing mounts, well, they weren't really needed if there wasn't going to be an underground zone, as players can already fly in Wrath of the Lich King. So, it's a shame they didn't have those, as it seemed like a fun little gimmick to mounts. I guess they could always do it in the future with mount equipment or something. In this video, we're going to have the changes made to mount equipment throughout the history of World of Warcraft. We'll start off in vanilla and classic WoW, with a trinket named Carrot on a Stick. When worn, this trinket increases the mount speed of a player by 3%. To obtain the item, you need to pick up the quest from Whizzle Brass Bolts located in the Zone of Thousand Needles. The name of this quest is called Gazrilla, and to complete it, it requires a player to go to the Dungeon of Zulfurak and kill the Hydra Demigod boss. This was a level 50 quest, and unfortunately not as simple as it sounds. To summon Gazrilla, players need to bang on a gong with the Mallet of Zulfurak. To create the mallet, it required doing several steps in the hinterlands before the player could finally enter the dungeon and bang the gong. First, players must kill Keong the Keeper and Mortigia the Keeper at the Altar of Zol in hinterlands, which drops a sacred mallet. Next, players must go to Chintha Alor and head to the top of the city past many mobs before clicking on the altar to transform the sacred mallet into the Mallet of Zulfurak. Then, players have to head across the world, enter Zulfurak, kill Gazrilla, and loot Gazrilla's electrified scale. After completing this dungeon quest and returning to Whistle Brass Bolts with proof of the monster's demise, players could at last turn in the quest to obtain the carrot on a stick's trinket. This quest was later changed in Wrath and Cataclysm. The requirement of having to have the mallet to bring the gong was removed in Wrath. The quest itself was also completely removed from the game in Kata when the Zone of Thousand Needles was tsunami flooded by a certain angry edgy black dragon. The next item to benefit mounts in Classic WoW comes from the enchanting profession. This enchant, simply named Riding Scale, can only be applied to armor items in the hand slot. When applied and worn, this permanent enchant increases mount speed by 2%. However, the formula to learn this enchant is a very rare world drop. It also has about a 1% drop rate from Nefarian as well. To craft the enchant, it requires an enchanting skill of 250, and its ingredients are two large brilliant shards and three rich illusion dust. The final item from Classic that increases mount to speed came from another profession item, this time blacksmithing. Mithril Spurs were a blacksmithing only augment in Classic and could be applied to the feed armor slot to increase mount and movement speed by 4%. The plans for Mithril Spurs are a very low world drop chance and can be looted from Magister Calandris in the Diremold Dungeon. To craft Mithril Spurs, it requires a blacksmithing skill of 235 and requires 4 Mithril Bars and 3 solid grinding stones. The Mithril Spurs themselves were not soulbound, so they could be traded or sold, but they still required a blacksmith to add them to the foot armor slot all the way until the end of the Burning Crusade. The cool thing about all these mount improvement items in Classic was that their effects could be stacked. So as long as a player was a blacksmith in Classic, they could have a plus 9% movement speed increase to their mounts. That's 3% from the carrot on a stick, 2% from the glove enchant, and 4% from the boot augment, for a total of a 9% upgrade. Now we move on to WoW's first expansion, the Burning Crusade. TBC saw two trinkets that added a mount speed of 10%. Unfortunately, none of these trinkets stacked with any of the items from Classic, which also increased mount movement speed. The first trinket is called the Riding Crop. This trinket was crafted with a leatherworking, which required a skill of 350. The pattern for the Riding Crop is sold by Thomas Ants in the Old Hillsbrad Foothills in the Escape from Durnhold Dungeon, which is accessible by the Caverns of Time. As an interesting side note, during the TBC beta, this trinket actually increased mount speed by 25%, but Blizzard probably thought that was too OP and reduced it. The second trinket, called the Skybreaker Whip, can be obtained from the Netherwing Orcs off the south of Shadowmoon Valley. 
To get this trinket, players have to complete a series of daily quests until they're honored with another wing. Then the player has to complete the Dragon Ball race, Captain Sky Shatter. The Skybreaker whip flavor text reads, Property of the Top Orc, a reference to the movie Top Gun. And of course, because Blizzard hates fun like this, these two trinkets do not stack with each other, or spells like the Paladin's Crusader Aura. Both of these trinkets when equipped are just barely above the speed increase from all the mount improvement items in vanilla. When combined, all the items from Classic give a 9% increased speed, and one of these trinkets gives a 10% increased speed. So these trinkets are better, but only 1% better than their Classic mount improvement counterparts. Now we move on to the Wrath of the Lich King. While there were no mount improvement items added in the expansion, there are two things of note. First, at the very beginning of Wrath, Blizzard nerfed the trinkets from TBC so they no longer worked up players above level 70. The other interesting fact is that in the Wrath beta, there actually was another riding crop that could be crafted. However, this riding crop was more like an enchant or an augment because it applied a 10% mount speed buff to a mount when it was in the player's inventory. However, it was also consumed in the process. With mount collecting becoming increasingly popular, Blizzard might have decided to just abandon the idea, because it would be so expensive and time-consuming to have to enchant every single mount a player wanted to use. The next mount improvement item comes from the World of the Draenor expansion. The swift riding crop was a consumable item that granted the player the ability to instantly mount an Ashran for one hour. To buy this item, Alliance players need to be honored with the Worm's Vanguard, and Horde players need to be honored with Vulgent Spear. The item costs 5 gold and can be bought from Thomas Ryogen, the Stormship Quartermaster, and for Horde players, Dazarian, the War Spear Quartermaster. These items are in the epic BG version of Ashran at NBFA, so be sure to buy them if you can before the match starts. Unfortunately, this effect does not persist through death. As a fun side note, whether by accident or not, when WAD first launched, Alliance players had to pay 50 gold for the Swift Riding Crop, while Horde players only had to pay 5 gold. While the price was made equal later, it does make you wonder if this could have been a cheeky reference to the Alliance favoritism meme. Next, we move on to the Legion expansion, which really started adding mount equipment to the game. The first item worth discussing can be found in the Sanctum of the Light, which is a Paladin Order Hall located underneath the Lighthouse Chapel in the Eastern Plaguelands. When Paladins click on this item, it gave them a 10% increased mount speed on the Broken Isles. The next four mount equipment items all come from various professions from the Legion expansion. Each of these items provides a fun and unique effect to a player's mount. The items are luckily not soulbound, so they can be sold and traded to other players. The first of these two items comes from blacksmithing. After completing a short quest, blacksmiths learn how to craft laystone hoof plates with 25 laystone ore. When used, they increase the player's mount speed on the Broken Isles by 20% for 2 hours. However, they are an extra great for blacksmiths because the duration of the buff is quadrupled to an 8 hour long buff. The second item blacksmith can craft is called the Demon Steel Stirrups. Presumably a reference to the Mithril Spurs of vanilla, these stirrups don't increase movement speed but instead allow the player to interact with objects while mounted. However, they only work in the Broken Isles. Just like the Laystone Hoof Plates, Demon Steel Stirrups are learned by Blacksmith through a short quest and their 2 hour buff is extended to 8 hours for Blacksmiths. Demon Steel Stirrups are particularly useful for gathering crafted reagents such as ores and herbs in the Broken Isles since the player no longer has to dismount to interact with those objects. Of course, there are several limitations to these fun mount equipment items. Unfortunately, only one of these mount equipment items can be equipped at a time and these items only work in the Broken Isles, meaning they do not work on Argus either. The next mount equipment item for Legion comes from the Leatherworking Profession. The stone high leather barding prevents players from being dazed while mounted. Like other mount equipment in Legion, these items only last for 2 hours and only work on the Broken Isles. The effect is also extended for 8 hours for players with leatherworking and is learned from a quest. However, the stone high leather barding is pretty expensive to craft as they only require 50 stone hide leather. The last mount equipment item from the Broken Isles is the Blood Totem Saddle Blanket, made from the tailing profession. What interesting effect might this item have, you're probably wondering? Turns out, not that interesting. This item just lets you keep a rested experience buff no matter where you log off, as long as you're on the mount with the buff. As such, it's pretty much useless at max level. Its use description says, place a saddle blanket on your mount, making your mount much more comfortable for 2 hours. The effect's duration is quadrupled for tailors. Battle for Azeroth saw the second iteration of this mount equipment added in Legion. Essentially, everything was just copied from Legion into BFA professions, with the names and ingredients changing. All the same effects and the professions that made the mount equipment stayed the same, with there being three main changes. First, the BFA mount equipment obviously only works in BFA zones. Second, they use BFA mats, and third, they're learned from trainers and not from quests. A note before we move on, Battle for Azeroth is the only expansion where profession names are different for each faction. For Alliance players, BFA professions start with Kul Turan, and for Horde, they start with Zandalari. Instead of having to say Kul Turan and Zandalari professions, we're just going to simplify it down to BFA professions. Just like in Legion, there are two mount equipment items for blacksmithing. The first one, called Monal Hardened Hoof Plates, is essentially the same thing as the Laystone Hoof Plates from Legion. Like their Laystone Hoof Plate counterparts from Legion, Monal Hardened Hoof Plates increase the player's mount speed by 20% for 2 hours, or 8 hours if you're a blacksmith. The second item from BFA blacksmithing are the Monal Hardened Stirrups. 
which are the BFA versions of the Demon Steel Serups from Legion. They provide the same ability to interact with objects while mounted and are only limited to Kul Taras and Zandalar. In BFA Leatherworking, Leatherworkers can craft the coarse leather barding. This item is equivalent to the stone high leather barding from Legion and prevents the player from being dazed while mounted. And finally, with BFA Tailoring, players could make the Sea Breeze Saddle Blanket, which is equivalent to the Blood Totem Saddle Blanket from Legion. Now we come to the biggest change in WoW regarding mount equipment. In patch 8.2, a new mount equipment slot was added to the mount journal. Five new items are introduced that could be placed in the slot, with four of them being similar abilities from both the Legion and BFA profession items. The first craftable, slottable mount equipment item added in 8.2 that we'll discuss is the Comfortable Rider's Barding. This item can be learned from the BFA Leatherworking Profession Trainer. Similar to the first iterations of the Stone High Leather Barding in Legion and the Coarse Leather Barding in BFA, the Comfortable Rider's Barding, when equipped, prevents the players from being dazed while mounted. Now, there are two interesting things about crafting this item. First, in BFA crafting, it requires both the coarse leather bard from leatherworking and the saddle brief saddle blanket from tailoring. Both of these items must then be combined by the leatherworker in order to make the comfortable rider's barding. The other interesting crafting fact is that this recipe also reappears in Shadowlands leatherworking. So far, this is the only piece of mount equipment in the game that can be crafted from two different expansion professions. Crafting the Comfortable Rider's Barding is considerably easier with Shadowlands Leatherworking, as it only requires 2 Callous Hides, 5 Lightless Silk, and 5 Penumbra of Thread. Perhaps Blizzard thought that having to make the Comfortable Rider's Barding from BFA with two different professions and from two different mat intensive items was too expensive or too much work for the average player. The next piece of slottable mount equipment is crafted using BFA Enchanting. The Lightsteep Hoof Plates have the same function as the Laystone Hoof Plates and the Monotho Hardened Hoof Plates, but instead of being crafted with blacksmithing, they're crafted by enchanting. However, enchanters do still need to get the Monotho Hard Hoof Plates to be used as an ingredient in the recipe. To craft the Light Step Hoof Plates, which increase the player's ground mount speed by 20%, an enchanter will need 2 Umbra Shards, 30 Gloom Dust, and 1 Monotho Hardened Hoof Plate. The next slottable mount equipment item is called the Saddle Chute, and is made with BFA tailoring. The Saddle Chute gives a mount a unique augment that has not been seen before in the game. When equipped and the player is dismounted high in the air, the player will slowly fall down on a parachute, instead of immediately plummeting to their death. The player must be fallen for at least 3 seconds before the parachute deploys. However, the item can be buggy and is very expensive to make, costing 10 embroidered deep sea satin, 50 gilded sea weave, 15 dreaded leather, and 20 nylon thread. The saddle chute is so far the only new mount equipment effect that is not some iteration of a previously crafted mount buff item. Now we come to the biggest reason why the mount equipment slot was added. Prior to BFA, there were two water strider mounts added to the game. These mounts were wholly unique because they were the only mounts in the game that allowed the player to walk on water while mounted. The first Water Strider is the Azure Water Strider, it can be purchased from Nat Pagel and the Crossering Vials for 4,000 gold. However, you must be exalted with the anglers to purchase it. The next Water Strider is the Crimson Water Strider, it can be purchased from Nat Pagel for 100 Nat's Lucky's Coins in the Garrison from the World of Draenor expansion. However, this mount was far more time consuming and RNG dependent than a simple rep grind, so the Azure Water Strider was much easier to obtain for players. As you can imagine, a mount that can walk on water was very handy, and it became so handy that almost everyone used it all the time. Over time, most people acquired a water strider mount, and in some cases it almost became mandatory in dungeons or battlegrounds. Blizzard saw that most of the mounts being summoned were water striders, and this was one of the big reasons they decided to introduce the mount equipment slot. There were not one, but two different mount equipment items that can be equipped that allow the player's mount to walk on water. The first of these is called the Angler's Water Striders. When 8.2 went live, the water walking ability was removed from the water walking mounts, but players who owned a water strider prior to patch 8.2 were mailed an item called Angler's Water Striders on every level 100 plus character by Nat Pagel. The Angler's Water Striders can also be purchased from Nat Pagel for 45 gold, and even better, the item is account wide, so you can send it alts. The only downside to the Angler's Water Striders is that the water walking ability is cancelled when the player gets in combat, whereas this was not the case with the original water strider mounts. If players didn't want to use the Angler's Water Strider for whatever reason, there was also a craftable mount equipment item from BFA Blacksmithing called Inflatable Mount Shoes, which also allowed the player to walk on water. So far, these are the only 5 mount equipment items added to the game that can be slotted into the mountain equipment slot. However, since two of these items are both water walking, there are really only 4 effects that mount equipment can give when equipped. Aquatic Mounts, the Sky Golem, and the Mechanized Lumber Extractor are the only mounts where the mount equipment won't take effect. When used, the player will get a warning saying your active mount does not benefit from mount equipment because it already has an ability. And to wrap up this video, here are some suggestions for Blizzard. First, make the mount equipment slot be able to hold all 4 or 5 mount equipment items, and have the player be able to choose which effect is active at a time. Currently, players have to manually switch them out, and this also takes up valuable bag space. Another suggestion is to simply come up with more fun mount equipment abilities. Perhaps an item that auto-taunts all mobs in a certain radius for the player, for example. 
Here's a few things about how mounts used to work in their first forms. Each race got to ride their own racial mount and had to buy special training to ride those mounts. Like dwarves needed to learn ram riding to ride ram mounts, or orcs needing wolf riding to ride wolves. You could then purchase riding of other racial mounts if you managed to get exalted reputations with those other races in patch 1.2. The original levels for mounts were level 40 for the 60% mount and level 60 for the epic mounts or the 100% speed mounts. When you bought a mount, you could use it as long as you were high enough level, and you used the mount from your bags. Mounts required a 3 second cast time to mount up, and dismounted you if you entered combat or touched water. Also, the mounts themselves were expensive. Being able to actually buy the mounts at level, if it was your first character and not an alt, was pretty rare. The level 40 60% speed mount costed 100 gold, and the level 60, 100% speed mount, costed a thousand gold. To adjust for inflation, getting 1,000 gold in vanilla WoW was almost like farming 500,000 gold in Legion, if you were to compare the amount of time and effort it took to get that much gold to today. It was pretty common for people to just not be able to afford one. In patch 1.4, Blizzard released the epic armor versions of the mounts we have today as the level 60 mounts for each race. It used to be that the 100% speed mounts looked exactly the same as the 60% speed mounts, only with different color variations. With this patch, those color variations were removed from the game, making those different color mounts extremely rare, as this was still pretty early on in Vanilla WoW, and most people couldn't afford one yet. And to make them even more rare, Blizzard added an option to trade in one of your old color variation mounts for one of the newer armored ones. Most people can play WoW for years and never run across one of these alt color variations. I should also probably mention Warlock and Paladin mounts before I move on from this time period. Warlock and Pallies technically got a, quote, free mount at level 40, and Pallies again at 60, except for the fact that each mount required very long questions to complete, with some of them requiring you to pay a ton of gold anyway for special items for those quests. Then towards the very end of Vanilla WoW, Blizzard made some big changes to mounts. First, they added the secondary profession of riding that we have today, and got rid of learning how to ride specific mounts. So at level 40, you could learn a riding skill of 75 to ride 60% speed mounts, and then at level 60, you could learn up to level 150 skill, to ride 100% speed mounts. The cost of learning these two skills was about 80 gold for the 60% mounts and around 900 gold for the epic mounts. But the cost of mounts themselves were significantly reduced. 60% mounts only cost 20 gold each instead of 100. And 100% speed mounts only cost 100 gold each instead of 1,000. This meant people could realistically actually buy more than one epic mount. Of course, these changes were made to ready the playing field for when flying mounts were added. In the Burning Crusade, WoW's first expansion, flying mounts were added to the game, but with the limit of only being usable in Outlands. Flying mounts could be learned at level 70, but cost 900 gold to learn, and the basic flying mounts went for 100 gold on top of that. Also, the original flying mounts at this first level only went at 60% movement speed, and were very slow. But of course, everyone saved up to get one as soon as they could because even at such a slow flying speed, flying over things was still faster than traveling by land. And you also didn't have to worry about being dismounted by combat, or getting ganked on PvP servers. If you wanted epic flying mounts, or the 280% speed mounts, you were going to have to pay 5,000 gold for the training, and another 200 gold for the basic epic flying mount. 5,000 gold in TBC was pretty much the same as 1,000 gold in Vanilla WoW, if you account for inflation. So it was hard to get, and many people saved up for months to afford it. But it was totally worth it. 280% flying was a tiny bit faster than 60%. I should probably also mention, in this time mounts still only had one speed to them. If you bought a 60% flying mount, it could only ever fly at 60% speed, even if you had 280 speed training. 
Same with ground mounts and their speeds. Of course, if you were a PvPer and reached the Gladiator rank in arenas, part of your rewards was an exclusive 280% speed flying mount, and a free skill up to ride that mount. So really good PvPers didn't have to pay 5,000 gold to ride epic flying mounts. Which was probably a pretty good incentive to get people to actually PvP. A problem WoW currently has where arena participation is at an all-time low. Also with the Burning Crusade, Blizzard introduced the first ever profession mounts, with the two flying machines engineers could make. But only engineers could use these mounts, so obviously, many people took engineering just to use them. Even if engineering wasn't one of the greatest professions to have at the time. You really shouldn't underestimate just how much people really love mounts. Ground mounts also saw some adjustments. The 60% ground mounts were changed to be learned at level 30 instead of 40. The training cost was reduced to 35 gold, making it a lot more noob friendly to actually have a mount while leveling up for the first time. And the 100% speed mounts were changed to only cost 600 gold instead of 900 to learn the riding skill. It's still kinda expensive. In Wrath of the Lich King, Blizzard added the first of many to come restrictions to flying in New Worlds. In order to prevent people from flying around Northrend, they added the clause of needing cold weather flying to fly in Northrend, which cost 1,000 gold to learn at 77. The reason it was learned at a lower than max level is because the last two zones you could level in, Ice Crown and Storm Peaks, were designed with flying in mind. Hell, one of the main quest hubs in Ice Crown is your faction's flying ship that is constantly in the air. Blizzard also added 310 flying speed mounts in this expansion, only with the twist of there being no way to actually train to use it. Only special mounts from hard to get rating and PvP achievements had the 310% movement speed, so the only way to fly at the fastest possible speed was to be a hardcore raider, PvPer, or to wait a year. Because this is also the expansion Blizzard added achievements, and with achievements, the holiday meta achievement of what a long strange trip it's been, which required you to complete pretty much all of the holiday achievements of every single major holiday event in game, which in the end awarded a 310 flying speed mount. And this mount is how most of the player base actually managed to get 310 flying. Just like in TBC, Blizzard made some changes to ground mounts again. This time, the changes were a lot bigger, and are pretty much still how mounts function today. Mounts were changed to only require a 1.5 second cast time, instead of 3 seconds, cutting the mount cast time in half. 60% speed mounts could be learned at level 20, and only for 4 gold. That's a huge discount compared to the old vanilla version of level 40 and 100 gold. The 100% speed mounts were lowered to be learned at level 40 and only cost 50 gold to learn. The basic flying mount was changed to be learned at level 60. Its base movement speed was increased to 150% movement speed because 60% was kinda stupid for a flying mount and its cost was reduced to 250 gold, down from 900. With this change, players could actually fly the whole time they quested through Outlands now assuming they had the gold to afford the flying. And they also added a Tome of Cold Weather Flight, which was an heirloom that could be bought by max level players to teach an alt how to fly in Northrend, allowing players to fly the whole time they could quest in Northrend, instead of just the tail end of it. On an alt, anyway. Wrath of the Lich King was the mount-friendly expansion, paving way for all of the conveniences we enjoy today when it comes to mounts. This expansion is also when the mount tab was added, so you no longer had to carry around mounts in your bags to use them. Also, side note, the patch most of these changes went live, patch 3.2, is also when I started playing the game. I remember downloading the game and messing around in my torrent hunter, logging off and going to school, only to come back and see that I had to download this thing called a patch if I wanted to play. I thought maybe something had gone wrong and they were trying to fix my game, since I had just installed it. And I remember reading through the patch notes and seeing the mount changes and thinking, wow, that's neat. I'm glad I started playing now because I can get a mount when I hit level 20. Also, also side note, mammoth mounts introduced in this expansion actually had their own health pools, 
and you could jump from high places and they would just take the fall damage for you and die, as well as allowing players to carry around other people on their mountains for the first time. Anyways, back to the main video topic. Wrath was also when the very first ever store mount was added to the game, the Celestial Steed. Now, store mounts are a pretty accepted part of the game nowadays, and most people don't really bat an eye at them when a new one is announced. But this mount was different. You see, this mount actually provided a tiny in-game advantage. It used to be that all mounts were character-specific and not account-wide. If you got an awesome mount from an achievement on your main, you couldn't use it on your alt, even if you had the correct level of writing and etc. But the sparkly pony would be mailed to every single character you had, including all future characters you might make. I still have the sparkle pony in the bags of some of my alts that I made back then that never hit level 20 to use it. And what this meant was that you only needed to pay the 4 gold for training to be able to use a mount, instead of also having to have, like, 20 gold to buy your first mount. Not only that, but the Sparkle Pony was the only mount in game to also scale with your riding training. It would go at 60% speed at level 20, 100% speed at level 40, 150% speed and be able to fly at level 60, and so on and so on. All other mounts only had one mode of speed, and that's it. So with all of these advantages over regular mounts, people were outraged at WoW going paid to win, and the Sparkle Pony ended up doing... extremely well. Tons of people bought one. In fact, you had to wait an hour-long queues on Blizzard's store if you wanted a chance at getting one. I, of course, bought one too because of all the advantages I listed earlier. It was a very convenient mount to have, and it looked cool. The mount was so popular that if you ran a BG at low levels, chances are half the team on both sides would be riding the Sparko Pony. If you went to a low level questing area, half the players there would be running around on Sparko Ponies. It was such a popular mount that Blizzard even made fun of it in their famous quests into the machine, where they have a character named Johnny Awesome who's decked out in heirlooms and rides around on a Sparko Pony because that was the stereotypical hardcore WoW player's alt. Full heirlooms in a Celestial Steed. Since the Celestial Steed was such a success, Blizzard eventually turned a lot of the things that made the mount such a good seller into other mounts as well. But we'll talk about those things a little bit later. In Cataclysm, with the revamp of the old world, flying mounts no longer had the distinction of only usable in Outlands and Northrend and instead didn't say anything. There were still some no-flying zones, but with flying enabled in Azeroth, there was no real need to make the distinction. It was just easier for a zone to tell you you couldn't fly there. Old World zone flying could be bought right away and learned at level 60, which is the last time Blizzard allowed players to fly right off the bat in a new expansion in the new areas. Mounts were also changed to scale with your riding level. So no longer was a Celestial Steed the only mountain game who could do that. And also, Blizzard allowed players to train in 310 flying speed, which, of course, allowed you to ride whatever mount you wanted at the highest speed, instead of only the handful that could previously. If you managed to get 310 flying before the change, you got the skill up for free, instead of paying 5,000 gold for it. And Cold Weather flying was changed to be learned at the trainer at level 68 instead of needing to buy an heirloom tome, and its cost was cut in half to 500 gold, which just made questing through Wrath a little easier. Cataclysm is also in the first flying two-seater craftable mount was added to the game in the form of the Sandstone Drake. Before this, the only way to get a flying two-seater was through recruiter friend promotions. The Sandstone Drake was pretty darn expensive, as a lot of its mats could only be bought from special vendors that sold them for tens of thousands of gold. But it was still a more convenient way of flying a friend around than having to deal with a recruiter friend. In Mist of Pandaria, Blizzard started to not really like flying mounts as much as they used to. So they made it so that you couldn't fly in Pandaria until max level. And even today, as of making this video in Legion, is still the case. Pandaria is one of the slowest zones to level through, as the only way to get flying early 
is to buy a stupid book from the black market auction house that will allow you to learn the flying at level 85. They also added a special flying skill to be able to fly cloud serpents, which they eventually just gave to everyone for free since it was a kind of dumb restriction. Mist is also when mounts were finally made account bound, and with this change, in-game store mounts no longer had any advantage over normal mounts, other than looking a lot cooler. In Warlords of Draenor, Blizzard was really happy about restricting flying, and thought to themselves, you know what, how about no flying at all in Draenor? To which everyone else replied, um, how about we do fly? Pretty much every discussion thread on the WoW's forums that talked about flying in Draenor would cap out. People really wanted to be able to fly in the new expansion, like they could in all other expansions. But that's not to say all of the discussion was one-sided. A lot of the people didn't want flying at all in Draenor, but these were mainly world PvPers who loved to gank people so no one cared about them, and Blizzard eventually added a way to get flying in Draenor, a few patches into the game with a Pathfinder achievement. This achievement was a very long, hard to accomplish list of tasks that basically proved you'd already explored and did everything in the zone and deserved flying. And people kinda liked it. Once you got the achievement once, you unlocked flying on all of your characters and alts forever. Which meant you didn't have to spend money on zone specific flying for each new alt you leveled up. And since there was such a positive reaction to the pathfinding achievement, Blizzard did the same thing for Legion and didn't allow flying on the Broken Isles until you complete the Mega Achievement, which couldn't actually be completed until a few patches in when the Broken Shore content unlocked. Which was basically a half measure on Blizzard's part. They wanted people to actually explore their new zones they spent a lot of time on instead of people just flying over it, while at the same time, eventually, allowing people to fly over it. Except Argus, you can't fly there ever. Of course, the new system is not perfect. It's kind of a deterrent to players returning to the game after long breaks, or to new players, and will be a pain in the ass to get in future expansions, where you'd much rather just want to pay to unlock flying, rather than having to do literally every single quest in the zones, plus all the other tedious shit you need to do to unlock flying just because you didn't play during that expansion. Now, let me go back a little bit and talk about a few things I may have skipped over. In Warlords is when Blizzard made it so a lot of flying mounts could be used as ground mounts as well, in no-fly zones. Cold weather flying was also changed to only cost 50 gold to learn at level 68, and be given to a player for free once they hit level 80, if they hadn't bought it already before then. Warlords of Draenor is also when the very first, and only, level 1 mounts were added to the game, the heirloom motorcycles. Well actually I guess I should say the first mount that could be used at level 1 that functioned like a normal mount. Technically the sea turtles came first and also could be used at level 1 but they didn't increase your ground speed so mounting one was the same as just running at normal speed. They did increase your swim speed though the motorcycles are some of the few mounts to not scale with your riding training, and only ever go at 60% movement speed. But they do have a few advantages over normal mounts. For one, you can use it without training, so it's usable at level 1, giving players a much faster questing experience than ever before. And two, you can't be dismounted from a daze on this mount, so it's actually useful for running through packs of mobs at higher levels if you don't mind the slower speed. In Legion is when Blizzard changed swimming mounts to actually swim faster than 100% movement speed. They used to be pathetically slow, and now are only less, so they should really increase it way more than it is now, but I guess it's better than the slow speed it used to be before they finally increased it a little bit in Legion. In this video, we'll go over 10 types of mounts that have special abilities in addition to their normal run speed increases. And at number 10, we'll start off with the underwater mounts. These mounts are useful in the rare situations in which you need to swim underwater for something, which does come up every now and then, and underwater mounts will give you 135% movement speed while underwater. Without any speed modifiers, you move at 67% movement speed while swimming. So underwater mounts will only make you move 35% faster than normal running, 
which is absolutely worth using if you need to move anywhere underwater. And for comparison, a druid seal form is also 135% movement speed, and the artifact fishing pole, which turns you into a shark instantly, gives you 169% movement speed, making the artifact fishing pole the fastest way to navigate underwater. Outside of Ashir, of course, where there is a zone-specific mount that allows you to move at 371% movement speed while underwater. Now, since faster movement speed underwater isn't the most useful thing in the world, there aren't too many underwater mounts. So, here's a quick list of all of the available underwater mounts. Just a note, most underwater mounts have something to do with fishing, either fish directly or obtained through fishing. And there's very few exceptions to this. And at number 9, we have the Sea Turtles. These two mounts are also technically underwater mounts, but what sets them apart from purely underwater mounts is that you can use these mounts on land as well. Although with this small little restriction, that they do not increase your movement speed on land. They give you the swim speed increase to 135% while underwater, and then when you get on land, you just have normal, unmounted, 100% movement speed. But it doesn't dismount you, like the underwater mounts do when you leave the water. What this means is that with the turtle mounts, you can swim to the surface of the water without being dismounted, or jump down waterfalls or other bodies of water where you have to leave the water occasionally without having to remount each time. Originally, the Riding Turtle was only available through a Warcraft TCG code, but they added it to the loot table of Murlocs in the fishing hut of the garrison, adding an alternative, in-game way of obtaining the mount. And the blue version of the Sea Turtle could be obtained by simply fishing in Northrend. One more thing to note about the Sea Turtles, you can mount on them at level 1, making them one of the few mounts usable before level 20. Although I'm pretty sure that's just the case for all underwater mounts. And at number 8, we have the multi-person mounts. These mounts allow one or two extra people to hop on your mounts and allow you to jump off cliffs and kill them, or used to fly low-level players who don't have flying yet to places, and any other multiple uses in which carrying someone around might be useful. Now, let's go over a few of the multi-person mounts. First, we have the two-person flying mounts. There is the X-53 Touring Rocket and the Obsidian Nightwing, obtained as choices through Recruit a Friend. The 2017 BlizzCon Virtual Ticket mounts, of which Horde and Alliance got their own respective airships, and then the most common one being the Sandstone Drake, which is crafted by Alchemists and sold on the auction house. Next up we have the two-person ground mounts, of which it's basically just the motorcycles, one for each faction, crafted by engineers using Northrend materials. I remember back in Cataclysm, when Goblins first came out as a playable race, they got a discount for the motorcycle parts you bought from a vendor, whereas no one else got a discount because there was no reputation associated with that vendor. So it was a very lucrative mount to sell if you had a goblin race engineer. And then we have the three-person mounts, which include the Grand Black War Mammoth, which is a drop from bosses in VOA, and the Grand Ice Mammoth, which is purchased with gold from Sons of Hodir Rep in Northrend. Now, you may have noticed a few multi-person mounts missing from this spot, and that's because they'll be coming up in a little bit because they also do something else. And at number 7, we have the Hive Mind. This is a unique mount in that it's the only mount in the game with a special ability to hold 5 people, and they can go faster than other mounts based on the amount of people riding inside of it. And to top it all off, it's also a flying mount that allows passengers inside to urban mine without having to dismount from it. Now, this mount might seem like the best mount in the game if it's able to do all of these things, hold the five people, potentially go faster than all other mounts, and allow your passengers to urban mine, but there is a catch to this. See, the mount has two parts to it for actually obtaining it that go into its restrictions. First is to collect four monocles, one per person, with a fifth person getting a free pass. Then, after that, they must gather in Surumar, meth with some withered, and then enter the Court of Stars and spend about half an hour in there solving puzzles. At that point, you will be awarded the mount. But you also become attuned to each other, meaning those five people can only ride each other's hive minds. Which means you can't just have any five people in your party ride with you. Literally, only the people you completed the attunement with can hop into your hive mind. But, 
you can attune new people to it. You just need to run that last part of the puzzle all over again with the four other people you want to attune to your mount. So unless you hang out with those four other friends all the time, it would be rare for you to get the maximum use out of this mount very often. And at number six, we have the Traveler's Tundra Mammoth. Now, this is a three-person mount, just like the ones from the number eight spot on this list. The difference with this one is that it has two NPCs already in the side passenger compartments. One of the NPCs is a basic vendor who sold crafting items, food, water, selective reagents, and ammo before they removed those two things from the game. And the other one could repair your gear and sell different types of crafting reagents, allowing you to buy basic things without having to run to town as well as repairing without having to visit a repair vendor, or relying on an engineer to have a scrap bot or jeeps. These two NPCs can also be kicked off at any moment to allow space for other people to hop on, and turn it into a normal multi-person mount. With a price tag of 20,000 gold, it's not too difficult to obtain today, as you can just go to the mount vendor and either dollar in and purchase it. But when this mount was first added to the game at the start of Wrath of the Lich King, this 20,000 gold price was actually quite high, and was basically their gold sink for that expansion, which could be reduced to 16,000 gold with Exalted Kirin Tor rep. This should go to show you how much gold has inflated, where a 20,000 gold mount was considered something you'd save up for, for a while. And that not many people had, as those two vendors were a brand new thing to the game, and the reagent vendor was incredibly useful. Even in Cataclysm, when they started removing reagents from spells, they added dust to it instead, which allowed you to change out your glyphs. So it was still pretty useful. And at number 5, we have the Grand Expedition Yak. This mount was added in Mist of Pandaria, and had two people riding in it just like the Traveler's Tundra Mammoth, except it had a reforger on it in addition to the repair vendor. Reforging was a thing that only existed for two expansions, that allowed you to convert 40% of one of your secondary stats on your gear into any other secondary stat you wanted. And with things like hit and expertise still in the game, reforging your gear to hit the perfect cap was all but necessary for endgame content, as any stats above the hit cap were wasted. So there were add-ons in the game that reforge all of your gear to give you the perfect hit chance, and then reforge everything else into whatever your second best secondary stat was. It was incredibly complicated to reforge your gear into hit on your own without an add-on. And because of this, every time you got a new piece of gear, you had to run back to town, go to the reforger, and then reforge all of your gear to hit that magical hit cap number again. So having a mount with a reforger on it was almost necessary in any raid group. Everyone had at least one person with a reforge jack in their group, with some raids even pulling together to buy the mount for the raid leader, just so they'd have a reforger during raids. As this mount was also the gold sink of that expansion, as it cost 120,000 gold to buy, which is still a pretty steep price. Kind of. I know a lot of people who don't own this yak even today. During the very next expansion in Warlords of Draenor, Blizzard removed reforging from the game, and with removing reforging, they got rid of the reforge NPC on this mount, and instead replaced it with the Transmogrifier NPC, because Transmog was added in Mist of Pandaria. So with the mount being converted into a Transmog mount, it was no longer necessary for raiding, but lots of people liked this change anyway, as Transmog was a very popular addition to the game. The Repair NPC on this mount also sells a few updated things that aren't on the Traveler's Tundra Mammoth, including Enchanting Vellums, which I use for my enchanting profession. So it's a really useful mount for me. And at number four, we have the Mighty Caravan Brutasaur. Just like with the Traveler's Tundra Mammoth and the Grand Expedition Yak, this mount was added as a gold sink for BFA, and costs a whopping 5 million gold to purchase, making it by far the most expensive mount in the game, with the next most expensive mount being 2 million gold, which also makes it the most expensive item in the game to purchase. That makes this mount, with the current gold prices based on North American WoW tokens, cost almost $1,000 to purchase. Now, what makes this mount unique over the others is that instead of a transmogrifier, it holds an auction house NPC on its back, allowing for players to buy or sell stuff from the auction house anywhere, instead of just in major cities. Auction house NPCs are one of the few city NPCs that Blizzard held out on making convenient for the longest time, 
as they don't even add new auctioneers to new expansions' major cities, and you had to be an engineer to use special auction houses in those cities. So for them to add one to a mount means they would have had to charge a buttload of money for it, which they do. You can also kick off the two vendors on this mount in order to turn it into a multi-person mount, just like with the Mammoth or the Yak. Seeing as the other two gold sink mounts are nowhere near as difficult to buy today as they were when they first came out, that makes you wonder if in two expansions from now, 5 million gold might be seen as an easy one-time expense, like 20k gold is today. Because I personally sold battle pets in BFA for more gold than what the Yak is worth. And at number 3, we have the two heirloom mounts, the Alliance Chauffeured Mecha Engineer's Chopper, and the Horde Chauffeured Mecha Hog. These two mounts have the special ability of being usable at level 1, with no riding skill, and unlike the turtles, actually increase your movement speed by 60%, which is the exact same movement speed increase as the mounts you get at level 20. So with these mounts, you basically have a normal mount for the first 20 levels, as long as you don't mind only being able to use this one mount though. I say two mounts, but they're actually just faction specific, one for Horde and one for the Alliance. The way to obtain this mount is from the achievement you get for collecting 35 heirlooms, which is appropriate since this is a mount you use for brand new characters, and heirlooms are used for brand new characters, they go hand in hand. And the mount is also unique in how you ride it. Basically, you're driven around by a rather fancy dressed human or orc, with the orc even wearing a nice top hat. Although, even though you aren't in the driver's seat, you do still control the mount. And because of this unique distinction, this mount has another special ability, in that it's the only mount in the game which doesn't dismount your character if you're dazed from behind. So, some people will use this mount if they want to run through packs of mobs, or even for island expeditions if they want to gather up a whole bunch of mobs for a big AoE pool, even though it's slower than the 100% ground speed mounts because of its special ability, making the heirloom mount one of the most useful mounts in the game, but not the most useful, as we still have two other mounts on this list. Number 2, the Sky Golem Mounts. These are two flying mounts that have the unique special effect of allowing you to gather herbs without dismounting. The Sky Golem is crafted with engineering, requiring 30 days of crafting cooldowns in order to make it with your engineer, or you can just buy one off the auction house since they are sellable. But there's also the mechanized lumber extractor, which is a mount awarded with getting the collect 300 toys achievement. They both look basically the same, and they both have the urban special ability. Being able to gather without having to dismount saves a lot of time, and allows you to gather more herbs in the same amount of time, making it almost a necessary part of any herb collector that's not a druid as druids can herbal on their travel form, which goes just as fast as mounts, so they don't need this mount. But for all other classes, this mount is amazing for those large herb-gathering binges you do while watching Netflix or something. And at number one, we have the Water Strider Duo. The Water Striders allow you to walk over water as long as you're not in combat, making this the most useful ground mount in the game seeing as just how much water and small pools there are around Zandalar and Kulturas. Same with the Broken Isles. There's just small pools of water everywhere. The mounts are also low in stature, so they don't have to worry about getting stuck in houses or under low-hanging overpasses. So the mounts are an incredibly convenient size, and have this incredibly convenient special ability. The Water Strider mounts are so useful that some people who only care about optimizing their gameplay never use any other mount when going out into the world and doing world quests. The Azure Water Strider is earned from Angler Rep in Pandaria, and the Crimson from Nat Pagel in your Draenor Garrison. Angler Rep can be obtained very easily during Pandaria Time Walking Week, as you can just turn in Time Walking Tokens for Angler Rep. Otherwise, you're just going to have to do dailies to farm out the rep for the mount. Whereas the Crimson Water Strider can be done with lots of grinding or fishing, or Murloc Raids the same ones used to get the Riding Turtle. So unless you're a Shaman or a Death Knight, who are the only two classes that have convenient water walking abilities, a Water Strider mount is almost a must-have. And at number zero, as kind of a bonus spot, I thought I would bring this up even though it's not technically a mount, the Angler's Fishing Raft is a toy that allows the user to water walk, 
It moves slowly at first, but if you spam the jump button over and over, it will increase in speed until it caps out at 250% movement speed, which is actually further modified by your normal on land running movement speed. So it can go even higher than that depending on what your speed stat is. With this toy item, you can actually go faster over water than you can on an epic ground mount with 100% increased speed, which is much faster than water striders. You can also fish while on this raft, which you can't do on mounts. There is also the similar item, Bepsi's Bobbing Berg from the Anglers as well, but it's mage only and has yet to be added to the toy collection, wasting a space in your bag. In this video, we'll be going over the rarest, unobtainable mounts in the game's history that were once given to players via events or by gaining special achievements. And at number 10, we have the Obsidian World Breaker. This mount was given to players who completed the achievement Memories of Fell, Frost, and Fire during WoW's 15th anniversary, which made the players go back in time to one of Chromie's memories to do the most memorable mechanics of three beloved bosses from the oldest expansions of Burning Crusade, Wrath of the Lich King, and Cataclysm. The difficulty of obtaining this mount came from requiring a group to be able to do it, or just queuing LFR, aka not very difficult. Blizzard decided to pseudo-buff the bosses and required players to do mechanics. I believe small ones, to kill the three bosses, with Cataclysm being the most difficult for players to complete, due to the bugginess of the Cho'Gall fight and the amount of damage that the overtuned abilities, specifically Flames Orders, were doing. Barely half the players obtained this mount during the time period, possibly because it was during Battle for Azeroth, where a lot of players had quit the game. It is possible to find this mount being sold on the Black Market Auction House, but it's extremely rare. While a few other, no longer obtainable mounts can be found on the Black Market Auction House, this one will be the only one on this list that can still be obtained technically, although rarely, and for an insanely high gold cost. And at number 9, we have the Grove Warden. This mount was obtained during Warlords of Draenor's Hellfire Citadel raid, and it just required the player to kill Archimon on at least heroic difficulty, and upon Archimon's defeat, he would drop an item called the Remnant of Chaos, which led the player to Moonglade and after a short quest, rewarded them the mount, while also hinting at their next expansion. The reason this mount is so rare is because the vast majority of the player base had quit during Warlord's content drought and were sick of running Hellfire Citadel so much, so kind of similar to the previous spot on this list. Plus, it required a minimum of heroic difficulty, which returning players did not have the gear to do, nor the gold to buy a carry, as boosting wasn't as rampant or widespread in those days as it is today, even though it definitely did exist. There were lots of community events held to help returning players get the mount before it went away, but that wasn't really enough to get players to return to the game, so the mount remained somewhat rare because of just how many people did not come back until Legion. And at number 8, we have Tyriel's Charger. This mount was only obtainable during Blizzard's annual pass promotion in 2012. This required them purchasing a 12-month sub, and alongside the mount, the subscriber would also get a free copy of Diablo 3 and guaranteed access to the Pandaria beta. Tyriel's Charger is a reference to the NPC, Tyriel in Diablo, as its wing design is the same as Tyriel's angel wings in said game who is an Archangel of Justice. Although the original name for Teal's Charger was Space Charger and was changed before Patch 4.3 went live, and was probably changed because they thought it was okay to just have Diablo references in the game since they had already existed in the game prior. The reason this mount is so rare is because after the event, it was made no longer available, so it was only available for Asian regions of the game in shop because they never got the annual event. And it cannot be obtained at all in the US or EU accounts anymore. For an extremely short time and only on the PTR during 5.3.2, Tyriel's Charger was available for purchase for EU and US regions, but was quickly removed. Barely one third of the player base managed to obtain this mount before it was removed from the game. Maybe also based on the fact that this came out at the end of Cataclysm, and many players did not like the concept of Pandaria, so few were willing to commit to a year sub for it. And at number 7, we have the Korkron Warwolf. This mount was given to the player if they managed to obtain the Ahead of the Curve Garrosh Hellscream achievement on 10 or 25 man mode, which required the player to defeat Garrosh Hellscream in the Siege of Orgrimmar on any difficulty other than LFR, something that would change to Heroic or Mythic only in the future expansions before the release of the next expansion's pre-patch. Similar to the Grove Warden mentioned earlier, with this being the first Ahead of the Curve achievement to be given a mount, being something they would do from then on with all the final raids of the expansions, the reason this mount was so rare was because of Mr. Pandaria's content drought during Siege of Orgrimmar and players quitting the game. There seems to be a pattern with this. Only to then come back to obtain this mount before removal and finding out that they didn't have the gear to do it or gold to buy a carry. This is one of the few wolf mounts that Alliance players were able to obtain too, 
and less than one-fifth of the player base managed to actually complete the achievement. And in number six, we have the Brawler's Guild mounts. The Brawler Guild's mounts, Burly, Mushan Beast, and Burly Massless, were available to purchase with gold if you reached a special rank in the Brawler's Guild when it was active. In the Brawler's Guild, the player would go against stronger and stronger opponents with varying gimmicks and mechanics to defeat them, slowly climbing in ranks along the way for each one defeated, as each fight was akin to a solo raid boss fight. The first added was the Burly Mushan Beast in Patch 5.3. If the player reached rank 10 in the Brawler's Guild before the guild closed down in Legion, they were able to buy this mount for 4,000 gold. This mount is very similar to the Son of Galleon mount, obtainable from either the world boss Galleon in the Valley of Four Winds in Mist of Pandaria, or very rarely on the Black Market Auction House, or the Ashhide Mushan, which is obtained by doing free-for-all world PvP in the Timeless Isle under the Sensor of Eternal Agony, something that is now almost impossible to earn due to the lack of players there. However, the Mushan Beast's brother, Burly Basilis, is notable due to it being the first ever Basilis mount available to players, having been introduced in patch 7.1.5, and was available for purchase if they reached rank 8 of the Brawler's Guild in Season 3. Both of these mounts have less than one-fifth of the player base owning them, and the Mushan Beast being even lower in ownership, as the first iteration of the Brawler's Guild was probably the most difficult. And at the number 5 spot, we have the Spectral Griffin and Windrider mounts. Blizzard wanted players who've taken a break from the game to come back and start playing again and added a feature to the game called the Scroll of Resurrection, where a player with an active account could send scrolls to their friends who had quit a long time ago. If the person who received a scroll resubscribed to the game, the player who sent the scroll would obtain the choice of either a Spectral Wind Griffin or a Spectral Griffin, and the player who came back would receive a list of rewards as well, like a leveling boost and faction slash realm transfers, along with a bunch of other upgrades to the character. In patch 5.4.7, this system was removed and instead just replaced with the character boosting service in Warlords of Draenor. Only 15% of the player base owns the Spectral Griffin and 14% own the Wind Rider, making these both extremely rare mounts, as it was pretty difficult to obtain if you didn't actually have any friends. And at number 4, we have the Pandaria Challenge Mode mounts. During Mist of Pandaria, there were Challenge Mode dungeons, and these dungeons were timed with bronze, silver, and gold ratings based on how fast you completed them. However, to make them more difficult, it would scale your gear down, although this could be cheesed by stacking gear with tons of sockets, as the gems would not be scaled down. By completing these, you would get unique rewards, including these mounts, in addition to a unique transmog set based on your class, and teleports to the front of the dungeons. Upon attaining the achievement Challenge Conqueror Silver, which only made the player complete all the challenge mode dungeons with a silver rating or better, they obtained the Astral Phoenix Egg in their mailbox. It was then redeemed at Kai Featherfall in the Vale of Eternal Blossoms for the player to choose one single color and only usable on a single character. However, in Patch 6102, the egg was removed from the game, and instead, if the player completed that achievement, all four colors of the mount would be mailed to them instead, and the mounts were then made account-wide. Before this, there were actually people who would complete the Silver Mode achievement on four characters just to get all the color variations, just in case, since they knew it would be a limited time mount. All of these mounts only have a 12% of the player base obtaining them, and according to some World First Raiders who played at the time, the number one way boosters made gold in Mist of Pandaria was selling challenge mode runs because of how many people wanted the mounts in Transmog, as you need to do it 11 times in order to get all the time lock rewards, something they reduced to one time next expansion before right out removing challenge modes after that. And at the third spot, we have the original epic mounts from Vanilla World of Warcraft. If you played during World of Warcraft Classic and managed to obtain an epic mount, you might have noticed that the mounts are different from the ones you get on the live version of the game. You see, the original epic mounts were unarmored. The player was given a choice in patch 1.4 to trade their original epic mounts for a free, new version of the mount, which was armored. If the player declined this choice, they would keep their original epic mount at no cost. However, since this change was made pretty early in vanilla, not a lot of people were max level yet, and even fewer had the gold needed to buy an epic mount. Yet, pair that with the fact that the game was new, and so many people saw these new, much cooler versions of the mounts they had, and didn't think ahead of how unique these unarmored mounts would become. These mounts are some of the most rare mounts in the game, as less than 1% of the player base owns any one of them. And at number 2 on this list, we have the Reigns of the Black Proto Drake. This mount was awarded to players who completed the achievement, Glory of the Raider 25 player which required the player to complete achievements during fights, like killing a boss extremely quickly with a certain number of players, or making the fights more difficult. With the plagued version of the Proto Drake being the 10-man equivalent, 
which is available in the Black Market Auction House, while the black one is not. Both this, and the fact that 10 man was far easier than 25 man, made the black one far more rare. Blizzard was asked during a Q&A during patch 4.03 if they will ever bring this mount back, and Blizzard responded with an indirect way of basically saying they're open to the idea, but no, they don't plan on it. They wanted to keep these mounts extremely rare and not degrade the work of players who did manage to do it by simply adding it back in. Although, with the addition of things being re-added so much, it is possible they might add this in the future, but highly unlikely. Also, before we move on, this was the first time they added meta achievements, as this was the first raid in the first expansion which introduced the achievement system. Because of this, they experimented with them being a limited time thing. However, the player base did not like that, so all future meta achievements kind of became timeless, making this mount the only meta achievement mount to no longer be obtainable in any way. And at the number one spot, we have the Tribute to Immortality mounts, better known as the Crusader mounts. What makes this mount one of the rarest mounts in the game was that it was only obtainable by completing an achievement entitled A Tribute to Immortality, which required a raid group of players to complete the Trial of the Grand Crusader, and without letting anyone die. This meant not only could you make sure you did not wipe at all during the entire raid, you also had to make sure not a single person died during the raid. Since the tribute chest could only be found in heroic difficulty of the raid, it added extra stress onto the group to perform optimally at all times and not have anyone DC. Since you could not reset bosses, and if someone died, it voided the achievement for everyone in the raid group, meaning you had to wait an entire week before you could try again. The idea behind this achievement, according to Blizzard, was to have a badge of justice for the rest of the player's life by completing something that so few players did, as it's listed at being 0% due to the scarcity of this mount. And also because of the random nature of just people's internet connections, they don't really do stuff like this anymore. So, they're easily the most rare and unobtainable mounts in the game. In World of Warcraft's 7th expansion, Battle for Azeroth, it would arrive with a whole new plethora of mounts for collectors to farm. In this video, we're going to go over the hardest to obtain mounts from BFA. This list is determined by what is currently the hardest to farm, however, and can still be obtained through playing through BFA's content. So that means mounts like the Mighty Caravan Brutosaur slash Longboy will not be making this list. BFA also added a lot of mounts of similar nature, so entries on this list may tie in with each other. To start off this list at number 10, we have the Gmod mount added in patch 8.1 for the Battle of Dazarlor raid. This mount would drop from the High Tinker Mechatork encounter upon defeating him in a low drop chance. It can be farmed in all modes with the exception of its boss drop changing upon LFR difficulty. If you were to run the instance on LFR, Mechatork would not drop the mount, but instead Jaina Proudmore, one of the rare and only instances of a rare drop chance completely changing its source based on difficulty. Now, what adds to the rarity of this item outside of just a low drop rate is in order to farm it, should you need help from others, you must all be on the same faction. Battle of Dazar Lore was a raid with a unique flavor of faction war taking place as you progressed through it. It made it where your character's faction would change to the opposite side depending on the bosses in your current faction of the time. This means if you wanted to farm Mechatork, you must be all Horde or all Alliance. Some may also think the Jaina mount of the Glacial Tidestorm is rarer than Gmod, and in terms of effective farming, they'd be right. However, during BFA's runtime, a skip was added for every single player that would take you directly to Jaina Proudmore in Mythic difficulty. Jaina also had a cheese strat where you would simply not kick her cast that would start the next phase and completely negate any difficulty in farming it with just one to two people. Because of this skip, many people have forgotten about Megatorg, and if you needed help on a character to farm him, groups are incredibly scarce. After all, according to data for Azeroth, over a triple of players have the Jaina mount compared to Gmod, earning it a spot above the Glacial Tidestorm. And at number 9 on this list, we have Molly from the world boss, Dune Gorge of Crawlock, added in patch 8.3. At the end of BFA's lifecycle, one of the world bosses since release received an update and now wielded a chance of a new mount upon killing it. The drop rate of Molly wasn't too terrible in comparison to its various world boss counterparts, such as the Shaw of Anger, but held a more unique tag of a 6 week rotation. During BFA, every week upon reset, the current world boss would be removed and rotate to the next set of 6. This means if you had just missed Dune Gorger, you would then have to wait another 6 weeks for him to reappear and be eligible just at an attempt of getting the mount. Dune Gorger is also a level 50 world boss, meaning you can't always throw the forgotten BFA alt character at it and hope for the best, but typically only a few levels higher could do the job. Depending on your RNG, you could be stuck in this world boss for months, if not years, but with a relatively forgiving drop rate, the most waiting you'll be doing is on the rotation. For number 8, we have the Obsidian Crawless mount, added at the beginning of BFA as a reward for the dungeon meta achievement. Since Wrath of the Lich King, Blizzard has added a meta achievement to each expansion that requires you to complete every boss on its highest difficulty in a special way, 
with the exception of Mythic Plus. BFA was no different to this edition and came with the Obsidian Crawless mount. Generally, these mounts require multiple players in order to complete, and the Obsidian Crawless follows as rule in some scenarios, so already the ease of soloing and obtaining the mount within a few days or less is gone, and you're required to find someone else in search of the same achievement as yourself. BFA came with 10 new dungeons, excluding the Mega Dungeon, so you need to journey into each one on Mythic Difficulty and complete all 27 achievements. These achievements can range from things as simple as not getting hit by the boss's mechanics, as seen in Ready for Rating 6, or be as difficult to manage as requiring a profession level to 75 of almost every profession, as seen in Losing My Profession. For number 7 this list, we have the Island Expedition mounts. In BFA, players would be rewarded with the Heart of Azeroth from Magni Bronzebeard, a necklace artifact that would scale infinitely upward in power. The necklace could be upgraded in power by grinding a type of item in BFA content called Azerite Power. This Azerite power could also be farmed from Island Expeditions, a new game mode where players would embark on a random island in Azeroth and slay enemies and harvest Azerite for their faction, empowering their necklace at an unlimited amount. These Island Expeditions had many difficulties, ranging from normal to mythic and even PvP versions where you'd face off against enemy players to see who could collect the total Azerite needed the quickest. Now, every week there was a predetermined three islands you could set out for, and these islands would rotate with the weeks. The islands always had a native race upon them that determined what would 100% spawn the island and guaranteed potential loot from them. Loot in islands was strange in the fact that in order to get certain items, the island would need to have certain creatures on it to make you eligible at just a chance for their loot. For example, if you wanted to farm for the Squawks mount, the island would need to have pirates on it for you to potentially loot Squawks. Sometimes certain items could only spawn on certain islands, and even if they were in rotation, they could happen to be not the native creature. As you progress the islands, though, more creatures showed up ranging from Mogu, Vykroll, Necromancers, all with completely different loot tables from each other. Players could spend upwards of hundreds to thousands of attempts at the same island just for the chance that their creature type would appear. Thankfully, however, in patch 8.3, Blizzard would allow you to exchange Seafarer's Doubloons, a currency obtained from completing any island expedition, for a chest with loot pertaining to creatures from islands. These chests also had their own rotation completely separate from the islands themselves. But should the chest you want have the creatures you need, and with a good chunk of doubloons saved, you could obtain the items you sought rather quickly. So thankfully, with a little bit of RNG and lots of grinding, you could complete the grind in a few weeks or more for the one item that's been eluding you. And at number 6, we have all of the mythic end boss dungeon mounts. For this entry, all of the mounts share a remarkably low drop rate, and require a full clear of the dungeon in order to obtain them creating lengthy runs and many sunken attempts. The only semi-exception to this rule is the Mechagon Peacekeeper, as it drops from HK8 Aerial Oppression Unit, but when the Mecha Dungeon was split into two separate versions, HK would become the end boss of its own version. There would be a total of four Mythic Rare Drop mounts. The Underrot Crag from the Underrot, the Tomb Stalker from King's Rest, Sharkbait from Freehold, and the Mechagon Peacekeeper from Operation Mechagon. Because these mounts could only drop from Mythic Difficulty, this meant that each character could only get one attempt on the four mounts a week instead of the daily attempts from Heroic Difficulty. Fortunately for these mounts, they were still eligible to drop from Mythic Plus, making spamming low keys a very commonly seen phenomenon within the community. Some players have reported hundreds to nearly thousands of attempts on this bundle of mounts. And we would even see the scenario repeat itself in Shadowlands for the Marrowfang mount from the Necrotic Wake dungeon. Ultimately, the time-gating process of farming these mounts and the requirements of many alt characters to attempt at the already low drop chance earns it a spot on this list, just above the previous entries due to there being four. And at number five on this list, we have another tie of mounts. The Junk Keep Drifter, Rusty Mechano Crawler, and the Silent Glider. All of these mounts were added in patch 8.2, Rise of Ajara. Obtaining these mounts was rather simple in farming, but could leave you stuck for months, if not for years for some. See, in patch 8.2, Blizzard added two new zones, Mechagon and Ashtatar. Both of these zones came with them a large plethora of new rares, and some of these rares would drop a mount upon killing them, if you were lucky. Soundless for the Silent Glider, Rust Feather for the Junk Keep Drifter, and the Arachnoid Harvester for the Rusty Crawler. These rares, like most, could only yield loot for you once a day, making the farm a daily effort for collectors. Aside from the already incredibly low drop rate of these mounts, the spawn timer on the rares themselves was incredibly long for the average rare NPC, with some reports as long as 2 to 8 hours long. Players have reported up to hundreds of kills and maybe seen 1 to 3 players looted from them. What makes this especially difficult to grind out is during BFA, many players would non-stop be waiting in the new zones for these rares to spawn, and could realm hop to more effectively farm them with their characters daily. With BFA no longer being the current expansion, these zones have been relatively abandoned by players. 
other than the occasional player continuing to farm these mounts, making realm hopping no longer an effective strategy. Sometimes, however, since the zones are left behind for so long, the rares could have spawned and been up for upwards to hours on servers with low player counts, making many players use alts all across Blizzard servers. Thankfully, there are many discords that announce when these rares are up in their server and will ping users in the discord to let them know when to find it and join their group for an attempt, but the numbers of these groups are still relatively slim. And at number 4, we have the Snapback Shuttler mount, added in patch 8.2. This mount was added as a meta achievement for completing a large variety of achievements within the new zone's content, Najdatar. Already, the task you've been asked is mountainous in size, and has left players on half-year-long grinds for the crap. In order to receive this mount, you would need to kill every rare in Ashtatar, locate every arcane chest and glowing arcane trunk, shoo away 100 bloodfin tadpoles, find 100 treasures using a grindstone, complete the summon from the depth scenario 10 times, explore all of Najdatar, complete 30 different bounty or requisition daily quests, find all the lost crystal and cat figures spread across Najdatar, and even more than could become a guide video on its own. Alone, just one part of the meta, Aqua Team Murder Force, is a two to three month long grind in getting your followers to Exalted with you. Fortunately for players, this achievement is just incredibly grindy and relatively forgiven in its term of RNG, and can be completed if you really set yourself out for it compared to the other meta achievements. In addition to your new crap mount, not only does it have a diverse look in how it moves sideways, but you will also receive the title of the Deeps upon completion making the achievements grind more worth it to some. And at number 3, we have the Mecha Cycle Module W, otherwise known as the Mecha Dun achievement added in patch 8.2. Following the release of Rise of Ajara, its sister zone, Mechagon, would also be released and come with it a massive amount of new content for players to dive into. This content could originate from crafting your own mounts and special on-use items to your own create trinkets and toys. Every mob in the island was able to drop these crafting materials, and Mechagon was scattered with treasures for players to hunt down. With over 37 new crafting recipes for everyone to get their hands on, and 32 new weeklies, players were eager to get their hands on the new zone's content. In a newer fashion, this zone received its own meta achievement as well as despite not being the main zone of the new patch at the time, and allowed players to grind for two large rewards at the same time. With the Mecha Dun achievement, you would receive the more polished and golden version of the new wheel mount added in 8.2 only one of three in the game at the time of the script. However, this meta achievement has the Najatar meta beat only slightly, not just for the fact less people have this mount compared to the crab, but it is horribly RNG, and could leave players stuck for what feels like an eternity. Almost all of the achievements in the meta require either the correct weekly to appear for you, or an item with a drop rate as low as a 0.5%. It is actually easier to farm the mount from Rust Feather than it is to farm certain vinyls, an item necessary for the meta. Truthfully, if RNG was on your side, you could complete this achievement in a matter of weeks, or you could be thrown into a years-long grind. Thankfully, the achievements are account-wide and can be farmed across multiple characters in an attempt to try to cut the process down as much as possible. And at number 2, we have the Conqueror's Scythe Maul, added the launch of Battle for Azeroth for completing the new meta achievement for War Mode. With the release of BFA, Blizzard would implement a new system to the game that would allow players to toggle world PvP at any time they wish, so as long as they were in their faction's capital city. With this, the original PvP servers with PvP toggled constantly were disabled, but it allowed players who did not play in these servers to experience world PvP and its wonders at any point if they so desired to. When enabling war mode, you would then be flagged as unfriendly to anyone of the opposite faction, making you killable by even max levels as you journey the new expansion. As compensation for turning on war mode, your character would then receive a percent buff to their experience and currency rewards gained depending on how much of your faction was currently using war mode. The higher the buff, the less players were using War Mode on your faction. With War Mode came new World PvP options, with examples such as War Supply Crates falling with goodies, and players could brawl over the chest loot, and whoever came up victorious would claim the items within. If a player of your opposite faction reached 10 kills without dying, they would receive a buff that increased their damage, but also marks them on the map for everyone to see, and grants them the Assassin status. If you could manage to kill this player, you could then loot their body and receive extra honor and various other rewards. For the Conqueror's Scythe Maw, it would culminate in all of these systems together into a large meta achievement that requires you to participate in World PvP in the BFA zones for both Horde and Alliance. These achievements would often ask you to obtain 1000 honor in every zone, kill assassins, and loot war supply crates. Sometimes these things must also be done in groups of 2-5 to five players. During BFA's runtime, this achievement was more than doable, especially during content drops throughout the expansion as the patches would incentivize you to visit the zones and players would want to receive the max amount of loot as possible. What makes this achievement so difficult as of Dragonflight is these zones have been mostly abandoned by players, 
other than the occasional leveler or collector heading into farm dungeons. The grind to obtain 1000 honor during current was already costly, but with maybe only a few players an hour, the task can become greatly extended. This especially shows when the meta achievement asks players to kill at least 10 assassins and loot their bounties. With the inclusion of this achievement, this makes it almost completely required for a group of friends to aid you in getting them out for your collection, as without it, you may never see an assassin in the zone you're currently farming, if ever. The general strategy would be to ask your friend to let you kill their character over and over and farm the honor it gives, and when you reach assassin status, they kill you instead and loot your corpse. Not only all that, but the Band of Brothers achievement portion of the meta already asks you to be in a group of 2-5 to five players. Meaning, no matter what, without help from another person, this achievement will never be completed by a solo player. There is some leeway in farming this solo, however. If you're willing to drop extra money in multiple accounts and park the characters' locations where you can farm them repeatedly. You can also join epic battlegrounds, and upon entering, you will see an NPC with a quest text such as Victory in Rentergrass and can be turned into with any zone, rewarding you with a chunk of honor and the game will associate the honor with the zone you're currently in, earning you credit towards the Tour of Duty achievements for the meta. Upon completion of the achievement, not only will you receive the Conqueror Scythe Maw, but the Conqueror of Azeroth title for your character. And finally, at number 1, we have the Nihilatha All-Seer Mount from Nihilatha the Sleeping City, added in patch 8.3. For the final patch of BFA, we would receive the Visions of Nazoth. This patch was set where we would battle against the old gods of the deeps, Nazoth, and journey into his new raid and face against not just him, but his unholy creatures of horror. The general theme of this patch was corruption and resistance temptations. To do this, the player character set into a journey by Rathion, one of the last remaining black dragons, to create a new legendary cloak that will help combat these maddening whispers. This cloak was completely necessary for finishing the new raid, Nihilatha, as without it, on the final two bosses, your character would instantly go mad and be mind controlled thus making you either die quickly to the rest of your raid with the cloaks, or be killed by the boss himself. It wasn't quite like the attunements of old from Classic WoW TBC, but in order to truly finish the raid, you were forced into obtaining this special item from Rathion. So, this prerequisite alone adds extra difficulty in even just entering the raid for an attempt at the Allseer Mount. The questline wasn't account-wide either, and for every character you wish to run through the raid, you would need to repeat the questline in full. At current levels, the quest chain typically can take the casual player 1 to 2 hours at most. Once you venture into the raid itself, however, it must be set to mythic mode only, as it is the only difficulty that yields the mount. At the current time of this script in patch 10.1.7, the bosses of this raid are able to be killed with a geared group of 2 to 3 players, but almost none can be soloed, adding further difficulty to the farm. Not only will you require a geared group of players, but in order to obtain the skip, you cannot bank off of another player's skip route. Since Warlords of Draenor, raid skips have been introduced into WoW, where if you clear the raid enough times, you'd be given the option to jump to the last two bosses of raid after killing the first boss. Nihilatha followed this procedure, but rather than killing the pet ultimate boss around four times, you were required to kill three different bosses of three different sections of the raid four separate times. So, already, you're forced into a four-week grind of every encounter in the raid, should you not loot the Allseer in your first few attempts. With the skip in mind, cloak equipped, and you've reached Nazoth himself to get your mount attempt, there are still mechanics to watch out for, despite BFA ending almost three years ago. Nihilatha's special cloak came with the insanity mechanic, where you could only temporarily resist the whispers of the old god, and by failing mechanics, could cause your sanity to drop down. Should your sanity reach zero, your character would go mad and you'd be mind-controlled instantly, resulting in your character basically being dead. Nazoth has many sanity draining mechanics that could affect even the most geared level 70 character, and puts players into position where a legacy boss requires legitimate coordination and effort to down. Your only safeguard from losing sanity is doing mechanics correctly, and a single on-use button unique to the fight that restores sanity to yourself and those around you. This button has a 20 minute cooldown, so it reiterates failure is permanent in this encounter. It's possible to duel the boss if you have lust and are careful enough, but it's considered legitimately impossible to solo currently. The reason for this is Nazoth will send you to a down phase section of this fight, and you cannot do this mechanic more than once per fight, making it where two people are necessary. There has been an instance where Nazoth was soloed, however, due to a bug with mages. When you complete the down phase of the fight, Nazoth is stunned and vulnerable to damage, and a certain mage managed to use a bug relating to Touch of the Magi, and brings Nazoth to a secret phase by lowering his health to 24%. This alone shows the amount of health Nazoth possesses, even two expansions after his defeat, and how impossible it can be attempted alone without the use of exploits. Even after you achieve all of these victories and defeat the encounter, your chance of receiving the mount is still extremely low, like most mythic raid mounts. Players can spend hours alone preparing to storm the raid, but the last two bosses might not even be defeated, 
wasting lockouts and stinking the community into hundreds of attempts for the Allseer. This is only a quick summary of the fight, its general themes and strategies, and I highly recommend looking up guides and coordinating with the groups on how to defeat this boss for your special squid. Hopefully in the future, Blizzard can revisit this raid and remake how the sanding mechanic works, and allow players to be able to solo the boss to make the grind much simpler. Over the course of Shadowlands and even at its beginning, Blizzard added a lot of mounts, more than any other expansion before it or following it currently. This doesn't even account for the gladiator or vicious PvP mounts during this time as well. During this video, we'd go over some of the hardest to obtain mounts in Shadowlands as of the time of writing this script, Dragonflight 10.1.7. So mounts much harder during their current time to farm might not be here, as the late edition of Flying in Shadowlands, extra levels and gear contributed to these farms. Some entries may also be tied with others as they are incredibly similar in obtaining, and the only thing they don't share are their looks. To start off the list, we have two Paragon mounts, the Fierce Razor Wing and the Barrel Shard Hide mounts, added in patch 9.1. In terms of research required to understand how to farm these mounts, it's pretty straightforward, and all the game would ask of you was to reach Exalted status with the new Deaths as Vance reputation. Since Legion, when you reach Exalted with a reputation, you would reap all of the benefits from Exalted like normal, but the bar would reset and provide an additional grind of rep, usually to 10,000. This system would be called Paragon Reputation. When this bar was completely filled, there would be an emissary in the main reputation hub or whatever reputation you'd finish, and they would offer you a cache of various goods. The loot within these chests would usually be gold, some currency depending on the rep, or even things like pets and mounts. When it comes to the Death's Advanced Reputation, not only would the Paragon system return, but it would bring with it two different mounts in its box. This means not only would you need to ground the reputation completely and earn a Paragon cache, you would need to hope for the already relatively low drop rate of two mounts. It was possible you could loot both mounts at once and on your first box, cutting the grind off entirely, but the odds of that were really low. The way to grind reputation with Death's Advance is through dailies that appear at random NPCs, a single weekly quest, the world boss Morgeth, Covenant Assault, Raid Boss and Signal Domination, and a few rare events in Corthia. It was a simple farm but usually pretty time consuming, and because there were two mounts, players could be stuck in these mounts for months before seeing them in their journals. It earns this on this list for being relatively simple to farm and can be done across multiple characters rather easily, but RNG could hold people back for a long time here. And at number 9, we have the Cryptic Arlid mount, added in patch 8.2. This mount will be obtained from completing the From A to Xerath achievement, a large meta of other achievements in the Xerath Morda zone from Shadowlands. A meta achievement is typically the culmination of multiple achievements put together for one grand reward at the end of it. Many new zones and expansions have these meta grinds, and Xerath Morta supply these once again. In order to get the achievement, you must complete the entire storyline, kill three special rares on hours-long timers, complete the entire Cypher console research, reach Exalted with the new reputation, discover every hidden treasure, kill every rare, and craft either five pets or mounts with a protoform synthesis system. The strategy is relatively easy to follow, but the main grind is both maximizing your Cypher console and earning Exalted. The console's research typically takes a good few weeks due to the research times applied to them and the grind for the cipher currencies themselves in the zone. Thankfully, this set of achievements isn't so much of a long RNG grind, but just a time-consuming but elite guaranteed in a certain time frame if you keep at it every single day. The completion rate of this achievement is also pretty high in regards to entries in this list too, coming in at around 27% of completion rate according to Wowhead. This may seem low, but this comes to thousands of players with a mount if you just did Xerath Morta's content daily when it was current, you may have attained the achievements without even noticing or have come close to it. And at number 8, we have another mixture of mounts, the Death Runner, Prototype Leaper, and the unsuccessful Prototype Fleet Pod. These three mounts were added in patch 9.2 of Shadowlands and were created through a new pseudo-profession system called the Protoform Synthesis. This system would allow you to craft your own mounts and pets when obtaining materials required in the same way you would farm materials for a new chess piece. This includes recipes. In order to unlock the protoform synthesis, you must progress your cipher console in Xerath Mortis by obtaining the new currency, cyphers are the first ones, which you could earn through all means of world content in the zone. The cipher console was mostly just a system that would improve the overall life of completing content in the open world and could either provide things like extra damage or reputation. Typically, upgrading the console could take a few days, as the research timers could be in the 5 days and 18 hours range of waiting, even after obtaining the correct amount of currency to upgrade. Once you had fully upgraded the Sopranian Understanding row, you were eligible to craft mounts. Now, the mounts on this entry are a bit more special than the other 21 mounts the system had to offer, because the rare reagent the system asked for is only obtained in the current raid, Zeppler of the first ones, or at an even lower drop rate, the Paragon Cache. This reagent would have a pretty low drop chance from the boss Lehuvim from all modes, so this meant you can get at least 4 attempts a week on one character. 
The boss may only give you one reagent at a time, and to be eligible to loot the reagent, you must have the protoform synthesis unlocked as well. The problem with this, however, is because raids aren't a weekly lockout, you could spend weeks, if not months, on this process alone, even after you would obtain the recipe and the other required crafting materials. Because the game makes you need the Cypher console research to actually access the synthesis system, it made farming across alts much more tedious and annoying, since it was not account wide. So you could be stuck on this part for a long time, but also done in a minimum of two weeks, as one of the needed materials is given to you in a quest to unlock the synthesis. Upon completion of the same quest on an alt, however, you would not receive the tools of incomprehensible experimentation, making the raid boss farm completely necessary. And at number 7, we have the Bracelet of Salaranga from the achievement Breaking the Chains, added in patch 9.1. This mount would be the meta grind for both the zones Corthia and the Maw, creating a larger criteria to reach it, as most open world meta grinds require just one zone for the reward. This achievement was similar to its Xerath Mortis counterpart, but came before setting the overall tone of farm Shadowlands possessed, even with it arriving on its first patch. What Break the Chains would ask of you was to complete the Corthia campaign, defeat every Tormentor of Torgast, a special rare that spawns in the Maw, explore all of Corthia, complete the Archivist Codex, kill every rare in Corthia, complete four Covenant Assault achievements, collect every Arcus Relic, earn Exalted with Death's Advance, and discover every hidden treasure within Corthia and the Maw. A good chunk of these achievements could be completed on one character within a day or so if you're really committed to it, and got lucky spawns on rares, but the ones that stand out the most are leveling the Archivist Codex to level 6, and completing the four Covenant Assault achievements. The Archivist Codex was a system implemented in patch 9.1 that was meant to allow all the characters a faster method of gearing. The general idea was you'd go around and farm mobs in the daily events of Corthia, and obtain unique items you could turn in for exchange of reputation with the Codex. As you level the Codex, your rewards will increase, and you'll get better alt gear to upgrade on a tier system. It sounds good in practice, but in play, the items you received to upgrade the Codex were incredibly slow in obtaining and created a space where players altogether would just not interact with the system because it took longer to upgrade it to full rather than just do the PvE or PvP endgame content itself to gear. Not only that, but this meta in particular asks you to turn in every single special codex item, totaling it in 20. Meanwhile, while you do that, there are also the Covenant Assaults you have to worry about, and thankfully you only need 4 out of the 9 achievements offered. The easiest to do was Unified Front as it only asks you to complete every Covenant specific assault on the Maw, rather than anything special, but the other three could be left up to you. These Covenant assaults were a bi-weekly event, and it meant you could do two a week, but the quests offered to complete these achievements could be completed varying depending on the randomness of the next Covenant assault, an effort that could take just a few weeks, and could also just become a few months, and all you're left to do is just wait. And at number 6, we have yet another mixed amounts coming from the Necro Ray Eggs. These mounts were all added in the beginning of Shadowlands as a reward for completing calling quests for Maldraxxus. Callings in Shadowlands were the replacement of Emissaries from BFA, and would be completely optional in terms of completing them, but offered great rewards for cosmetic collectors. These callings were on a daily rotation, and should a Maldraxxon one show up on the table, you would complete whatever the criteria it asked, and then turn it in for your rewards. These quests would usually just ask you to go kill a few rares, do world quests, or just complete activities in a certain zone. What made farming these eggs tedious was because of the rotation of four different zones completely at random. You can go a few days without a single Maldraxxus calling showing up on the table. Once it finally would show up and you did what it asked, you would receive a chest of either blue or purple quality. Neither would increase nor decrease your chance of getting the egg, and upon open it, it would have a small chance of giving you an egg. This egg would hatch after three days and give you a variation of one of the three Necroray eggs. This means that even if you were getting an egg finally on its low drop rate, you would need to do it another two times to receive the other two and continue the grind for as long as it may take you. Players could spend hundreds of attempts on these eggs and never know if the results would be worth it because of the long waiting game Blizzard made you play to collect them. Though, with some luck, like most mounts, you could be done with the grind in only a few attempts, but the majority of collectors are left stumped on this portion of a Shadowlands mounts for quite some time. And at number 5, we have the Maw Sworn Soul Hunter, added on the release of Shadowlands from the Maw. This mount would drop from a rare in the Maw called the Gord Shadehound in the Beastworn's location of the Maw. The rare spawns with an event called Hunt Shadehounds, which was a rotating event on a 5 day and 18 hour timer. There were 4 in total and they would all rotate on a set time in the same order each time. In particular, the Shadehound Hunt was what made the game not only eligible for the rare to potentially spawn, but have a chance at its low drop rate mount. When he spawns, you'll be prompted to kill about 6 packs of trash, and then the Gord Shadehound themselves are able to be attacked and killed for an attempt at the mount. At 50%, the rare runs further away into the cave you fight them in, however. The only issue with this is on some servers, the NPC has a strange bug that will make it get completely stuck in the terrain and become unable to be killed as it will evade all of your attacks and eventually just despawn, as no one's attacking it. 
ruining your attempt on that character. Back in Shadowlands, it was slightly easier to farm than it is today, as more people were in the zone and realm hopping around, which was just joining a group of different servers who were in the same zone to phase you and see what they saw. With less and less people in the mall, realm hopping is pretty much impossible now, and you are left to as many characters as you have in order to grind out this mount. With its unique spawn requirements on rotation, it also can only be killed once on that character every 3.5 days, and then is unable to be farmed for 10.5 days due to other hunts taking its place. If you were farming the rare on just a single character, this means you would only get 26 attempts a year per character for a roughly 1-2% drop chance mount. If you multiply this by the amount of characters you're able to get to the mall at the maximum of 60, you will reach 1,560 attempts a year, and hopefully by then you would have gotten it. But they don't call the mall the hell of wow for nothing. And number four on this list, we have the Marrowfang mount added on release to Shadowlands and can be obtained from the last boss of the Necrotic Wake on Mythic Difficulty. This mount was relatively straightforward in farming and only required you to run the Necrotic Wake dungeon on Mythic Difficulty only and killing the last boss. This means you can get only one kill per week on each character at 60 maximum, if you have that many characters to run through the dungeon. The drop rate is already at 1%, like many other dungeon raid drop mounts, and netting a collection rate of 9% in the player base. When Shadowlands was current, you used to be able to run this dungeon as a keystone, and this would cause high-end collectors to spam low-level keys and carry low-level people to get as many attempts as possible without the annoying need of over half a hundred characters. It made more casual players get to possibly experience something closer to higher end content, as they would very often get carried towards their goals by diehard mount farmers. Some drops during current could sell for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of gold. And at number 3, we have the Armored Chosen Torallis. This mount was added at the beginning of Shadowlands as a reward for completing the Things to Do When You're Dead meta achievement. Shadowlands had the unique system of minigames when it was created, and these progression systems could be upgraded over time with the game's universal currency, Anima, and Redeemed Souls obtained from the Maw. Anima could be rewarded for just about anything, from things as simple as killing an open world rare or slaying raid bosses on any difficulty. For the Necrolord specifically, this minigame would come in the form of the profession-like system where you create your own undead construct with crafting materials. These constructs offered many weekly quests that gave you even more materials to craft more of them and cosmetics to dress them as you enjoyed. The achievement to obtain the mount required you to complete all 31 weekly quests, which were on a completely random rotation each week. You could spend months on this step alone for your mount and not even be as close as you'd like. You also needed to craft every construct, which required level 5 of the Sanctum, which could take you on a grind of its own. After that, you must craft 100 anima bound wraps another item you can craft with the system, and collect 25 of the special cosmetics for your constructs. This achievement is also not account-wide, meaning you cannot potentially get different weeklies across multiple characters and finish the ground just in a few weeks, unfortunately. With a bit of RNG, you could, at minimum, be done in around two months or so. And at number two on our list, we have Vengeance from the Sylvanas Windrunner and Sanctum Domination on Mythic Difficulty for patch 9.1. This mount was added as a final reward for players that would defeat the Sylvanas encounter with the difficulty, and back in Shadowlands, it was a guaranteed 100% drop chance, with 2 per raid of 20 members. With Shadowlands no longer being current content, the twice per raid has been removed and the drop chance is lower to a 1%, like all Mythic mounts before it. Shadowlands is also only one expansion behind Dragonflight, so farming on Mythic has still proved to be difficult at times, especially with less systems to improve player power, and requires multiple players ranging from 10 to 20 at a time. This means in order to effectively farm this mount, you would require the help of others, and it would be difficult in finding a group of decently geared players to aid you at times, and some people are unfamiliar with their mechanics even years after release. Because it was a raid, you could only farm the mount once per week per character on just one difficulty. Since not everyone understands the fight, however, you could spend the entire lockout attempt just to reach Sylvanas herself, and upon arriving, your group might not even be able to kill her. This would result in players in lost lockouts, and making it much more difficult to farm consistently every week for those who missed out during current content. According to data for Azeroth, the mount only has a 2.5% acquisition rate on all WoW accounts, making it not just one of the rarest mounts from Shadowlands, but also one of the most difficult to farm as it requires the help of others, but the lack of how many runs someone could do per week. And finally, at number one on this list, we have Xerath Overseer, from Jailer on Mythic Difficulty from several of the first ones raid added in patch 9.2. For the same reasons that Vengeance was difficult to obtain, so too was the Xerath Overseer, but with much more heightened requirements. Not only was this a tier above SOD, but the Jailer himself had tricky mechanics of line of sight in him and pits players could fall into and die. Many players have the common mindset of just rushing every boss they see on legacy content and just stand and hit the boss until it's dead and collect their loot when the fight is over. 
This rule doesn't always apply very well when the expansion is only one or two years over and can create high wipe counts for uninformed groups. The Jailer had a mechanic where occasionally he could perform a cast called Relentless Domination. This mechanic would mind control anyone within the boss's line of sight unless they were to hide behind player-made pillars from the Rune of Damnation. Players marked with this rune would need to jump into the empty pits of the fight's arena, and when the debuff expired, they would explode and be shot back onto the platform to fight the boss, and a pillar would follow behind them. Players unaware of this mechanic would end up getting mind-controlled almost instantly, and cut the damage required to down the boss almost in half, if not entirely, and cause a quick wipe. So overall, not only would you need a larger group of people to help you in farming this mount, but they would also need to actually have an understanding of how to do the fight for your attempts. World of Warcraft has become infamous for its massive amount of cosmetics. In this list, we're going to be going over the rarest mounts in the entire game. The list, however, will not include unobtainable mounts like Gladiator PvP mounts, TCG, or BlizzCon exclusive type mounts. This list will only be going over mounts you can still obtain and how rare they are in terms of drop chance. Difficulty will also be measured, as a mount added in a new patch will technically be the rarest in the game, but only because it was just released and no one has it. To start us off at number 10, we have the Dark Moon Dirigible mount from the Dark Moon Fair. This mount was added in patch 7.3 of Legion and would cost players 1,000 Dark Moon tickets. The Dark Moon Fair is a monthly event that occurs on the first weekend of every new month and persists for a week, then vanishes until the next month, repeating this all year round. During the time the fair is up, players can complete daily activities and participate in fun, more non-traditional WoW quests. Completing these activities would reward the player with Darkmoon prize tickets, which can be exchanged for many items like heirloom upgrades, cosmetic transmogs, and the Darkmoon dirigible itself. The farm itself isn't very complicated, it only requires you to be attentive at the times of the month and completing each available activity as much as possible on one character, as the tickets are not account-wide. Once you cough up exactly 1,000 total tickets, you can turn them into a vendor named Lahara, and you can learn your mount. The unique thing about this mount, outside of its method of obtaining it, is there are not any mounts that share its look, and is the only real Zeppelin mount outside of the BFA promotional mounts. And at number 9, we have the Liberated Silvered mount. This mount was added in Dragonflight and released from a rare NPC called Breezebiter. This rare typically has a spawn rate of 1-2 to two hours, sometimes more, and when killed can potentially drop the mount it rides. The rate at which this mount drops has been pretty inconsistent even after a year of Dragonflight nearly. This mount still only has a collection rate less than 1% across all WoW accounts, according to data for Azeroth. Players report this mount reaching the hundreds range in terms of attempts, and like most rare NPC drops, depending on your RNG, determines how long a grind can be. The unique thing about this mount, however, is that if it drops, it has the ability to actually be traded to players who killed it with you. This means that if you got a group of friends to farm it with you, or in some old WoW accounts to spare, you could farm it across multiple people for more attempts per kill and just trade them out to the person that needs it next. To further speed this up, you can just not learn the mount as well, helping in being eligible to loot it a second time for a bonus and then trade it before you learned your own, if you wanted to farm it with a group of friends. I did say newer mounts wouldn't really count on this list, but with the collection rate being one of the lowest in the game, contending with other entries further down this list, even after a year of it existing, earns it a spot on this list anyway. And at number 8, we have the Ivory Hawkstrider mount, added in patch 7.1 of Legion. This mount would be a slightly different recolor of the infamous Swift White Hawkstrider mount from Kel'Thas Sunstrider in the Magister's Terrace dungeon. To unlock the vendor that sells you this mount, you must kill the Falcosaur Matriarchs during a Falcosaur Swarm world quest anywhere in the Legion zone. A mob called Orphan Falcosaur will eventually spawn and you can lure it with food. It will then become a battle pet for you, and summoning it will offer you a series of daily quests you must complete that will make it stronger and eventually grow into a mount version you can ride. There are four versions of these mounts, but you only need to unlock one, and once you do so, you will approach Aviana and High Mountain while atop the mount, and she will now have an extra dialogue option for you to click. Doing this will unlock the Talon's Vengeance Reputation NPC, Trinket, next to Aviana. From now on, Trinket will always be available to you and offer you the Ivory Hawkstrider mount at Exalted for 10,000 gold. Basically, to grind out this reputation, you must do a lot of PvP. Trinket will have two unique items called the Ivory Talon and Ivory Feather. And when used, they will enable you to earn Marks of Prey when slain enemy players in PvP. Each mark will offer you 100 reputation with Talon's Vengeance. Doing some math, this roughly translates to 420 killing blows in PvP, not honorable kills. It's worth noting that these marks also work with rep buff bonuses, like the Darkmoon Fair, meaning you can save them until the fair comes around and get more rep and require less kills. This mount was technically a secret mount, as obtaining it requires extra steps that can only be completed through a hidden reputation that is only unlocked through a small series of steps. Because of this, many people do not know this mount actually exists in the game, or understand its method in being obtained, creating an incredibly low completion rate. And at number 7, we have the Soaring Spelltone mount. 
This mount was added in patch 9.1.5 in Shadowlands with the return of the Mage Tower, originally added in Legion 7.2 patch. The Mage Tower was a scenario with the purpose of challenging every limit your class and spec has, and seeing if you have essentially mastered the playstyle of your class. The challenges all depend on your current role and spec, so tanks, no matter the class, all have the same challenge as it was designed for the role of tanking. This also applies for healers. The Mage Tower is available for players 24-7 and can be attempted at any point. Obtaining the Spell Tome requires you complete all seven unique challenges, needing multiple alt characters. Depending on the current expansion scaling, this challenge could be relatively simple for more knowledgeable veteran players. There can also be times when this scaling is considered harder than it was originally in the game, which can create much more difficult experiences for players. Because a very large chunk of players are pretty casual, this mount has an incredibly low collection rate. Even for more learned players, the challenges can still prove difficult because it will need you to learn other classes and how they work in order to complete them. With the most able to be done on the character is a druid because they have four specs. Your class could also just have a harder time to actually do the challenge compared to other classes due to how the scenarios were made. For example, doing the tank snare on a demon hunter is miles easier than doing it on a paladin because one of the biggest threats of the challenge is being knocked off the platform and dying immediately. When a demon hunter can just glide back safely, it removes loads of difficulty away from the challenge and earns them the portion of the achievement much easier. The A Tour of Towers achievement will be given to you once you complete every unique challenge along with the mount, and you will have officially earned bragging rights. And at number 6, we have the Moss Sworn Soul Hunter. This mount was added on the release of Shadowlands as a rare drop from the Gorge Shadehound in the Maw. Within the Maw, there will be a rotation of four world events called Hunts in the Beast Warren's location of the zone. These hunts would rotate with each other every 3.5 days, meaning two a week, and only one would spawn the necessary rare. In the Hunt Shadehounds event, the Gorge Shadehound can be spawned on a relatively forgiving spawn timer, depending on your server, and when killed can potentially drop itself as a mount. What makes farming this mount so annoying is that it can only be killed once every day that the hunt is up on that character, and you must then wait for it to rotate back in. This means that you can only get 26 attempts a year on this mount, and can be multiplied for every alt character you have that's able to journey to the maw and locate the rare. Because Shadowlands is also over, a method that was formerly used to get quicker attempts was Realm Hopping. Realm Hopping basically lets you change phases when you get invited by a player on a different server in the same zone as you. So if another server had the rare up and would invite you while you waited for years to spawn, it would then show up and give your character its attempt. Without the method of Realm Hopping, as the maw has much died down in player density, it makes obtaining the mount take much longer. To add on to this, it may also occasionally completely bug out. When the rare hits 50% health, it will run away deep into the cave that you're fighting it in and sometimes get stuck in the wall, evading every attack you make on it until it eventually despawns because the game thinks no one is engaging with it, ruining your attempt on that tune. With all these problems in farming the mountain mine, it has an incredibly low number of players that wish to farm it and actually have it. And at number 5, we have the Bloodfang Widow, added at the beginning of Legion with the Mad Merchant NPC. This mount isn't incredibly extreme in terms of steps to grind it out, other than just requiring you to have lots of gold. All you need to obtain this mount is a total of 2 million gold, and it's all yours. There's no reputations or secrets to this mount existence, other than just requiring a lot of your hard-earned money. To some, 2 million gold is nothing at all. To others, this mount can be an insanely long grind on them, because they cannot understand the economy of gold sometimes. It really just depends on the kind of player you are when it comes to this mount being one of the few spider mounts in the game, and was also the only one for a long time. Some players may elect to just farm materials and sell them on the auction house, selling green items in large open world farms, or boosting people through tough PvE slash PvP content. Or you can just buy WoW tokens. Once you obtain your 2 million gold and are ready to purchase the mount, you must head to Dalaran and Legion and find the Mad Merchant. He appears as a gnome with a yellow robe and tall wizard hat, and will say in the yell chat, Sparkles, Fizzles, Whiz Bangs, Ahoy. The music in Dalaran will also change to a more circus theme sound, showing that he's up. His spawn time is very random, it can go days without showing up on some servers. But once he's up, he'll remain spawned for about an hour. At this time, you can just walk up to him and buy the spider for the 2 million gold you've obtained, and learn your new mount. Because of the costly effort this mount introduces, and some players have never even hit above 200,000 gold at a single time, it earns a spawn this list, but is still relatively simple in earning. Even after 7 years of it existing, the mount still only has a less than 2% collection rate. It just depends on what kind of player you are. And at number 4, we have the world boss mounts from the respective expansions. This is the only entry on this list with multiple mounts tied together, as they are all incredibly similar in the method of obtaining and drop chance. Together, we have the Heavenly Onyx Cloud Serpent from the Shah of Anger, Thundering Cobalt Cloud Serpent from Nalak, Cobalt Primordial Direhorn from Undasta, Son of Galleon from Galleon, Solar Spire Hawk from Rukmar, and Molly from the Dune Gorger Krolok. To farm these mounts, you would need to go to the boss's respective zones, locate them, and kill them. 
Once killed, they have a very low chance of rewarding you with their mount. The world bosses typically have a spawn timer of about 15 to 30 minutes, and because realm hopping isn't the most effective way to farm these bosses, even when you reach the boss you need and are ready to get your attempt in, the boss might not even be alive and you'd be forced to sit and wait. Some players would actually reach the thousands in terms of attempts, and Blizzard would fortunately add a hotfix that increased the drop chance of these mounts. As a farm that has players stuck for over half a decade is clearly unfun for any party involved with it. Regardless of this increase, however, the drop rate remains low, and the collection rate of all of these mounts is in the less than 3% range across all WoW accounts. And at number 3, we have the Zareth Overseer. This mount would potentially drop for players upon the defeat of the Jailer encounter and Sepler of the first ones, and only on the Mythic difficulty. Due to the mount's restrictions in farming and age at the time of the script, Dragonfly 10.1.7, you are forced into asking other players for help in you in getting attempts in. Because this raid is not super old still, and with how scaling works, many players need a skilled and geared group of 10 to 20 people to bring him down efficiently. The Jailer was the final boss of the Shallons expansion, and even now has both deadly mechanics and is no pushover to many groups. The Zareth Overseer is said to be a 1% drop chance mount, but you will find the most difficulty in getting a competent group together to actually defeat the encounter. Players have a tendency to join legacy content and expect an overall face roll of content as they mash random buttons and expect the boss to drop dead and give them what they want. In the Jailer's case, you still have to try, at the dismay of a lot of collectors. During phase 1 of the encounter, the boss will occasionally attempt to mind control the entire raid with a relentless domination, and it must be line of sighting with the pillars that are created by players. These pillars come from marked players of Rune of Damnation and will be dropped into empty pits around the room and shoot players back onto the platform and a pillar to LOS. Lots of people who collect don't have time nor really want to commit the effort for learning old content because that's not what they're there for. So when it comes to having to actually understand fundamental mechanics, they may just leave altogether or wipe your group at failing to do what is asked. This can result in many wipes or just failed attempts for the week overall. Even if you manage to kill him, you still only have a 1% chance to get the mount, and will likely need to repeat this process multiple times if you wish to farm across other characters, which can prove difficult as, like mentioned, you may spend more time just forming and gathering players who actually wish to help you. For our second to last entry on this list, we have the X-45 Heartbreaker, formerly known as the Big Love Rocket. The Heartbreaker is a holiday mount added as the real-world counterpart of Valentine's Day. You can queue your character for the dungeon and will receive a heart-shaped box that will contain the mount within. This event can only be farmed for a few weeks in the year and will then vanish until February rolls around once again in a full year. The dungeon can be farmed once a day for every character and has the benefit of a larger drop chance for your first run of the day, encouraging more players to get at least one attempt for the day in while the event runs. The drop rate of the buffed first daily run is unknown, but the runs after this are supposed to have a 1 in 3000 chance, or 0.03% chance. Obviously, this seems almost impossible to occur, and even since it was added in Wrath of the Lich King in 3.3, the mount still sees an obtain rate of less than 4%. It has only been one year since they added the buff, and more people definitely received the mount than before, so over time, this number will increase. Even the most dedicated collectors, nearing 900 mounts, still do not have this mount. With such a really low drop chance and only a few weeks out of the year when it's available, it's become known as one of the rarest mounts in the entire game's history. Our final entry on this list is the prestigious Bloodforged Courser. This mount has a simple grind requiring the player to reach a total honor level of 500 in their account. All it takes is completing PvP content in any scenario it exists and you will earn progression towards this mount. However, the level 500 for PvP is so astronomically high that even incredibly dedicated PvP players who do nothing but PvP do not have this mount. Honor is both a currency used to purchase PvP gear, but in this system, it's a level on your account that shows your prestige and commitment to the activity. Each level requires 10,000 honor total, and how much you net per win depends on the type of content you're participating in, but will be PvP regardless. To put into perspective how few players actually have this mount, even with the grind allowing account-wide progression and never losing honor, it rivals even Gladiator and TCG mounts. Gladiator mounts can only be obtained by achieving 50 wins at above 2400 rating in 3v3s. And before this method of mount was added in, you had to be in the top 1% of players in the entire bracket of PvP. TCG mounts have all been removed and generally can cost players thousands of dollars for their worth nowadays. But this mount, which can be achieved entirely in-game, has a collection rate of a terrifying 0.58% across accounts. Players that obtain this mount have also been known to abuse and exploit in farming honor when it was added, creating a slightly non-artificial earning of this achievement. This means that players who earn this legitimately and without a bug is even lower than the mentioned percentage. If you see someone on this amount, you know for sure they are incredibly patient and committed. 
Over the course of WoW's history, there's been a gigantic amount of mounts added to the game. A decent chunk of these mounts would be made unavailable to players and are presumably never to be re-added with most cases. Blizzard has been known to add content that is very much, if you didn't play during this time, you don't get it rewards, as to incentivize people to play more frequently. In this video, we're going to be going over the rarest unobtainable mounts in the game. The only rule is that if it can still be acquired in the black market auction house, then it will not be included on this list, even though its original method to obtain was removed. With the beginning of our list number 10, we have the Frost Brood Proto Worm Mount. This mount was added in patch 9.2.7 of Shadowlands as a promotional material for the newly released Wrath Classic. In order to receive this mount, you would need to download and play a Death Knight character on the Wrath Classic servers and fully complete the DK starting zone. Once you've completed this activity, you can log back into retail and receive the Undead Proto Drake. This was also at the time Dragonflight was just revealed to players and the expansion was very close to rolling around and just fit thematically with what was coming up. Some speculated this mount would be allowed to Dragon Ride, the core feature of Dragonflight, but were let down when it was added as just a generic mount to fly around on. Thankfully though, with BlizzCon 2023 finished, Blizzard has revealed that the War Within expansion will add this Dragon Riding system to nearly all existing fly mounts, with the option to fly the original method from TBC as well. This mount was available with the launch of Dragonfly came around, so those who didn't complete the DK starting zone, the Wrath, would never be able to obtain this mount. Even for non-classic players, this mount wasn't super difficult to learn, as Blizzard had changed the process required to level a DK by allowing your first crit DK character to not require the level restriction. Typically, to make a DK, you must already have a level 55 character on the current realm, but with the addition of this mount, this was lifted and made much easier for all levels of players to learn. And at number 9, we have the Warlord's Death Wheel mount. This unique mount was the winner of the Azeroth Chopper reality series on YouTube and was thus rendered in-game for players to use. Azeroth Choppers was an episodic series that showed the process of a group of people creating custom motorcycles styled in the likeness of WoW's factions the Alliance and Horde. When the series concluded and the finished versions of the both bikes were revealed to players, they were given the option to vote on which one they liked most, and whichever one won would be added to the game. The Warlord's Death Wheel, originally named the Goblin Lawnmower, was the winner of this contest and would be given to all players who logged in between its addition on June 24th, 2014 and September 30th, 2014 for free. That was it. All you did was log in, and your account would be rewarded the mount, and only Horde characters would be eligible to use it. Interestingly, the Alliance counterpart of this mount was also added into the game, aptly named the Champion's Treadblade. You wouldn't just get it for free. Alliance players had to locate a special NPC in Stormwind that sells you the mount for 100,000 gold. Because of this, those who miss the promotion for the Horde mount will never be able to have it. But the Alliance, the losers of the contest, will forever have the ability to get the bike. Horde players have asked for their motorcycle to make a return to the game, thinking it's unfair that the Alliance will have a permanent access to their bike rather than the actual winners. With the addition of the trading posts, we've seen removed mounts be added on its roster, so it's not impossible for it to show up again in the future. Following our ninth entry, we have the Primal Flame Saber mount. This mount was added as a promotional reward for playing one of Blizzard's other games, Heroes of the Storm. Heroes of the Storm was Blizzard's own MOBA game that was released on June 2nd, 2015. It would cross over all of Blizzard's characters from their various genres to brawl against one another in a team-based battle arena. This promotion was added on February 14th, 2017, and was removed on March 14th of the same year. This meant players only had 30 total days to obtain this mount. The criteria for this reward was you needed to play 15 matches of Heroes of the Storm with someone on your friends list and only as a character from the Warcraft franchise. You were allowed to play against AI enemies on easy mode or against other people while winning or losing and would still count towards your goal, so as long as you play with a friend and as a Warcraft character. Once you've done so, you'll receive your Primal Flame Saber mount in WoW and it would be done. What made this mount so complicated was that it was one of the only mounts in WoW's existence to require you to play a completely different game in order to obtain it. Not everyone enjoys the MOBA genre of games, and avoided this mount altogether and never attempted to get it. In addition, if you were a solo player in WoW, you would need a friend to help you do this at the same time as you, meaning the schedule would have to align and you'd have to grind out the 15 games together. The promotion only lasted 30 days, and not everyone could fit the needed time to get the mount. Overall, a mount that needed you to play a completely different game than its source is warrant for a spot on this list, especially when its obtained data rate is just around 18% of all accounts showing how many actually missed this promotion. And at number 7, we have Jigglesworth Senior. This mount would be added in patch 9.2.5 of Shadowlands of Season 4. Season 4 of Shadowlands introduced a completely new method of approaching raids with a system called Faded Raids. These Faded Raids would scale even the earliest raid up to your current item level and increase their difficulty with additional fixes that would both benefit or bring negative effects to your raid. Every week, the current Faded Raid would rotate to the next tier, 
and the other raids would be left in their original state until it was their turn once again. Eventually, all of the raids would become faded at the same time, but this was only after a couple of months of just a few rotating with themselves. In order to obtain this mount, you must complete each faded raid on its effects and its entirety on normal mode or above. This means you had to enter Castle Nathria, Sanctum of Domination, and Sepulchre of the First Ones and kill every single boss on normal mode or above while it was faded. Doing this would reward the player with Fates of the Shadowlands Raids achievement and the achievement's own reward, Jigglesworth Sr. Players during Shadowlands would already be familiar with Jigglesworth Sr. because between September 4th and September 18th of 2020, players would be given the option all to vote on the next promotional mount for Shadowlands. You would be allowed to vote once on up to five mounts that were prompted to players, and Jigglesworth Sr. was amongst these five. He did lose the vote to the Wandering Agent mount, but it was said by Blizzard it wouldn't be unlikely to see the other votes get their own spotlight in the future. This was continued with the addition of Jigglesworth, as promised by Blizzard, for completing the associated achievement. We would also see this same method persist in the Soaring Spelltone mount added in patch 9.1.5 for completing every unique Mage Tower challenge, a Tower of Tours. This mount wasn't relatively difficult to obtain, but if you were a player that is exclusively casual and doesn't rate above the LFR difficulty, this mount would be impossible to obtain. This is shown when viewing the collection rate of the mount at only 14%, but some would argue the difficulty in obtaining this mount was just plain Shadowlands alone. And at number 6, we have the Abani Warbear from Patch 2.3 in the Burning Crusade. In Patch 2.3, players would have the ability to venture into the brand new raid called Zulaman, a 6 boss instance. With this mount, players would be given one of the first renditions of a hard mode system into the game in the form of a timed event. When you begin the raid, there will be display timers that begin, and you'll have 20 minutes to defeat all four of the lower bosses. When you kill a Killzon, his timer will be extended by another 10 minutes. An Alarak will increase the timer by additional 15 minutes, while the remaining two bosses will not add additional time. This means you have 45 minutes total, if you manage to beat the other two, to kill all four. Defeating each boss in time will allow you to free one hostage, and for each one you free, you'll be given more loot. When you free the fourth hostage, you'll be given the item level 141 ring and the Amani Warbear mount. Only one mount will drop for the entire raid, but if you manage to beat the timer, it was a guaranteed drop from the chest. This mount would be removed at the release of the Wrath of the Lich King because Blizzard felt the prestige of the mount would be completely trivialized because players would be level 80, and the higher item level would allow them to beat the challenge way too easily. So in order to obtain this mount, you had to have been playing with a highly coordinated and well-versed group of people back in the Burning Crusade, a time when these things were much fewer in number. In addition, players had less guides and add-ons at their disposal to manage this task, so not many people ever got it when it was current, or knew it would be removed. Funny enough, though, this mount would be replaced by the Amani Battle Baron Cataclysm with the revamped version of Zolomon. This mount remains obtainable even though its methods to get it back in Cataclysm were very similar to its version in TBC, no longer requiring real prestige to get, and is one of the highest collection rates in the entire game. Maybe someday Blizzard will re add this Baron to the Black Market Auction House, or return it in some other form. And at number 5, we have the Ahead of the Curve achievement mounts. In Mist of Pandaria, Blizzard would begin the tradition of adding a special mount reward for defeating the final encounter of the expansion the last raid on one of their higher difficulties. In the case of Mist of Pandaria, they would give you the Korkron Warwolf for killing Garrosh on normal mode or better. These mounts would continue through each expansion and the boss must be killed during the current content and not any other patch. So, the Warwolf was made unavailable as soon as Warlords of Draenor expansion pre-patch was released. Wad would have the Grove Warden, Legion, the Violet Spellwing, BFA, the Uncorrupted Voidwing, Shadowlands, the Carcinite Zerasteed, and in Dragonflight, the manuscript that allows you to change your Protodrake customization into the Shadowflame version of Frack himself. If you are an active player during these raids, you will more than likely have no trouble getting these mounts but you must certainly need guild groups capable of actually killing these bosses in order to get them. It adds an extra layer of difficulty in obtaining, but because Blizzard has made it a known tradition they will add these mounts, many players will return to the game and grind out gear and make the efforts now amongst a large amount of people that are also returning to the game for these limited time rewards. Even with that in mind, some people still miss these mounts just because they didn't like the current expansion. It happens pretty frequently, as the obtain rate between the Uncorrupted Voidwing and the Xerasteed is a 19% collection rate difference. Following our middle entry on this list is the Brewfrust Ram from 2007, added in patch 2.2, The Burning Crusade. This mount was available to players by completing the quests associated with the Brewfrust Holiday event and earning tickets. These tickets would then be used to purchase the Honorary Brewer Hand Stamp. This item would then begin a quest that allowed you to purchase a Brewfest Ram from the NPC Driss Tumblequick and Duratar or Pole Amber still in Dunmoreau. In 2008 though, the event was completely changed and the hand stamps were no longer able to be purchased from the vendors and were removed permanently. Because the stamp was now gone forever, 
That means the original unarmored version of this mount could only be learned if you already had a hand stamp prior to the change Brewfest received in 2008. The quests was not particularly challenging for players, and were actually at a skill level that any player could approach it if they committed the time to it. The problem was getting this mount was just that no one knew it was going to be removed, nor held onto the stamp that allowed them to begin the quest line for the Brewfest Ram to begin with. You can still get the armored version of this mount, the Swift Brewfest Ram from killing Corn Dire Blue in the event dungeon associated with Brewfest. Closing in at number 3, we have all the Recruiter Friend mounts. Recruiter Friend in WoW is a referral system that can be used to bring additional friends or family into WoW. A player can create a link that can bring in a maximum of 10 players to accounts without an active subscription. Players could also recruit themselves if they wished by sending the link to a separate trial battle.net account. The players who recruit their friends will then, for as long as they continue playing and purchase the game, receive a new reward for each month they play the game, usually up to a maximum of 12 months. The player who was recruited will also receive their own benefits, including a 30 slot bag for their characters and the ability to summon themselves to their recruiter every 30 minutes. In the most recent case of Recruiter Friend, after the first month you'll receive the Volatile Self-Driving Toolbox, the Shredder Rising Glove on the second, the Snappy Buddy on the third, 30 days of game time on the fourth, the Scanner MK3 Helmet on the fifth month, and the Rocket Shredder 9001 on the sixth month. After that, you'll be given 30 days of game time for every 3 months they continue to stay subscribed, at to a maximum of 12 months per recruit. There have been different Recruiter Friend deals that have existed throughout WoW's history to promote players to try and reach out to more players and get them to play, so they can receive the associated rewards. In the case of this entry, the X-53 Touring Rocket, Heart of the Nightwing, and the Emerald Hippogriff mounts are all unobtainable and each require you to participate in the Recruiter Friend system. There are two other mounts from Recruiter Friend, the Swift Zebra and the Cinder Main Charger, but these have been recently made available through the rotation of the trading post, allowing players who missed them to once again have a chance to acquire them. They did rotate out, making them unavailable once again, but it's very likely that they'll return. It's possible for the other mounts to also return to the trading post, but for now they remain unobtainable. The mounts aren't collected by many, because not only do you need to get a friend or family member to play WoW, but they need to enjoy it enough for over half a year for most of the Recruiter Friend rewards, and feel the monthly subscription is worth their time. You could always just recruit your own alt account if you really wanted to, but not many players are willing to drop an additional $15 a month for cosmetic rewards they might not use all that frequently. It's also generally a pretty lengthy time sink for the rewards, and while you could just recruit multiple alts on a month to receive rewards, that's $15 per account for just a subscription, and not buying the game itself all in one go. It's easy to say not everyone is willing to drop a few hundred dollars on in-game cosmetics like that, and it earns a spot on this list. And at number 2, we have the Gladiator mounts. These mounts would be given to the highest prestigious PvP players from all the way back to the Burning Crusade and the current expansion. With every patch in WoW, players would embark on a new seasonal journey. Their ranks from before would be completely reset, and new rewards would be added for everyone to get their hands on. In the case of PvP, this, of course, continues. Originally, from TBC until BFA Season 1, you would need to end in the 3v3 bracket of PvP with the highest rating out of all the players that you were literally in the top 0.5% of people. This rank has been dubbed Rank 1 by players, and adds such insane difficulty levels that only masters of PvP can truly achieve. This means you could be only a few ratings short of a team, but because they were slightly higher than you, they would receive the mount and not you. In BFA and onward, this would be changed to require you to win 50 total games at 2400 rating or above. Once this is completed, you'll be rewarded with the season's corresponding mount. For example, the rank 1 mount of Season 3 Legion was the Cruel Gladiator Storm Dragon, and the 50 win Season 4 BFA mount, the Corrupted Gladiator's Protodrake. Once this season has met its end, the mount included in that season is permanently removed and there is zero method in obtaining it. It's extremely challenging for players of all skill levels, even veteran PvPers, to earn these mounts. And it can also only be done in 3v3. So, even if you're really good at rated battlegrounds, you're not eligible for this mount at the end of the season. If you see anyone on any gladiator mount, you can rest assured they commit many hours of their life to such an epic looking mount, or paid a ton of money to get carried. There are currently 35 unobtainable gladiator mounts as of the time of writing this video. Completing our list at number 1, we have the Black Karaji Battle Tank. Players would come to recognize this mount as the only legendary mount in the entire game's existence, and its prestige is completely earned. Back in vanilla WoW with the release of Encourage, every single existing server at the time would undergo a war effort that required players to contribute to various crafting materials of all professions. Turning these in would progress a server-wide progress bar that, when completed, would complete the war effort. Once both factions had contributed all their resources, the NPCs will begin transferring all the materials to Silithus over 5 days. 
After the five days had passed, players who had obtained the Scepter of the Shifting Sands will be able to hit the Scarab Gong and begin the 10-hour war event that eventually opens the gate to the raid. Essentially, to obtain this mount, you would need to be one of the very few players on your entire server who wields the mentioned Scepter. To get this Scepter, you must complete one of the longest quest chains in WoW's entire history within the duration of the war effort. It very literally requires an entire guild to help you get this mount, because not only will you be prompted to enter the 40-man raids that exist and kill bosses, but you will also be grinding out an item called the Silithus Carapace Fragments. When you begin the quest, you'll be marked as hated by the Brood of Nazdormer reputation, and turning these fragments will earn you the reputation with them. These drop from almost every cell that NBC in the zone and may be traded or sold at the auction house. This farm is very competitive as everyone is scrambling to get their own fragments to either sell or get one of their guild members to mount. PvP servers would turn Silithus into an actual war zone with how competitive people became. To quickly summarize how many fragments you need to progress to the next quest step, you would need to gather 41,400 fragments in total if you're not playing a human character. The NPCs may only drop a few fragments at a time, so this is the part where your guild really needs to aid you. Additionally, all the bug creatures were elite mobs, making the farm even more difficult. If you manage to complete this portion of the questline, you've overcome the most challenging part, and now that remains is defeating various world bosses, raid bosses, and collecting special items spread throughout Azeroth. Many of these steps still require a sizable raid group to kill the bobs because they're very specifically made to not be solo. Throughout the entire process, you've been gathering materials to slowly create your scepter. And once you have finished your massive journey, you may receive a fully recrafted scepter. It is here that you must wait for the war after to complete, and you, as one of the very few in your entire server, will be prompted to ring the gong to open the gates. Once the gong is rung, you may turn in another quest and receive your very special legendary mount. After the gong is rung, a 10-hour event plays out where you may slay mighty boss creatures for great rewards. And anyone else who has a scepter may turn in the quest to get the mount as well. This mount has become arguably one of the most infamous mounts in the entire game, and is recognizable by every level of player. Seeing it is once in a blue moon, and it's so rare that Blizzard decided to honor the players already have it by giving them another mount called the Black Raji War Tank. This mount would be the exact same as the previous, but with an updated texture and model to show how timelessly you've been playing the game. Needless to say, seeing someone riding this mount means they are nothing but business, and have stuck around since the beginning with WoW. In this video, we're looking at the mounts in WoW that cost the most gold that you can buy from NPC vendors in-game. And at number 10, we have a tie between six different mounts, all of which cost 90,000 gold each. Each mount can be bought from a faction reputation vendor from each of the six different zones available at the launch of the Battle for Azeroth expansion. All of these mounts became available for purchase in patch 8.2 after the player has completed Battle for Azeroth Pathfinder Part 2, which is required to unlock flying in BFA. However, a player can only use three of these mounts since the six of them are split down the middle and are faction specific. We'll start off with Kul'Turas, which has three different alliance reputations. First is the Proudmoor Admiralty of the Tiriscard Sound, and upon reaching Exalted with his reputation, you can visit Provisioner Frey and Boralus to buy the Proudmoor Sea Scout. This is a fancy griffin that provides the key reconnaissance intel for the Kul'Turan Navy. The next mount is the Stormsong Coast Watcher originating from the Stormsong Valley. The Stormsong Coast Watcher can be bought from Sister Liliana in Brennadam the reputation vendor from the Stormwix faction, with which you will need to be exalted with to buy the Stormsong Coast Watcher. The final aligned zone is Dressfar, and the mount you can buy here is the Dusky Waycrest Griffin. This mount can be purchased from Quartermaster Alcorn and Armand Stand, and requires exalted with the Order of Embers. So for a quarter million gold or so, you can own three high-res recolors of Griffin's mounts lasting in Pandaria. Now we move on to the three Horde reputation mounts for Zandalari. The Zandalari Empire is the main faction in Zuldazar. When the player is exalted with them, they can visit Natala Hakata to buy the Spectral Terrorwing mount. This is a ghostly pterodactyl and is a pretty unique mount in the game, only having a few prior Spectral mounts. The next zone in Zuldazar is Nazmir, which is home of the reputation faction called Talanju's Expedition. Here, Horde players can buy the captured Swamp Talker from Provisioner Legia. Sadly, this is just another pterodactyl reskin and not even special in the spectral sense, as it's just a basic green dino. The final zone of Zuldazar is Voldun, which is the home of the lovable Volpera. When the player has reached Exalted with the Voldunai, they can buy the Voldunai Dunescaper. This mount is sure to be a player's pretty purple precious Paleozoic Pterodactyl. So, why exactly are these mounts gold sinks? Well, first off, the second most expensive mount sold by these reputation vendors only cost 10,000 gold. Also, the player must be exalted with each faction, which itself could take a bit of time to grind out. Finally, while there is a gold discount for being exalted with a faction, which is auto-applied to these mounts since you need to be exalted to even buy them, 
the gold price for all six of these mounts still comes out to a whopping 72,000 gold. That's 216,000 gold for all three of your faction's mounts. And at number 9, we have the Champion's Treadblade mount. This marvelous motorcycle mount costs 100,000 gold and is only available to Alliance players. It was added at the beginning of World of the Draenor and it has a bit of an interesting background. In 2014, Blizzard started an event called Azeroth Choppers. Their promotion consisted of two teams representing the Alliance and the Horde, with each team designing and building a motorcycle for their faction. The motorcycle with the most votes was added to World of Warcraft as a free faction-specific mount usable by all characters of that faction. Unsurprisingly, the Horde mount, called the Warlord's Death Wheel, won and was added to the game at the beginning of World of the Draenor. The Warlord's Death Wheel was awarded for free to Horde players that logged in from the game from August 1st to September 30th, 2014. The mount itself is a reward from the achievement Warlord's Death Wheel. The mount is no longer obtainable in-game, as it was a limited-time-only event. The Alliance motorcycle, the Champion's Treadblade, was added to the game for gold at the beginning of World of Draenor as well, and it can be bought from an NPC vendor named Polly in Stormwind for 100,000 gold. Polly is named and designed after Paul Tatular Jr., who is the owner and operator of Paul Jr. Designs, which created the Alliance and Horde bikes in the Azeroth Choppers web series. And while the Champion's Treadblade mount can still be bought in-game to this day, the Horde's alternative version of this mount cannot be obtained in any way, gold or not meaning Alliance players actually did get the better deal, as their mount can still even be obtained today. And at number 8, we have the Grand Expedition Yak. This massive yak mount cost 120,000 gold, and was added to the game at the beginning of Mist of Pandaria. The mount comes complete with a transmogrifier vendor, a repair vendor, and, most importantly, it has a nice umbrella on top. Cousin Slowhands is the repair vendor and can be found to the player's left, with Mystic Bird Hat the transmogrifier vendor which can be found to the player's right. This mount is currently the only mount in the game with a transmogrification vendor, and one of the only mounts with a vendor on it at all. It should be noted that during Mist of Pandaria, Mystic Bird Hat was a reforge vendor, but this was changed to transmogrification vendor at the beginning of World of Draenor with the removal of reforging, which meant that this mount was the go-to for many raid groups to get at least one of, as it allowed them to freely reforge gear without having to go back to a major city, a thing that was done with every new item you obtained, especially in the days of hit caps and expertise caps. What makes this mount so unique is that it has such incredible usefulness. As long as you can mount up in an area, you have access to a repair vendor and a transmogrification NPC. This makes it great for repairing armor, selling junk, and immediately fixing your transmog when you get a new piece of gear. No matter if you are leveling it all to do in some battlegrounds or farming mats, the mount always has a convenient use almost everywhere. The Grand Expedition Yak can be bought from Uncle Big Pocket for 120,000 gold. Uncle Big Pocket is a grummel and a shrewd little negotiator that can be found in the Kunlai Summit. While 120,000 gold isn't an inconsiderable amount of gold, it can take a while to farm, and his name is certainly on point. One last fun fact about the Grand Expedition Yak is that when you dismiss the mount, both NPCs will say one of 14 lines of often humorous dialogues, sometimes referencing other video games entirely. And at number 7, we have the trio of frog mounts. The green marsh hopper, the blue marsh hopper, and the yellow marsh hopper, which all can be bought for 333,333 gold each. Buying all three mounts is literally one gold under a million gold. All three of these mounts were added at the beginning of BFA, and they have a bit of lore background, as some of the descriptions say they were children of Kragwa the Huge, who is the frog Loa, although it can be said all frogs in WoW are children of Kragwa. All three frogs can be brought from Gotham, a blood troll located in Nazmir in a small cave near the Frog Marsh area. And until Shadowlands, this was the only way to get a frog mount. Although, of course, Shadowlands added many Night Fey frog mounts, so you no longer need to drop one third of a million gold to get a Hoppy Boy, or a one gold short of a million to get all three. And at number six, we have the Rustbolt Resistor, also from BFA. This mount requires a player to be exalted with the Rustbolt Resistance on Megagon Island and spend 524,288 gold to obtain the mount. However, with the exalted discount on prices, the gold amount is actually 419,930 gold. The gold cost for the amount of 524,288 is binary, as it is 2 to the 9th power, and the amount of bytes is 512 kilobytes. If this is a reference to something, however, it is unknown, so take it as you will. This amount can be bought from the gnome bot quartermaster named Stolen Royal Vendorbot, which is located right outside the Mechagon dungeon portal. Not only is the Rustbolt Resistor a lot of gold, but the Mechagon rep grind is rather long and boring, requiring various daily quests, world quests, and rare kills. On the other hand, the mount does look pretty cool and is one of only two mounts that makes you immune to the HK-8 aerial oppression unit that flies around Mechagon which would normally be seen knocking and shooting off of your mount, making it a major benefit to your daily Mechagon farming. And at number 5, we have the Pale Direhorn. This spiky boy will cost you half a million gold and was also added in BFA. 
He can be bought from Tricky Nick and Borellis and Talutu and Dazar Lore for a mere 500,000 gold. And while it costs less than the previous mount, this is before its reputation cost reduction, which this mount does not have. There's nothing too much else to talk about in this mount really, which is a shame. While the mount description does say the Pelhai Direhorns are rare and the expense is justified, we're starting to enter the true gold sink mounts on this list. And BFA was certainly the most egregious in terms of gold sink mounts, with most of the mounts in the video being from said expansion, which does make sense as each expansion will have more gold than the last. With Shadowlands only breaking that up with the use of anima, but it remains to be seen what Dragonflight will bring and if it will continue to break the cycle or will return to it. And at number 4 we have the Lightforge Warframe. This mount costs 625,000 gold, and players need to be exalted with the Army of Light faction in order to buy it. With the reputation discount from being exalted, the mount price comes down to 500,000 gold. This mount was added in patch 7.3, Shadows of Argus, and can be bought from Vindicator Jolana aboard the Vindicar. Although the Lightforge Warframe technically costs the same amount as the Palehide Direhorn from the number 5, we put it at number 4 just because the Lightforge Warframe is locked behind a rep grind as well as a gold price, making it at least a bit harder to get. That being said, the Lightforge Warframe looks super awesome and has some great animations, and we just couldn't compare it directly to the bland Palehorn Direhorn, which is just really a recolor of any mount you've seen in many other locations in WoW since Pandaria. The Lightforge Warframe's mount special is great, and this mount is so popular that it had provided an ambition for a lot of players to grind out the gold to eventually buy it. So much ambition, people even assumed the mount would work the same way as a Sky Shredder does and would allow you to herb. This mount is not a light purchase, but it is a very unique mount in both style and animation, and it certainly shines as bright as the gold you spent to get it. And at number 3 we have the Bloodfang Widow. This spooky scary spider scurried into the game at the beginning of the Legion expansion. The item to learn how to summon the mount is called the Bloodfang Cocoon, and can be bought for a mere 2 million gold. Its mount description says that its long serrated limbs drip with the blood of its enemies and or mate. A reference to widow spiders who commonly consume their living male mates. How charming. The Bloodfang Widow can only be bought from the Mad Merchant, who is a gnome vendor that can be found in the Wonderworks, which is the toy shop in Dalaran above the Broken Isles. And you may know of him from our top 10 most expensive pets videos. The player only needs to have two requisites to obtain the Bloodfang Widow. And, as insane as it may sound, getting the 2 million gold might be the easier part. That's because the second part is actually waiting for the Mad Merchant to spawn. He is on a very random spawn timer, reportedly as short as 4 hours, and as long as a few days. He also usually sticks around for an hour or two before he despawns again. You can usually tell when the Mad Merchant has spawned because he will yell a line in chat and the music in Dollar will change to a silly circus music instead of the usual theme. The wild comments on the page for this mount are full of people who've been camping the spot waiting for him to spawn for years, ever since he was added in 7.0. So, if you ever see the Mad Merchant in Dalaran, be sure to let people know that he's up. And at number 2 we have the Swift Spectral Tiger. This is a very rare and sought after mount that can easily go for several million gold on the auction house. The Swift Spectral Tiger comes from the Wild Trading Card game. The Wild Trading Card game only existed through the Burning Crusade into Mist of Pandaria before it was discontinued. Some of the cards available were loot cards which gave prizes you could redeem in WoW. Among the rarest of these rewards was the Swift Spectral Tiger, which had a roughly 1 in 484 chance of being in a booster pack, and with 24 packs costing around $120 back then when it launched, this meant you would on average need to drop almost $2,500 to get the mount, although depending on luck the number could drastically vary. To make the mount even more rare, the mount only became bind on use in patch 3.2, Call of the Crusade. Before this mount was bind on pickup, this change to BOU meant the mount was able to be sold on the auction house. The Swift Spectral Tiger is actually in technically two mounts, the Spectral Tiger and the Swift Spectral Tiger. The only difference between them is a slight alteration in the armoring, a leftover from the days of normal and epic mounts. And while originally using the loot card would give you access to buying the mounts for 10 gold and 100 gold from a vendor, the addition of them being bind on pickup made them now both be given to you in the mail upon redeeming, allowing you to then sell them in the auction house. And while the Spectral Tiger is only slightly different than its Swift variant, it runs for far less. The Swift Spectral Tiger has almost always sold for gold cap at the current time. Currently, the gold cap is 9,999,999 gold. However, since it was sold in the past for a lesser amount because the gold cap has been lower, we're placing it only at the number 2 spot on this list. And finally, at number 1, unsurprisingly, we have the Mighty Brutusaur Caravan. The Longboy was added at the start of BFA and sold for 5 million gold at a vendor. He could be bought from Tricky Nick and Boralis or Tala 2 in Dizarre Lore. Longboy is sought after for three main reasons. The first being that it's the only mount in the game with an auction house auctioneer. Secondly, it is the largest and tallest mount available in the entirety of WoW, 
and currently the only way to get a mount with this appearance, having no other reskins or recolors of this mount. The third reason is just being able to flaunt your wealth. In fact, learning the mount grants the player a special mount achievement called Conspicuous Consumption. At the beginning of Shadowlands, this mount was removed from the game. This caused some controversy as many people were not told of it being planned to remove from the vendor until far too late in the expansion to earn enough gold to buy the mount. The Brutosaur can still be bought in game, but he can now only be found on the Black Market Auction House. This makes him considerably harder to get for the three main reasons. First, you are now competing with other players and their bids on the Black Market Auction House. Secondly, the minimum bid for the Long Boy is 5 million, but the bid almost always goes to the gold cap of nearly 10 million. And third, it is extremely rare for this mount to even appear on the Black Market Auction House, let alone on your server. And while there is always the possibility to move to a server that has one bid on it, it would require usually up to 10 different characters to transfer to bring all the gold needed. And that is if you can even do all that before some other random crazed person instantly sets it to gold cap. As it stands, the Mighty Brutus or Caravan is by far the most expensive mount in WoW, even before it was removed and added to the Black Market Auction House, and even more so now than before. So, there and concludes the videos. So, what mounts did we miss, and do you have any personal favorite expensive mounts? We wish to do a most expensive auction house and black market auction house mounts in the future. However, finding cost of an info for the auction house is semi-easy. Finding costs for the black market auction house is much harder, leading to incomplete data. And with the cost of these mounts change in expansion to expansion, as gold becomes easier and harder to obtain, making it far harder to evaluate, but we simply had to include the top two most expensive auction house mounts.